her billionaire neighbor. A Love on Palmer Island Romance Written by Suzanne Ash Chapter 1 This was going to be a disaster. Brad knew it the minute he'd arrived to pick up Melissa Wilkinson for their dinner date. She wasn't ready. No big surprise there. What woman ever was? Leaving him stranded in the living room of her penthouse condo for 45 minutes while she finished her makeup and hair was pushing it though. Truth be told, he couldn't see that the extra time had made any difference. She wore just as much makeup when she let him in. But who was he to judge? They made it to the restaurant well past the 8 o'clock reservation his mother had insisted upon making when she'd set up his latest blind date. The maitre d' suggested they start with a cocktail at the bar while he got a table ready for them. I can't believe we have to wait, Melissa huffed as she stalked to the bar and ordered a lemon basil mojito mocktail. She didn't drink. At least he wouldn't have to worry about this date getting tipsy and stumbling out of the restaurant. This place used to be nice, she blabbered on. When Daddy and I had dinner here last month, we were seated right away. I would have thought you'd have at least as much pull as Daddy around town. Don't they know who you are? Her loud comments began to get the attention of other patrons. Brad hated this. He was sure the maitre d' was pushing the rest of the staff and doing everything in his considerable power to get them a table as quickly as possible. He knew they would be seated before anyone else waiting at the bar. He did have a lot of pull around town, but that didn't mean he enjoyed taking advantage of it. It was their fault, they had arrived almost an hour past their reservation. The staff and fellow diners shouldn't have to pay for their delay. But that was exactly what was going to happen, and there was nothing he could do about it now. He should have arrived earlier to Melissa's place, and he should have refused her request to stop at the designer boutique so she could pick out a silk scarf as a thank you gift for his mother. A scarf he ended up paying for. Brad shook his head. He didn't understand women. Melissa had just sent back the second version of her drink because it still had too much basil or some other nonsense when the maitre d' came to lead them to their table. She told the bartender not to bother fixing her another mock mojito and waltzed off towards their table. He shot the guy an apologetic glance before sliding over a $50 bill. He'd have to remember to tip the maitre d' and wait staff well. Serving Melissa wasn't going to be a piece of cake. Brad gritted his teeth. Getting through the next two hours, or however long this blind date dinner was going to take, wasn't going to be easy. Their drinks arrived. Iced tea for him, a virgin Bloody Mary with a ridiculous amount of garnish for her. I'm going to need a picture of this for Instagram. That drink is gorgeous, she trilled. Be a darling and move out of your seat for a moment so I can get a good shot. She'd already pulled her phone out of her snakeskin clutch. He could be wrong, but that looked like the skin of a python. He stood up and stepped to the side, trying his best not to get in the way of the waitstaff. Heads turned their way when her flash went off repeatedly. Got it, she finally exclaimed, and he was able to return to his seat. Thankfully, their food arrived shortly thereafter. More pictures were snapped. He was relieved he didn't have to leave his seat for those. A waitress approached their table and offered to take their picture. Melissa glared at the young woman like she'd lost her mind. Why would my followers care about that, she asked indignantly before waving her away to check her stats and reply to comments before finally returning her phone to her purse. Let's see if it tastes as good as it looks. He knew the smile on his face must look forced, but at this point there wasn't much he could do about it. Making a mental note to increase the tip even more, he picked up his knife and fork to dig into his steak. It smelled delicious, and he could tell the moment he cut into it that it was cooked to perfection. Medium rare and unbelievably juicy. Just the way he liked it. The baked potato and salad were a nice touch, but for him, it was all about the meat. How can you eat that? Melissa chimed in while he savored his first bite. A beautiful cow was slaughtered for that. And do you have any idea how bad beef production is for the environment? It is a major contributor of climate change and global warming. He bit his tongue, figuratively, and continued to chew a steak. 
he was not going to let her ruin his dinner. This date couldn't possibly get worse, right? Thirty seconds later, it did. Melissa reached across the table for the salt and knocked her Virgin Mary over. Thick tomato juice and plenty of ice cubes flew straight into his lap. He jumped out of his chair, a noise he'd never heard coming out of his mouth. He may be a horse-riding, sports-car-driving, steak-eating guy, but that didn't mean he couldn't shriek like a girl when a cold drink with ice hit a certain part of his anatomy. Before he could recover, the culprit of this dinner disaster was all over him with a napkin, trying to soak up the tomato juice and push the ice cubes away. Please stop, he pushed out between clenched teeth. He was beyond embarrassed, and her attention only made things worse. She tossed him the napkin and sat back down, crossing her arms and legs, while staring him down. He wasn't sure what she was waiting for. What he did know was that it was high time to end this blind date gone wrong. Check, please. The head waiter headed over right away and offered his assistance and a fresh stack of napkins. I'm not finished. We're leaving. His voice sounded harsher than he'd intended, but he was so enraged, he couldn't make himself apologize for his tone. He stood up and pulled a stack of bills from his wallet. He hoped it would make up for the damage they'd done. They didn't talk on the way back to her place. He walked her to her door, because he knew it was expected of him, and then left to have a serious talk with his mother. He intended to make it perfectly clear that he was not going on another blind date ever again. It didn't take him long to make it to the family estate. He wasn't surprised that his mother had waited up to hear how his date went. Evelyn Sutton had the audacity to laugh when he recounted the events of the evening. It will be such a fun story to tell the grandchildren. Her eyes gleamed at the prospect of that particular future. No, mother, it won't be. Because there is no way I'm going to end up with someone like Melissa. And if you don't cool it with the matchmaking, there won't be any grandchildren in your future. At least not for me. Oh darling, don't be so harsh. It was one bad date and Melissa is a lovely girl. His mother rose from her chair and walked over to the antique sideboard and poured herself a drink. She's from a good family and walks in the same circles you do. She'd be perfect. She turned and held a glass filled with amber liquid out to him. Scotch? He shook his head. Brad seriously doubted his mother's assessment of the young woman, but Evelyn continued to sing Melissa's praises. Sometimes she didn't know when to stop. Her mother assures me she is an excellent hostess, and I can attest to her taste. I ran into her at the Phoenix High Fashion show last month, and she only likes the best. He wasn't surprised by the statement. He just didn't think it was one of Melissa's more favorable qualities. He couldn't care less about the fashion sense of his future intended or how skilled she was at interior design and party planning. He wanted a partner, someone real who understood him. Trying to explain this to his mother was hopeless. I am not going on another date with Melissa or anyone else you set me up with. I need some time to get over this debacle. He didn't tell his mother he had no intention of getting married at all unless he was certain the woman was only interested in him and not his money or his influence. Evelyn wouldn't understand. She'd been a young girl expected to marry Rich and that's exactly what she had done. I'm heading down to my beach place for a while. I'll leave in the morning, he said before kissing his mother goodnight and heading up to a suite of rooms to pack. He felt better than he had all evening. He loved his beach house, a place he'd inherited from his paternal grandfather. It wasn't a grand mansion, just a shabby old place right on the Atlantic Ocean in South Carolina, but it was his and it felt more real and lived in than any of the other properties his family owned. Best of all, it was thousands of miles away from Arizona and his meddling mother. He couldn't wait to get back there and unwind for a few weeks. The best part was that it was early in the season. The beach would be deserted, and with few tourists in town, there wasn't a chance he'd run into the future, Mrs. Bradley Sutton. Chapter 2 Cat loved Palmer Island from the moment she stepped foot on the beach. The air was salty and cool, sunlight sparkled on the water. The sound of the waves rolling on shore was a balm to her soul. 
For the first time in a long time, she felt relaxed and free. It was bliss. Coming up here to unwind for a few days had been the best decision she'd made since. Nope, she wasn't going to think about it. She was here to recharge and that's exactly what she was going to do. Walking back on the deck, she smiled at Miss Doris. It's perfect. Thank you for renting the cottage to me. My pleasure, my pleasure, Miss Doris replied. It's so nice to have the company. Especially this time of the year when most of the houses on the island are empty. It can get a bit lonely. She smiled at Kat and patted her arm. And the money doesn't hurt either, the old woman whispered conspiratorially, laugh lines crinkling around her steel-gray eyes. Not that it was a lot of money. Rent for the little guest cottage had been ridiculously low. It was the only way Kat could afford to spend the next week and a half here on the beach. Money had been tight since the accident that turned her entire life upside down. Why don't you come inside the living room for a bit? I'll make us a cup of tea, Miss Doris suggested. Grateful for the offer, Kat joined her for a bit, listening to what her temporary landlady had to say about her neighbors. She was a bit of a gossip, but in the nicest of ways. Once they'd both finished their tea and the small cakes Miss Doris had served along with it, Kat excused herself to check on Hannah. How old is your daughter? Miss Doris asked. She just turned four. It's the first time we've been apart. She's spending a few weeks with her grandparents in Charleston. It was the reason Kat had decided to stay on Palmer Island. She could be down at her in-law's house in a little less than two hours should Hannah need her. How fun. Miss Doris clapped her hands in excitement. I'm sure they are spoiling her run. She'll have a wonderful time, and you'll get some much-needed rest. I remember what it's like raising little ones. Miss Doris looked toward the gallery of pictures on the mantelpiece. You go make your phone call in private. Come find me if there's anything you need, sugar. Kat nodded and walked across the yard to the little cottage that was home for the next few days. It was a quaint little building that may have started out as little more than a garden shed or a garage. It had a sitting area with French doors looking out toward the garden and the beach. A tiny kitchenette was tucked into the back, next to a small bathroom. The bedroom was the entire loft upstairs, accessible by a set of narrow and steep stairs that had more in common with a ladder than a staircase. She would have to be careful making her way down to the bathroom at night. Kat kicked off her shoes, curled up on the couch, and pulled out her phone to check on Hannah. It had only been a few hours since she'd left Charleston, but she already missed her little firecracker. She's doing just fine, Claire, her mother-in-law, reassured her. She's out back playing with Thomas. Hannah's grandfather had built an entire play area complete with swings, slides, and sandboxes for his grandchildren. Do you want me to call her in? Claire asked. Kat wasn't sure if she heard annoyance in the other woman's voice or if it was a figment of her imagination. Either way, she didn't want to push her luck. It's fine. Don't worry about calling her. I'll call back later to say goodnight. Call me if anything comes up or Hannah just wants to talk. I'll have my phone on me. Of course. I know this is hard, her mother-in-law's voice softened. We appreciate this time with our granddaughter. Thank you for letting her stay. It's like a small piece of Kevin is here with us. She's starting to look more and more like him, Kat agreed. I wish he was still with us. He would have been a wonderful father. It was still painful to remember her husband and to be reminded yet again of the accident that had taken him away from her. He'd never gotten a chance to meet his daughter. Life wasn't fair. Taking a deep breath, to keep the tears at bay, she finished her conversation and tucked her phone in her back pocket. She hoped Hannah would be okay. Kat was worried about tonight. Her daughter hadn't spent a night away from her, and while she completely trusted Claire and Thomas to take good care of her, Kat was fully prepared for a midnight dash to Charleston. To clear her head, she'd go for a walk on the beach while the sun was still out. She grabbed a sweater, pulled off her socks, and headed back to the beach barefoot. It was much too cold to swim, 
but there was no reason she couldn't at least dip her toes into the Atlantic Ocean. On her way down to the water, Kat noticed a handsome guy walking down the stairs of the house next door. He had dark brown hair and broad shoulders. She couldn't remember much of what Miss Doris had told her about the mysterious neighbor. Maybe that he'd inherited the place from his grandparents? The house had certainly seen better times. It was quite a bit older and not nearly as nice as Miss Doris's place. Even so, it had a certain charm. It was the kind of place that had a history. This house had seen things and weathered storms that were no longer remembered. It was nice to see a few old homes, like it left on the Grand Strand. She waved at the guy and headed off on her walk along the beach. She was deep in thought, and in a much better state of mind after a long stroll along the water, when she noticed the same man down at the beach in front of their houses with a little girl about Hannah's age. She didn't remember Miss Doris mentioning a daughter. She was sure the older woman had told her the man was single. Cat wished she paid more attention to the conversation and could remember his name. On a whim, she decided to walk up and introduce herself. It may be nice to talk to a fellow single parent, and if they came back here, Hannah would have someone to play with next door. She smiled to herself at the thought and marched right up to the pair. Hi there, I'm Kat, she started before she lost her nerve. I am staying with Miss Doris next door for the next week. I have a daughter about the same age. She's staying with her grandparents right now, but I hope to bring her back up here this summer. Maybe the girls can play together. Sorry, the mystery man stammered. I don't have any kids. I found this one a few minutes ago. I think she's lost. He shrugged and looked a bit lost himself. I'm Brad. He held out his hand. Too shocked and embarrassed to do anything else, she returned his handshake. Her cheeks felt flaming hot. Why oh why had she assumed he was a father and this was his kid? Before she could figure out what to say, the young girl started sobbing. I want my mommy. Tears streamed down the sun-kissed cheeks, covered in freckles. Her dark blonde hair was in two thick braids that had been done with care, but were starting to fall apart after a day of playing on the beach. The little girl's shoulders started shaking as her sobs increased. Kat quickly got down on her knees and hugged her. Don't worry. We'll find her. It will be okay. She rubbed her back in hopes of calming her down. Has she said anything about where her parents may be or how she got separated from them? She looked up at Brad, who had a panicked look on his face that mirrored the one on the little lost girl. He shook his head. All I've been able to get out of her is that she's lost. Were you at the beach with your mommy and daddy, she gently asked the girl. Big nods from the little one. Okay, she squared her shoulders and decided to take charge. She was a mom. She could handle reuniting a lost child with her parents. She could only imagine how scared her parents must be. Let's walk down the beach and see if we can't find them. She looked at Brad and whispered, keep an eye out for anyone who looks like they are frantically looking for something. He nodded and the three of them started walking down the beach. Are you here on vacation? Kat asked as much to distract the girl as in an effort to get more helpful information out of her. Yes, ma'am, the girl replied before stopping abruptly and digging her feet in the sand. I'm not supposed to talk to strangers. Right. That's good advice. Kat had to think fast to ensure they could help the young girl find her parents. I'm Kat, and this is Brad. She introduced both of them while pulling up her phone. This is my daughter Hannah. She's about your age and staying with her grandparents. I tell her not to talk to strangers too. The little girl nodded. If she were lost, I would want someone to help her find me. Did your parents say anything about what to do when you're lost? She crossed her fingers that the little girl's parents had read the same parenting book she had. They said to find a policeman or another mommy. Kat smiled. They would be just fine. Perfect. I'm a mommy. I'll help you, and if we find a policeman along the way, we'll ask him for help too." The little girl looked relieved. "'What's your name?' Kat asked. "'Frankie, 
the girl replied, adding, and I'm five years old, holding up her fingers to show them. Nice to meet you, Frankie. Let's keep looking for your mommy and daddy. I'm sure they miss you. It took them almost twenty minutes before they crossed paths with the anxious father. Frankie raced towards him as soon as she saw him. The man thanked Brad and Kat, shaking their hands profusely and offering to pay them for their help. No need. Brad's voice sounded rough, and he looked embarrassed at the offer. Kat shook her head as well. I'm just glad we found you. Take her home. I'm sure your wife is worried. She hugged the little girl, sorry to see her go. It made her miss Hannah. Thank you for your help. I'm not sure what I would have done without you. She was surprised at Brad's words. Can I buy you an ice cream? There's a shop up by the pier. Unless your husband is waiting for you. No husband. It's just Hannah and I. She looked down the beach. The pier was a short walk away, and ice cream sounded nice. She was intrigued by this man she knew next to nothing about. Having him buy her an ice cream cone couldn't hurt. She nodded, and they started walking toward the little stand in comfortable silence. What can I get you, the young woman in a white apron asked when they stepped up to the counter. Brad gestured for her to go first, and her eyes roamed over the different flavors. This is hard, she joked. There's too many yummy flavors to choose from. I don't know how to pick. Let me help, Brad said. Process of elimination. Decide what you don't want, and we'll go from there. It was a good strategy. Kat thought for a moment. The only real contenders are cookie dough, mint chocolate chip, and dark chocolate with peanut butter, she decided. Actually, mint chocolate chip is out. The only time I get it is when I'm upset or after a breakup. Fair enough. That means only two flavors left. You could get two scoops or pick one now and get the other one tomorrow. The man had a point. You have a daughter, he asked as they started to make their way back, ice cream cones in hand. The dark chocolate and peanut butter she'd chosen was delicious. There was something special about hand-churned old-fashioned ice cream that was hard to find these days. I do. She's a bit younger than Frankie and is staying with her grandparents in Charleston for a few days. He nodded and was about to say something else when she stumbled into a hole in the sand and threw her ice cream in order to catch her fall. She regained her balance, heart beating fast from the scare, when she looked back up at her companion. Somehow, she'd thrown her ice cream cone right into Brad's stomach. Dark chocolate dripped from his shirt, the cone lay in the sand in front of him. She couldn't help it. She started laughing. His shocked expression was just too much. After a breath or two, he looked down at his shirt and back at her. His eyes started crinkling and his lips twitched. Another heartbeat later, he started laughing as well. He had a nice laugh, deep and sincere. She liked it. And she liked the fact that he didn't get angry. She was sure she'd ruined his shirt, and it looked like an expensive one. I'm so sorry. She finally stammered out the words after getting her laughter under control. She wasn't sure if she was apologizing for the ice cream incident or the laughter. Probably both. Don't worry about it. This isn't nearly as bad as the last time I had something ice cold dumped all over me. The look in his eyes made her curious. Do tell, she encouraged as they walked back to their houses after he'd scraped most of the ice cream off his shirt. It was an unfortunate coincidence that she'd picked chocolate and peanut butter ice cream. The stain was obvious on his crisp white shirt and didn't exactly look like it had been caused by ice cream. I was on a blind date, and let's just say things weren't going well. We'd gotten our food and had just started to eat when the woman my mother had set me up with dumped her ice-cold tomato juice all over my lap. He didn't smile while he was telling the story, but Kat couldn't help a snort. She pictured him in a fancy restaurant, dressed in a nice suit with juice dripping all over him. Wah, was there garnish, she blurted out as another laugh bubbled up. She quickly covered her mouth with her hand in a vain attempt to hold it in. Plenty. His reply was deadpan and dry. And that was it.
she couldn't hold back the laughter. Her sides hurt. She couldn't remember having this much fun with another adult in quite some time. He rolled his eyes at her, and his lips twitched again. It didn't take long before he joined her. You know, it really is a funny story in hindsight, he admitted when they made it back to their own little stretch of beach. I didn't think so at the time. Thank you. She was surprised at the sincerity and gratitude in his voice. You're welcome. Glad I could put that into perspective for you. I hope we'll run into each other again, he said before heading back up the steps to his place. She hoped so as well. Chapter 3 Brad had finished his second cup of coffee the next morning when the phone rang. He glanced down at the display. His mother. For a moment, he was tempted to let it go to voicemail, but he knew better. Evelyn Sutton wouldn't simply leave a message. She'd keep calling until he answered, and if all else failed, she'd send someone over to the house. No matter that he was in coastal South Carolina and she was at the main family seat in Phoenix, Arizona. Sighing, he swiped his phone to answer the call. Good morning, mother. Good, you're awake. I wanted to talk to you about Peter's wedding. It's less than a month away, and the wedding planner just informed me that you didn't confirm your plus one. Who are you bringing to the reception? And don't tell me you plan on coming by yourself. It would throw the entire seating arrangements off balance, not to mention how it would look in the pictures. Brad groaned under his breath. He should have known his brother's impending nuptials would pose a problem, an opportunity for his mother to do more of her meddling and horrible matchmaking. Before he could get a word in edgewise, his mother continued. I've made a list of several eligible young ladies that would make perfectly acceptable dates to the event. Event was a bit of an exaggeration. His brother and Caroline, his fiancée, had opted for a small family ceremony and only agreed to enlist a planner to appease the formidable Evelyn Sutton. The woman was determined to see her sons get settled and begin producing the next Sutton heirs. I know, I promised you no more blind dates. I haven't contacted any of the young women. Mother, stop. It took a good amount of willpower to keep his tone civil. I have a date, he told her firmly. He didn't, but she didn't need to know that. He was going to bring someone to the wedding, someone of his choosing, not hers. An idea started to form in his head. A knock sounded on his door. I'm sorry, mother. I have to go. I have a nine o'clock tea time at Blue Heron with Jason. Jason was an old college buddy with ties to Phoenix. While his family had never quite reached billionaire status, they were well connected and traveled in the same social circles his mother seemed to enjoy so much. The fact that the family owned one of the oldest and most prestigious golf clubs down here on the Grand Strand didn't hurt either. Jason McKenna? I adore his mother. Evelyn sounded excited. The one and only. He's at the door right now. Doesn't he have a younger sister? He does, and last I heard she's happily married and has a baby. I've got to go. Tell him I said hello. I had lunch with his mother the last time I was down there. Have fun and tell him to help you work on your swing. His mother couldn't end a conversation without an insult. His golf game was just fine, thank you very much. Goodbye, mother. He hung up the phone before she could get in another remark. They made it to the club right on time. He hadn't seen Jason for a few months and it was good to catch up. Brad didn't have too many close friends who faced the same or similar problems as he did. The average guy didn't have to worry about things like inheritance law, trust funds, and what kind of private jet to buy. Not that he was complaining, much. All in all, they were good problems to have. Finding someone who's interested in you and not your bank account is a challenge, Jason agreed when the conversation turned to girls as they teed off on the 15th hole. He swung his club, clearing the lake and neatly avoiding the hidden sand trap. His ball landed on the green, setting him up for at least a birdie, if not an eagle. Brad had to give it to Jason. His friend's game had gotten better and better as the round progressed. The same couldn't be said of his own. He felt his shoulders tense, and his swing was off. 
Having your mother set you up on blind dates with women you have nothing in common with doesn't help, he replied. His own ball cleared the lake as well, then landed in the bunker with a thud. He saw the sand spray up all the way from the tea box. Shaking his head in disgust, he put the driver back into his bag and took the wheel of the golf cart. My only long-term relationship was with a girl who had no idea who I was, Jason said. We met while I was out in Colorado on a consulting gig, and I knew she loved me before I let the cat out of the bag and introduced her to the family. That was Lisa, right? He remembered the friendly young woman Jason had dated for a few years. If he remembered correctly, the two of them had briefly been engaged. I'm sorry that didn't work out. I liked her. So did I. She couldn't handle the lifestyle and the pressure. Can't say I blame her. There are days when I still miss her. They both knew it was a lie. Lisa had left him at the altar for another guy, but Brad nodded. He finished the hole while pondering the idea that formed in his head. Cat, the pretty visitor next door, didn't know who he was. He'd enjoyed the time they'd spent together on the beach yesterday. If he could talk her into accompanying him as his date to the wedding, he'd be set. She seemed like a nice person and he wouldn't mind spending a little time with her. Even if it involved a family event. I think I'll ask the young woman who's staying at Miss Doris's guest cottage next door. We met on the beach. At the least, it should get my mother off my back for a while, Brad said. That might work, but if I know your mother, she won't stop until you put a ring on some lucky girl's finger, his friend said. He wasn't wrong. Why don't you find someone to play your fiancé for a couple of weeks? No strings attached. I'm sure one of your lawyers can whip up a contract. Pay her a couple of grand to look pretty and act like you're the center of the universe, Jason suggested a few minutes later. You get your mother off your back and a date for your brother's wedding. You keep up the charade for a few more weeks after, and then break off the engagement. You could even have her take the fall and act like you have a broken heart. That could easily buy you a few more months before Evelyn considers setting you up with someone else. The idea had merit. Brad wasn't sure he liked the thought of having someone else take the fall for him, but aside from that, it sounded like a good idea. I know a couple of pretty graduate students with plenty of student debt that would take you up on that offer. He was surprised Jason knew a bunch of sorority girls. He hadn't heard of him dating much since Colorado. Appreciate the offer, but I think I have someone in mind already. Someone with flaming red hair and the prettiest green eyes. A picture of Kat enjoying her ice cream cone flashed into his mind. He hoped he could talk her into playing his fake future wife. If he had to spend the next few weeks with someone pretending to be engaged, he'd make sure it was someone he actually liked spending time with. He doubted any sorority girl would fit that bill. The more he contemplated the idea the more he liked it. It gave him a chance to spend more time with Kat, and with a solid contract in place, there would be no chance she'd go after his money. Aside from the generous compensation package, he'd offer her in exchange for playing his fiancé for a few months. Brad's mood improved by the minute and with it, his golf game. He was too far behind to make up ground, and Jason continued to play well. But it didn't matter. He was fine losing a round of golf if he could bring the beautiful cat over on his side. Brad realized he knew very little about her. He knew her first name and that she was raising a daughter by herself. That was about it. He didn't even know her full name. He'd have to rectify that as soon as possible. How else was he supposed to have contracts drawn up? He should probably have someone do a background check on her as well. In his position, it never hurt to be careful with the people you surround yourself with. He'd learned that lesson the hard way a long time ago. Chapter 4 But Mama, I want to see your beach. Hannah was insistent and didn't believe Kat that the beach here on Palmer Island looked just like the one her grandparents had taken her to earlier in the day down on the Isle of Palms. Giving in, Kat walked out to the back deck and switched the camera view on her phone. See? Lots of sand, shells, seagulls and the ocean. She smiled at the surprised look on her daughter's face. It was nice to be able to see Hannah and talk to her several times a day. 
Kat wasn't sure she could have made it through the week without these little video chats. Honey, I think it's time for lunch, and then I want you to be a good girl and take a nap for grandma and grandpa, okay? Hannah poked out her lower lip. I'm a big girl. I don't take naps. Naps are for babies. Kat tried hard not to laugh at the all-too-familiar argument. If you take a little rest, Grandma might let you stay up late to watch the stars. It was one of their favorite late-night activities, usually reserved for Saturday evenings. They'd drive out into the country, away from the bright lights of Charlotte, lay out on a blanket, and count the stars. Kat was sure the night sky would be spectacular from her in-law's place. She'd have to remember to check it out when she went down there next week for the big birthday party. Listen, baby. I have to go. Let me talk to Grandma for a minute. I'll call you this evening to say goodnight. Miss you bunches. Save me some hugs. This was the worst part. As much as she loved chatting with her daughter, saying goodbye broke her heart a little. Every. Single. Time. She's doing fine. Please try not to worry about her. Her mother-in-law was a kind person, but it had been a while since she'd mothered a young child. Kat nodded, swallowing around the knot in her throat. Hannah did look fine. And Kat knew she'd feel better in a few minutes. She'd been enjoying the time by herself here on Palmer Island. The town was charming and the beach was beautiful. The island connected to the mainland by two bridges, making it easy to go back and forth to the greater Myrtle Beach area. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Brad walking over across the beach. She waved at him as he started to climb the stairs to Miss Doris's deck and gestured for him to sit down while she finished her call. When are you coming to the house? her mother-in-law asked. Kat wasn't looking forward to it, but there was no way she could miss the big birthday bash. Kevin's dad was turning 60 and the entire family would gather in Charleston for the event. She knew Kevin would have wanted her to attend. Maybe it would help Claire and Thomas feel like he was part of the celebration with her and Hannah there. She could take a few awkward hours to make this day easier for the two of them. I was thinking of coming down that morning. Do you mind if Hannah and I stay the night? I don't want to be on the road that late. Of course, honey. We'd love to have you. I'm so glad you and Hannah can be here. Claire paused for a moment. I know this isn't going to be easy for you. This wasn't the kind of conversation Kat wanted to have with a handsome stranger sitting five feet away from her. It'll be fine. She reassured Claire. We can finalize plans later this week. Call me if anything comes up with Hannah before tonight. If not, I will check in around bedtime. With that she ended the video chat and turned to face Brad. Hi. Sorry about that. I was checking in with my daughter. Hannah, right? I think you told me she was four. Is she having fun with her grandparents? She was impressed he remembered so much from their brief conversation the day before. That's right. And yes, she's having a great time. I'm sure they are spoiling her run. She wondered what he was doing here. Was he upset about the ice cream incident, now that he'd had some time to think about it? How is your shirt? Did that stain come out? She figured she'd better tackle the topic head-on. He looked confused. The stain? What stain? Oh, from the ice cream. Yeah, it's fine. It's in the wash. His eyes locked on hers, and he gave her another one of his dazzling smiles. He seemed amused, not upset at the memory. Relief flooded through her. She wasn't sure why, but the thought of having him upset with her didn't sit well. She barely knew the guy. Yes, he was good-looking and fun to talk to, but that shouldn't matter, much. What brings you over here then? Oh, are you here to see Miss Doris? She felt the heat creeping into her cheeks. Why did she assume he was here to see her? Miss Doris was his neighbor. Of course he'd be here to see the older woman, not her. No, I'm not here to see Miss Doris. There's something I wanted to talk to you about. 
He hesitated, looking unsure about how to continue. Yes, she prompted, doing her best to give him an encouraging smile. Here's the thing. My little brother is getting married in a few weeks. It's a long story, but I need someone to bring, so my mother will stop setting me up on more blind dates. You definitely don't want that. Kat couldn't keep the amusement out of her voice, thinking back to the story he'd told her about the latest blind date his mother had arranged. Definitely not. He hesitated again and looked thoughtful for a moment. I couldn't help but overhear your conversation earlier. You have a family function to attend as well? Kat nodded. Would it help to have someone there with you? For moral support, or to act as, as a boyfriend or something? The uncomfortable look on his face almost made her laugh, if only to cover up her own embarrassment. He looked like he enjoyed this conversation about as much as she did. He did have a point though. With a good-looking man like Brad by her side, she could avoid all the awkward conversations about when she would start dating again and how Hannah needed a good male role model in her life. Having a fake boyfriend sounded like the perfect solution. Because actually dating someone was out of the question. This might just work. That's not a bad idea. So we'd play fake boyfriend-girlfriend for a few weeks? Can I push my luck? How would you feel about becoming my fake fiancé, instead? She was stunned and not quite sure how she felt about that level of deception. I know it's asking a lot. It would only be for a few weeks. A couple of months, tops. We can break it off whenever you want. Give me a minute to think, Kat said. Becoming engaged wasn't something she'd ever considered. Would it really be that different from having a fake boyfriend though? We wouldn't have to mention the engagement to your family, if that helps. I only brought it up because it would help get my mother off my back for a while, even after we end the engagement. She couldn't throw me right back into the dating pool after something like that. He had a point, and if no one outside his family would know about the engagement, what could it hurt? Okay. She nodded her head, doing her best to convince herself that this was going to work out. And if it didn't, only a handful of people would know about their fake engagement. I'll do it, but there are going to have to be some ground rules. That sounds fair enough. What did you have in mind? Off the top of my head? Let me think. Her thoughts raced. She liked Brad as a friend. But that was it. No physical intimacies. And I want to make sure Hannah is involved as little as possible. You'll see her at the party of course, but I don't want her to get attached to you and then get hurt when you leave. It was one of the reasons why she wouldn't consider actually dating anyone. That, and the guilt. I can work with that. What about kissing in public though? If there's a situation where it may be expected of us, would that be okay? The thought of kissing him was strangely exciting. She missed kisses. And hugs. It couldn't hurt to enjoy a few harmless kisses, could it? That would be fine. She looked down to hide her embarrassment about the butterflies in her stomach. She shouldn't be getting excited about a fake kiss. They sat together in slightly uncomfortable silence for a few minutes. He cleared his throat. Tell me about you and Hannah. No dad in the picture? Kevin died in a car crash before Hannah was born. She's visiting with his parents right now. It's her grandfather's birthday party you've agreed to go to. She should be used to talking about this by now. The question came up far more often than she liked. It had been four years, three months, and twelve days since Kevin took his last breath in that hospital bed. She felt a strong arm around her shoulder as he pulled her towards him into an awkward sideways hug. I can't imagine how hard that was. Raising a kid by yourself can't be a piece of cake either. His embrace was comforting. She had missed physical contact more than she'd realized. Sure, she hugged and snuggled Hannah, but this was different. It felt nice. She allowed herself to soak up the comfort this man offered her for a few seconds, before pulling away. Running her fingers through her hair, to push it back out of her face, she looked up at him and forced a smile. No need to make him uncomfortable. 
He should know a little about her life and her past if they were going to pull off this fake engagement plan. Kevin went out late. He was going for a drive to clear his head. Brad didn't need to know that her husband had stormed out of the house after an argument. He was hit by a drunk driver. The ambulance took him to the hospital, but there was too much damage. He died early the next morning. She looked up, prepared for the pity that always followed her story. To her surprise, that's not what she saw in his eyes. There was sympathy, but no pity. The difference was subtle, but it meant the world to her. I'm sorry. Brad sounded sincere. Kat could tell he wasn't sure what else to say. The sad truth was there wasn't anything anyone could say to take away the pain or the guilt. Thank you, she replied, searching for the best way to end this conversation, or at least postpone it. I was going to head out to do a little shopping. Do you mind if we pick this back up tomorrow? Sure. Why don't we meet at my house at nine, and we can hash out all the details. He got up, walking across the deck toward the stairs that led down to the beach. Before he reached them, he turned around, looking right at her. Thank you for doing this. Then, he was gone. Kat curled up on the bench, hugging her arms around her legs, lost in thought and sad memories. She hadn't told him the whole story. He didn't know that it was her fault Kevin had died. That's why she wouldn't seriously date again. This was different. Yes, she was attracted to the man, but thankfully, the feeling wasn't mutual. All he wanted was a fake fiancé to get his mother off his back. That she could do. She got up to head inside for her purse and keys. If she was going to fake date, she needed a new dress and possibly a cute pair of shoes. Chapter 5 Kat wrapped her hands around the warm mug of coffee Brad had offered her when she'd arrived at his place a few moments ago. They sat in rocking chairs on the screened-in porch, overlooking the ocean. The place had a comfortable, lived-in feel to it. It matched the rest of the old house. Shabby, but clean and well-kept. It was the kind of place she had stayed at with her parents during summer trips to the beach as a child. Cat is a nickname, he asked, picking up his own mug. It's short for Catherine. No one calls me that though. It's always just been Cat. I like it. Most people call me Brad, but my full name is Bradley. Bradley Harold Sutton Jr., named after my father. Over coffee, they briefed each other on their respective families. Kat told him about living with her parents, and about her baby sister, who was finishing her master's degree in engineering at Stanford. Brad gave her a quick rundown of his siblings and his mother. His father, she learned, had passed away from a heart attack a few years ago. Since then, Brad had been in charge of the family business. He was a bit vague about what the business was exactly, but she didn't want to pry. Why don't we go for a walk on the beach, she suggested when they had both finished their coffee and the conversation began to lull. She figured it would be easier to continue to talk and make plans if they kept moving. That's a great idea. I still owe you that second ice cream cone. Or is it too early? Brad stood up and smiled at her, holding out a hand for her empty cup. It's never too early for ice cream, she replied unless the shop isn't open yet. Let's go and find out, Brad called over his shoulder while he rinsed the cups out in the old metal kitchen sink. Together, they headed out for a walk toward the south end of the island. It was a beautiful day, and her instincts had been right. It was much easier to talk. The conversation flowed, and two hours later, they'd come up with a short list of rules, their rules of engagement, and had filled each other in on their respective backstories. He knew she worked as a virtual office manager for a small construction company in Charlotte. She knew where he'd gone to college, that the beach house had been his grandparents, and that he lived and worked in Phoenix. That last bit of info had come as a surprise. Arizona was a long way off. She had assumed he was a local. Do you plan on going back to Phoenix soon? She hedged carefully. If he expected her to stay with him out west, this may not work out as well as they'd both hoped. Not for the next few weeks, and if I do, it would only be for a couple of days. I can oversee most things from here. 
I wouldn't expect you to travel out there, unless you want to. That was a relief. A trip to Phoenix for a few days actually sounded like fun. She hadn't been further west than the Mississippi. Not that it was an option once she had Hannah back. That works. I'm staying with Miss Doris through next Friday. I was planning on heading down to Charleston early Saturday morning to help set up for the party, then spend the night with my in-laws. Why don't I check us into a hotel nearby for Saturday night? It might be awkward to have your boyfriend stay at your in-law's house. Separate rooms at the hotel of course. That's not a bad idea. I don't think Claire would have a problem with us staying at the house, but I'm sure she would stick us in the same bedroom. Kat thought for a moment. Would you mind if Hannah spent the night at the hotel as well? Of course not. I look forward to meeting the little tyke. I was planning on heading back to Charlotte after that, but there's no reason I couldn't work from down here. Let me see if Miss Doris will rent me the cottage for another week or two. It would be nice to bring Hannah up. The rent would eat into her meager savings, but she would manage. I'll pay for the rental. You're doing me a favor after all. Brad had a determined look on his face and seemed to read her mind. Let's see if it's available before we start to argue about the bill. She heard him groan as they walked back off the beach and up the path that led to Miss Doris's property. Following his gaze, she saw a limo parked in front of his house. The door opened and a woman in her late fifties, dressed in a cream-colored designer suit that looked completely out of place on Palmer Island, stepped out. She wore dark sunglasses and unless Kat was mistaken, a pair of Louboutin heels. That's my mother. I have no idea why she's here. Do you mind if I introduce you? Sure, we might as well get that over with. Kat sounded more cheerful than she felt. The introduction was a bit awkward, and Brad's mother, the formidable Evelyn Sutton, gave her the once-over before insisting they head out to lunch together. I can't wait to hear all about you, Catherine, darling, she said as the three of them entered the limo. Take us to Shea Paul's, Evelyn told the driver. Shea Paul's turned out to be the fanciest place on the island. Heck, it was the fanciest place Kat had ever eaten in. She felt terribly underdressed in her summer dress, sandals, and simple white cardigan. She hadn't even put makeup on this morning before heading out to meet Brad. The conversation was forced and a bit uncomfortable, but the food was amazing. She loved the crab meat eggs benedict. Evelyn demanded to hear all about how the two of them had met and how long they'd been dating. Thankfully, it was easy to answer most of her questions. It was fortunate they'd worked all those details out on their walk Brad didn't bring up their engagement and neither did she. Where did you go to school? Evelyn continued to grill her. Kat saw Brad shoot his mother a warning glance. What? A mother needs to make sure the woman her son is dating is good enough for him. She made the statement unabashedly. Kat would bet a fair amount of money that Evelyn Sutton was dead serious and that Kat would not meet the high standards she'd set for her son. Maybe this fake engagement wouldn't be quite as easy to pull off as they'd thought. I graduated from UNC in law. She enjoyed the surprised look on Brad's face. It was a small detail she'd left out of her backstory because the degree didn't mean much these days. She'd gotten married right after graduation and never had a chance to work in her field. Her current job gave her the flexibility she needed to raise her daughter, and that was fine with her. After they'd finished brunch, Evelyn dropped them off at the house. Brad climbed out of the limo first before holding his hand out to Kat. Evelyn stepped out as well. You really need to do something about this, she waved her hand in the direction of the old beach house. Drop it, mother. It's mine, and I like it just the way it is. Dad did too. Evelyn Sutton shook her head, and Kat got the impression that the building had been a point of contention between these two for quite some time. He did. I need to run. With Caroline gone, I don't know how I'll get the house closed and make arrangements for Evelyn stopped herself. Never mind me. I'll muddle through. I always do. Goodbye, mother, Brad said. Call me if you need me. Kat didn't miss the small jab at his mother's unannounced visit, and neither did she. 
I hope to see you again soon, Catherine. Evelyn gave her a brief hug before climbing back into her limo. That was interesting. He barked out a laugh. Interesting is a kind way to put it. I'm sorry she put you through the ringer. Any thoughts about backing out on our deal? I wouldn't blame you. No way. She left. I work with a bunch of construction guys and deal with shrewd businessmen on a daily basis. I think I can handle myself around your mother. Glad to hear it. Listen, I hate to dash, but I have a couple of phone calls to make to my project managers and need to get a bit of work done. Brad looked apologetic. Kat had noticed him glancing at his phone repeatedly during their brunch at Shea Paul's. Apparently, there had been more to the habit than boredom or a way to avoid talking too much to his mother. No problem. I want to check on Hannah anyway. Kat walked over to the main house to see Miss Doris. It was time to get a little more info on Brad Sutton. She'd assumed he came from a background similar to her own. His house was oceanfront property, but it was small and old. It looked like the kind of place that had been in the family for a long time, nothing like the big million-dollar mansions that had popped up all over the island in the past decade or so. Meeting his mother had made her second-guess her assumptions. Either his mother remarried into a lot of money, or Brad was a lot better off than he'd let on. Not that it mattered, but if she was going to pretend to be engaged to the man, she wanted to be prepared for what she was walking into. Miss Doris was all too happy to gossip about the handsome young man next door. She'd lived here back in the day when his grandparents had lived in the house. Bradley was a smart kid, good grades all around. The old woman talked about Brad's father who grew up in Columbia but spent his summers here at the family beach house. John Sutton sent him up north to some fancy university. Miss Doris told her that Bradley Sr. had done well for himself, moving out west after college and getting into real estate. He'd married Evelyn and brought his kids down here for a few weeks each summer. She didn't like it. It wasn't fancy enough for her. Wasn't long before it was just Bradley and the kids each summer. Kat wasn't surprised to learn the woman she'd had lunch with didn't enjoy the rustic beach house or the tourist attractions Palmer Island had to offer. There hadn't been much to do other than play in the sand and have dinner at one of the seafood buffets back in the day. Armed with her newfound knowledge about the Sutton family and Brad's full name, she grabbed her laptop when she got back to the guest cottage. It was time to Google the man and see what she could find out about him and his family. To say the results were shocking was an understatement. She couldn't breathe for a few minutes when she realized she'd agreed to become engaged to a billionaire who also happened to be Arizona's most eligible bachelor. Chapter 6 We Need to Talk The text Cat had sent him first thing this morning sounded ominous. Maybe she'd changed her mind after all. His mother was a lot to handle, and she'd made it fairly obvious she hadn't approved of Cat yesterday. Brad's text, breakfast? Cat's text, sure. Give me half an hour. Brad's text, I'll pick you up at nine. They drove up to a little bakery in the middle of the island. Thankfully, it was a short drive and they spent it chatting about Hannah and the weather. Cat picked at her apple, cinnamon muffin. What did you want to talk about? He asked before taking a big bite of his bacon and egg sandwich. Um. Your financial status, she stammered her cheeks turning a lovely shade of pink. You didn't mention you were a billionaire. She shot an accusing look his way that made him choke on the food he was busy chewing. Does it matter, he asked after he recovered, watching her carefully. It explains your mother, to a point. And yes, it does matter. That's not something you keep secret from your fiancé. Fake fiancé. He could see where this was going. Before he knew it, she'd be all over him, insisting they'd found true love and should get married right away. It's how it always worked, though most of the time the women knew who he was and what his bank account looked like before he'd even introduced himself. He sat back, mentally preparing himself to call the whole thing off. Of course fake. But how am I supposed to prepare for this if I don't have all the facts? I don't want to walk into another situation like yesterday and get blindsided like that. I'm not sure you should come down to Charleston. 
Kevin's family is middle class like me. It would be weird if I showed up with a billionaire. She made it sound like a dirty word. That was new. Maybe she wasn't after his money. There was only one way to find out. I talked to my lawyer last night. He suggested we draw up a contract for this whole fake engagement thing so there's no confusion. I'd be happy to compensate you for your time of course. I'm not going to let you pay me. It's a mutual favor, remember? Had she already forgotten she basically uninvited him from her end of the bargain? And yes, I'll sign the contract. Wouldn't want you to think I was after half your fortune or something. She sounded hurt and it bothered him more than he'd expected. I don't think you're after my money. You didn't even know I had any until last night, remember? True, but if your lawyer thinks it's a good idea, I'll sign it. She crossed her arms and gave him a determined look. How about this? I won't let on that I'm loaded when we're down in Charleston and you let me pay for anything you or Hannah need while we're keeping up the charade. It's only fair. You'll be doing me a huge favor, and it's the least I can do. He watched her consider his offer. She nodded, and he let out a breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding. You studied law at UNC? What are you doing running the office for a construction company? I married Kevin while I was still in school. I got pregnant not long after graduation. He was working at a law firm in Charlotte, on track to make partner. He suggested I wait until Hannah was in preschool before I started to practice, and it made sense at the time. Then he died, and I had bills to pay. No law firm was interested in hiring a pregnant lawyer with no experience. My dad got me the job. He knows the owner. After Hannah was born, Dave let me do much of the work from home. It's worked out well. She shrugged. Brad admired her for her drive and the ability to do whatever it took to make sure her daughter was well cared for. The two of you live in Charlotte then? She looked down at her hands before responding. We're living with my parents. It's easier to have someone to watch Hannah when I need to run up to the office. She took a deep breath. And it's cheaper that way. I'm still up to my eyeballs in student loans, and then there's the debt from Kevin's accident. Insurance didn't cover everything. He felt anger rise in his chest. Hadn't her husband had a basic life insurance policy in place to make sure his wife and unborn child would be taken care of? He made a mental note to have someone look into her financial status. Who was this woman who obviously struggled to get back on her feet, yet hadn't asked him for a dime? If you're staying with Miss Doris, I'm paying for the rental. No discussion. Or you and Hannah could move in with me. There's plenty of room in the house and I promise you'd have your privacy. That is, if your boss is fine with you working from down here for a little while. Let me think about it. Work shouldn't be a problem. Most of the crew is off for the next few weeks and there aren't a lot of active projects running. I'll call Dave later and make sure it's not going to be an issue. He's been bugging me to take more time off anyway. She smiled, and he decided then and there he'd give her more reasons to smile. Chapter 7 The pizzeria Brad took her to for dinner was quaint, and the large supreme they shared was delicious. There was just something about brick oven pizza. She was laughing and wiping a glob of sauce and cheese from her chin when her phone rang. Cat, I think you better come down here. Hannah is running a fever of 104. She was fine at dinner and we went through her regular bedtime routine. She woke up half an hour ago crying and telling me her throat hurts. We're on our way to the hospital now. Kat's heart stopped. I'll be there as soon as I can. She ended her call and looked over at Brad. Hannah's sick. She's spiking a fever. I have to get down there. Her hand shook as she put her phone in her purse. Brad pulled a wad of cash from his wallet, threw it on the table, stood up, and held his hand out to her. Let's go. I'll drive you. What hospital? You don't have to do that. If you would just drop me off at the house. I'm not letting you drive down to Charleston like this. We can leave straight from here unless there's something you need from the house? 
Five minutes later, they were on Highway 17 heading south. Thankfully, traffic had died down. Rush hour was over, and they were making good time. A short while later, she called her mother-in-law to find out what hospital they'd taken Hannah to. We're here at the university hospital. The pediatrician is examining her now. I'll call you as soon as I have news. Passing the information on to Brad, he asked her to pull up directions on his phone. I'm sure she's fine. The doctors there are excellent. My brother works with them. He's a doctor? Kat hadn't remembered him mentioning anything about his siblings' professions. No, he is interested in cancer research and does a lot of fundraising in that area. He works closely with a team at CU. Brad called his brother using the hands-free function built into the car. Pete, I need you to get in touch with your contacts down at CU. A good friend of mine's daughter is being admitted. I want to make sure she gets the best care possible. I'll call down there right now. What's her name? With one phone call, Brad had made sure her daughter would be seen by the head of pediatrics right away. She didn't know how he'd made it happen, but she was grateful. It didn't make the drive any easier though. Time slowed down to a crawl. A glance at the speedometer told her Brad was going well over the speed limit. Any other time, she'd say something. She wasn't a fan of unsafe driving, but he appeared to be in full control of the vehicle, and she wanted to get to her daughter's side as quickly as possible. She's in good hands, and I'm sure it's nothing serious. Kids get high fevers all the time, right? It was sweet of him to try to reassure her, and he had a point. This wasn't the first time Hannah had run a fever, and usually it was something harmless that passed within 24 hours. I hope you're right. It's never jumped quite that high this quickly though. By the time they made it to the hospital and up to Hannah's room, the doctors had a diagnosis and her baby girl was sound asleep. Brad stayed with her while they talked to the head pediatrician who assured her Hannah was going to be fine. They'd seen quite a few cases, he told her. It was a virus going around that caused high fever and dehydration. He suggested they keep Hannah overnight for observation and to ensure the Tylenol would be enough to keep her fever at bay. I'm confident we'll be able to release her in the morning. The doctor left after advising the nurse to call him if there were any changes or concerns. Brad had put an arm around her while they'd been talking, and she appreciated his silent support. She introduced him to Hannah's grandparents before moving to her daughter's side. Her little girl was still sound asleep, and while her skin felt hot to the touch, it didn't feel like a fever of 104. Why don't I walk down to the cafeteria to get us some coffee? Brad suggested. She appreciated his tact. It would give her a chance to talk to her in-laws privately and explain his presence. Who is that man? Claire asked the moment the door closed behind Brad. Brad Sutton. He's staying in the house next to the one I'm renting. We ran into each other the day I dropped off Hannah. We were having dinner when you called. He was kind enough to drive me down here. She didn't like her mother-in-law's tone. Claire. Thomas gave his wife a warning look, which she promptly ignored. Well, that didn't take long, did it? Her mother-in-law hissed at her. You're off for two days, and you return with a man in tow. How could you do this to Hannah? How could you do this to Kevin? Claire, that's enough. Kat was too stunned to respond and was grateful for her father-in-law's intervention. She looked at the two of them. The years since Kevin's accident hadn't been easy on any of them, and the stress of the night had taken its toll. She realized for the first time how old and sad they looked. It softened her feelings toward Claire a bit. And she was right. What was she thinking striking up a friendship with Brad? Claire would blow a gasket if she found out they were dating. And Kat couldn't very well tell her that it was all a charade. Quite a mess she'd gotten herself into. Don't listen to Claire. Her father-in-law walked over to her and sat on the bed beside her, turning her to look at him. You've done more than your fair share of mourning for Kevin. You deserve to be happy and in love. Kevin would want that for you. We want that for you. Tears sprang to her eyes at Thomas's kind words. 
She shook her head. It's not like that. We barely know each other. He's a friend. The point is, it's none of our business. He gave his wife another firm look when she huffed. And it's time I took Claire home to get some rest. I assume you're staying here with Hannah tonight? She nodded. Good. We'll be back first thing in the morning to check on you. Call us if there's any news or if you need anything. By the time Brad returned with four coffees and a couple of sandwiches, her in-laws had left. You didn't get a chance to eat much of your pizza. He handed her a coffee and held out the food. Her stomach growled at the sight of it, and they both laughed. Kat put a hand over her mouth and anxiously turned to Hannah, afraid they'd woken her up. As much as she wanted to see those bright green eyes looking at her, she knew her daughter needed all the rest she could get. Did we wake her? Brad sounded as concerned as she felt. No, she's out like a light, Kat replied before getting up from the bed, coffee in hand. Why don't we both eat? You didn't get much pizza either. She ate her sandwich and drank her coffee, taking the time to look around the hospital room for the first time. It was huge with a sitting area, a recliner, and a cot by the window. All this in addition to the hospital bed Hannah was resting in. Did you do this? She was pretty sure regular patients didn't get this kind of treatment, even at a prestigious hospital like this. The administrator did. Pete must have called her. He's donated quite a bit over the years, and they are happy to accommodate. I wanted to make sure Hannah was well taken care of. She couldn't believe he'd do this for someone he hadn't met yet. She was grateful, but she had first-hand experience with what hospital care cost and there was no way her insurance would pay for any of this. I can't, she started, before he interrupted her. It's taken care of. But I can't just. Yes, you can. Please, let me do this for you, and Hannah. The look in his eyes was pleading and sincere. And truth be told, she was too emotionally drained and tired to fight him on this. Okay, but let's not make this a habit. He smiled. I can live with that. The food made her feel better, but the coffee wasn't doing the trick. She yawned and had a hard time keeping her eyes open. I assume you want to stay here with Hannah tonight? Yes. If you're ready to get back. Not a chance. I'm not leaving you down here. Why don't you take the cot? I'll nap in the recliner. That way, you'll be here when she wakes up. She was grateful for his support, and a nap was a good idea. She knew she'd wake up the moment her daughter made the slightest bit of noise. It had been that way since the day she'd given birth to her. Brad stepped out to the nurse's station and came back with a stack of blankets and pillows. A few minutes later, she was curled up on the cot, thinking about how grateful she was to have run into this handsome billionaire on the beach two days ago. Chapter 8 Who are you? Hannah had slept through the night, and Kat had gotten a solid few hours worth of sleep. He'd spent quite a bit of the night watching the two of them sleep. Kat was still curled up on the small cot that looked much more comfortable than the recliner and he was glad for it. His neck and back were both stiff. He got up and walked over to the hospital bed. I'm Brad. I'm a friend of your mom's. She's still sleeping. He pointed to the cot. Mama. He saw Kat's eyes spring open and within a second she'd thrown off her blanket and was at her daughter's side. The two shared the same sparkling green eyes and thick red hair. Hannah looked like a smaller version of her mother. The thought made him smile. How are you feeling, pumpkin? He watched Kat reach over and brush her daughter's hair back, feeling her forehead before cupping the little girl's cheek. I'm hot and my head hurts. I'll go get a nurse. He was already to the door when a nurse walked in with a big tray of food. I thought y'all could use some coffee and breakfast. She set the tray down on the table of the sitting area and stepped up to the bed to take Hannah's vitals. Let's take your temperature, and then you can dig into those pancakes I brought you. Hannah's face lit up at those words. She opened her mouth and let the nurse put a thermometer under her tongue. Looking good, kiddo. 
The nurse made a note on her chart before turning to Kat to let her know that the fever was down. The doctor will be by shortly to take one last look, but my guess is he'll let her go home this morning. With that, she left and let them enjoy their breakfast. Kat went back to sit by Hannah's side, coffee in hand. There's someone I want to introduce you to. He's a good friend. She waved him over. This is Brad. We've met. The polite words and serious tone coming out of the four-year-old's mouth made him laugh. Yes, we have, and the pleasure is all mine. He bowed before leaning over and kissing the little girl's hand, careful not to disturb the four in her arm. She giggled. Are you a prince? The comment took him off guard, but he quickly recovered. Something like that, he told her with a wink. He caught Kat's smirk out of the corner of his eye. So, you like pancakes? he asked, trying to distract her. For someone so small, she was quite perceptive. Or maybe that was his imagination. He didn't have much experience with kids. He found he quite liked this one though. The fact that she was a miniature version of Cat didn't hurt. Yes, sir. Can I have some now? I was good for the nurse. He looked over at Cat for approval before bringing over a tray with a stack of pancakes, a pack of syrup, and a glass of orange juice. Cat picked up the knife and fork, cutting the pancakes into bite-sized pieces, before feeding them to her daughter. The three of them had finished breakfast and were playing a game of I'd spy when Hannah's grandparents walked into the hospital room. Grandma Claire. Grandpa Tom. Hannah seemed happy to see her grandparents, hugging both of them. You came back. Of course we did. We had to check to make sure you were getting better, Thomas replied. Claire sat on the bed, opposite of Kat, holding the little girl's hand in hers. How are you feeling, Munchkin? She's much better. We're just waiting for the doctor to release her, Kat responded. Oh good, we can be back at the house for lunch. Are the two of you coming? Claire looked at Kat and Brad. I'm taking Hannah back with me to Palmer Island. She's supposed to stay with us until Saturday, Claire replied. Her husband walked over to her and took her in his arms. Hannah is sick. She needs her mother. We talked about this, Claire. Brad took a second to read the room. He was in the middle of a negotiation, something he was good at. He decided to take control of the situation and work this out. How about this? We take Hannah back for the next couple of days, then come back down early to give you more time with your granddaughter. I'll have them here Friday afternoon, and I'll take everyone out to dinner. Kat, Hannah, and I will spend the night at the Hilton, and I'll drop them off Saturday morning so the girls can help you set up. Does that work for you, Kat? She nodded. Do you want to go back with your mom, honey bear? Claire looked at Hannah. Yes, ma'am. I want to go with Mama and Brad. She raised her head to whisper loudly into her grandmother's ear, I want to see his castle. He's a prince. She was adorable, and the look on Claire's face was priceless. But if Claire and Thomas weren't supposed to find out about his billionaire status, he'd have to put an end to this. Kind of a prince, he corrected the little girl. Winking at Claire, he put a finger to his lips and said, it's supposed to be a secret. Sorry. Hannah looked even more excited to go back home with him, and pride surged in his chest. He briefly wondered what he could do on such short notice to make his beach house look more castle-like. Did you bring the car seat, Tom? Kat asked her father-in-law. Of course I did. Brad, why don't we walk down and I'll grab it for you, the older man suggested. Do you mind? How could he resist Kat's pleading eyes? He had zero car seat experience, but how hard could it be? The two men walked down to the parking area. Tom opened the back door of his 90-something Volvo station wagon and removed the car seat. The thing was a lot bigger than he'd expected. Need some help installing that? His pride got the better of him and he declined. Make sure you hook up those anchor straps and get it in there securely, Tom advised before heading back up to the hospital room. 
45 minutes, and several YouTube videos. Later he'd finally gotten the seat to fit securely into his 2018 Maserati Gran Turismo. Clearly, the car wasn't made for safely transporting young children. You would think otherwise since the small back seats clearly weren't designed to hold a grown man. Unfortunately, the cramped space also made it next to impossible to install the seat in the first place. Thankfully, he got the job done. He wasn't sure he'd ever get that thing back out though. He should look into a more sensible car. A Volvo may not be a bad option now that he was a family man. He shook his head and reminded himself that Kat and Hannah were only in his life for a few short weeks. After that, he could go back to his quiet bachelor ways and enjoy driving his fleet of cars, most of which were completely inappropriate for transporting preschoolers. Mama? Hannah rose from the couch at the beach house. Kat rushed over and felt her head. Relief rushed through her when her daughter's temperature felt normal. Mama, can we go swimming? I don't want to lay on the couch anymore. Hannah sounded impatient, and Kat took it as a good sign. I want to play. No swimming for a few days, but if you're feeling up to it, we could play a game. How about Candyland? Hannah pouted and threw her blanket off. She'd been cooped up in the house since they'd returned yesterday. Kat had done her best to get her to rest, but from the looks of it, her time was up. Tell you what, Brad said, walking into the living room. We all play the game together and after that we're watching a movie. But I don't want to. Then tomorrow, I'm taking both of you to the aquarium. They have sharks and mermaids. Hannah paused for a moment and stopped trying to get up from the couch. Won't the sharks eat the mermaids? She looked concerned, and Kat had to suppress a grin. They are probably in different areas, but we can find out for ourselves tomorrow. Brad sat down on the couch and pulled Hannah close to him. Do we have a deal? We take it easy today and go out tomorrow. Deal, but only if we can have popcorn when we watch the movie. It's a deal. And if you're good, I'm even throwing in some ice cream. Kat walked over to the bookshelf to grab the board game. Not for the first time, she found herself thinking how nice it was to have support in this parenting thing. Brad's boardroom honed negotiation skills had come in handy. Chapter 9 Kat groaned when she saw the long line in front of the aquarium. Hannah was already bouncing around, more than a little excited to see the sharks and feed the stingrays. Keeping her entertained while waiting in line for half an hour was not going to be easy. She started to rummage through her purse to see what she could find that would keep the little girl's attention while they waited. Follow me. Brad headed past the crowd waiting in line, straight towards the entrance. Kat grabbed his arm, doing her best to stop him. You can't cut in line, she whispered, not wanting to cause a scene. We're not. Trust me. He gave her a wink, grabbed Hannah's hand, and strode to the door where he handed the attendant a folded sheet of paper. The young man nodded politely, opened the door and gestured for them to enter. How in the... Brad interrupted her, barely able to contain his laughter from the look of things. I went online yesterday to check the place out. I wanted to make sure it was something Hannah would enjoy. All the reviewers suggested ordering the tickets on the website to avoid the lines. It was cheaper that way too. He looked pleased with himself. You looked it up? Kat couldn't keep the surprise out of her voice. Thank you. That was very thoughtful. Before either of them could continue the conversation, Hannah grabbed their hands and pulled them down a hallway towards the first exhibit. They ended up circling the entire place and then went back to see the tropical fish again. Kat could tell Hannah was getting hungry and tired. Ready to head back, pumpkin? Maybe we can stop and pick up some lunch. How about some chicken nuggets and fries? I don't want to go, Hannah whined, and Kat mentally prepared for a tantrum. She was not looking forward to dragging her daughter out of this place. She was sure Brad would be embarrassed if they caused a scene. She got ready to put her foot down and use her best mom voice when Brad stepped in. How about this? We'll go pet the stingrays again and then we'll stop by the gift shop before we leave. Would that be okay? 
He looked at Kat and she nodded her head. It was nice to have someone else take charge. The rest of their visit went without a hitch. Brad bought Hannah a little plush dolphin that she happily cradled in her arms. She'd even talked the man into carrying her to the car. Kat smiled when she realized how quickly Hannah had wrapped him around her little finger. It was nice to see the little girl happy after the hospital scare. They stopped at a fast food place for lunch. Over burgers, fries, milkshakes, and of course, chicken nuggets, they happily chatted about their morning visit. An older couple walked by their table and Kat heard the woman say, what a cute family. She shot a quick glance up at Brad, but he must have missed the comment. He was deep in conversation with Hannah about clownfish. She had a feeling she'd be watching a movie about a certain orange and white striped fish for the 27th time later tonight. She smiled. They did look like a happy family, and the idea was oddly comforting. She was lost in her own thoughts and almost missed it. What did you say? I told Hannah we could go buy a fish tank tomorrow so she can have a clownfish, an angelfish, and whatever that blue one was in her room. Brad and Hannah both looked at her with excited smiles. What was he doing? He couldn't make promises like that. What would she do with an aquarium when their stay here at the beach ended? She couldn't very well drive up to Charlotte with a fish tank sitting next to Hannah's car seat in the back of her rundown Honda Accord. Let's talk about this later, she suggested, picking up their trays and getting Hannah ready to leave. After all the excitement and food, it took less than 10 minutes for Hannah to fall asleep on the drive home. You can't promise her stuff like that, Brad. She hated to ruin their fun day, but needed to make him understand that he had to be careful about his involvement with Hannah. She couldn't allow this arrangement to hurt her daughter. What's wrong with a fish tank? Nothing is wrong with a fish tank, per se. It said you can't go buying her a bunch of stuff and getting her attached to you. And what am I supposed to do with the tank when we leave here in a couple of weeks? It's not exactly something I can throw in the trunk, is it? You didn't mind when I bought her the dolphin. She sighed. There is a big difference between a plush toy and a tank full of live exotic fish. She had to put her foot down. Look, I'm her parent, and I'm the one who will have to deal with the consequences of these gifts, so I'd appreciate if you'd run things by me before offering to buy something for my daughter. Of course. His tone was clipped, and he sounded hurt. Maybe that had come out a little harsher than she'd intended. I just don't want her to get hurt at the end of this. I get it. This is nothing but a fake engagement. It's not like I'm your boyfriend or anything at all to Hannah. You're right. I'll keep my distance from now on. That wasn't exactly what she'd wanted, but this wasn't the time to get into an argument with him. When they got to the beach house, she gently unbuckled Hannah, carrying her into the guest cottage after a quick goodbye to Brad. She managed to get her tucked into bed without waking her. The excitement of the day must have really tuckered her out. Kat smiled when she noticed Hannah was still holding onto the dolphin Brad had gotten her. She'd been pretty harsh with him. He was being kind and he was new to this whole kid thing. She should cut him a little slack. And she owed him an apology. She asked Miss Doris to keep an eye on the sleeping Hannah and walked across the beach to Brad's house. I'm sorry. I overreacted. Kat apologized the moment he opened the screen door to his porch. It's just been Hannah and me for so long, I guess I'm not used to anyone else doing stuff for her. I'm sorry too. I wasn't thinking. I should have run the idea by you first. She seemed so excited about the fish. Kat laughed. She's four. She gets excited about pretty much everything. Why don't I take you out to dinner tonight, and we can talk about the best way to handle my involvement with Hannah the next few weeks. I like her, and if you don't mind, I'd love to spend more time with both of you. How could she resist this man when he was all sweet and understanding? Let me see if Miss Doris is available to babysit tonight. What time were you thinking? How about around eight? Does that give you enough time to put her to bed? Brad gave her a curious look. He seemed genuinely interested in her daughter's bedtime and trying to make this as easy on her as possible. 
That works. Let me talk to Miss Doris. I'll text you in a bit. Sounds great. I'll plan on picking you up at eight. He looked pleased, and she found she was excited about dinner. It almost felt like a real date. The feeling increased when he showed up at her doorstep with a small bouquet of flowers. Miss Doris beamed up at her when she rushed into the kitchen to put them in water. He was a perfect gentleman, opening doors for her and even pulling out her chair at the restaurant. They'd returned to Chez Paul's, the only high-end establishment on the island. Both the vibe and the menu were different at night. The place had a cozy romantic feel to it with dimmed lighting and candles on each table. Her lobster ravioli was divine and the sirloin steak Brad ordered looked melt-in-your-mouth tender. She almost wished she'd ordered one herself. That would have been a bit unladylike though. They shared a plate of assorted mini cheesecakes topped with fresh berries for dessert when a gorgeous blonde, who looked a bit like a model, stepped up to their table. Brad, honey. What a lucky coincidence. I had no idea you were down here. I've been thinking about you since our last date. The woman practically threw herself around Brad's neck. She completely ignored Kat, who sat back to watch the scene unfold. Hmm, hi, Jennifer. It's been a while. He looked more than a little uncomfortable as he pried her arms off his neck. I know. Much too long. We should do something, go out. Do you want to grab a drink? The chick had the audacity to try and pry him away from her while they sat at dinner. Kat couldn't believe the woman. I don't think so. Look. I'm having dinner with Kat. Why don't we catch up some other time? Maybe when we're both back in Phoenix. Kat got the distinct feeling he was doing his best to convince the woman to leave them alone without making a scene. Eventually, the young woman got the idea and walked away, but not before turning around and mouthing, call me. I'm sorry about that. That was Jennifer Doyle. We went on a couple of dates back in Phoenix at my mother's insistence. Let's just say things didn't go so well. I would have introduced you, but Jennifer isn't someone you'd care to meet. To be perfectly honest, it's best that she knows as little as possible about you. He had a concerned look in his eyes that worried her a bit. Don't worry about it, she reassured him. We're not going to let her ruin a perfectly lovely dinner. Brad smiled and reached across the table to grab her hand. Thanks for coming out with me. This is by far the most pleasant date I've been on in a while. Kat felt the warmth from his large hand wrapped around hers. It did interesting things to her heart and her stomach. The physical reaction surprised her. It had been a long time since the touch of man had sparked that kind of feeling in her. Not since Kevin. She pulled her hand from his grasp and suggested they get the check. Chapter 10 the sun was out with the blazing intensity of a clear, early summer day. Brad noticed Kat and Hannah walking down to the beach with chairs and sand toys and decided to join them. He still wasn't sure what to make of Kat's reaction last night. They'd had a lovely dinner, until Jennifer showed up. He was grateful Kat hadn't made a big deal out of the run-in. Most women he dated would have turned it into a fight, or at the very least given him a hard time about it. Not Kat though. She'd been understanding and when he'd held her hand, he would have sworn they had a connection. He was starting to feel more than friendship for his beautiful fake fiancé, and he'd been sure she was feeling the same. Then, she'd suddenly gotten quiet and closed off. Time to find out what was going on. Mind if I join you, he asked, plopping down in the sand next to Kat. What are you making, he asked Hannah before giving Kat a chance to respond. A sand castle. Wanna help? Hannah worked away with a tiny little shovel. At this rate, it would take days to make a decent-sized castle. He moved closer, piling up sand with both hands. He had to bite back a laugh when he saw the little girl's amazed look at how quickly the pile was growing. Within minutes, they had not only a large mound, but also a moat running around it. Why don't you girls go find some shells, and I'll dig this moat out a little further, he suggested. 
Kat gave him one of her amazing smiles and grabbed one of the buckets. We'll be right back, she assured him. With lots of pretty shells, Hannah piped in. He managed to dig all the way down to the water level by the time the girls returned with a bucket full of seashells. He'd even added a few turrets to the top of the castle, using the wet sand and one of Hannah's toys as a mold. She squealed in delight, and even Kat looked impressed. They spent the next little while sitting side by side, chatting away and watching Hannah add shells to the castle. It was the most fun he'd had on the beach in quite some time. Until he caught sight of Jennifer under one of the beach umbrellas a little ways down. It was obvious she was watching them and it made his blood boil. He got up and walked over to confront her. What are you doing? He wasn't going to let her ruin this. What are you doing with that skink and her little brat? Jennifer shot back. What is she? Some waitress you picked up down here? She's my fiancé and I'd appreciate it if you would give us some privacy. It was all he could do to contain his anger. He did his best to let it roll off and get his feelings under control by the time he reached Kat and Hannah. Everything okay? He hated the look of concern in Kat's eyes. Yes, nothing to worry about. It's just Jennifer being Jennifer. He shrugged like it was no big deal. I've got it handled. When Kat took Hannah back to the guest cottage for a nap, he got busy. Jennifer had been more than a nuisance back in Phoenix, but now she had crossed a line. Not only had she tracked him all the way down here, she was obviously spying on Hannah and Kat. He knew better than to attempt a restraining order on her. He'd tried that last year, to no avail. But he sure as heck would make certain his girls were safe. His first call was to the private detective he'd hired to keep tabs on the crazy woman. He didn't think she was dangerous, but it was always better to be informed. Raymond, are you still keeping an eye on Jennifer Doyle? I emailed you a report a few hours ago. I picked up some credit card charges in South Carolina. Don't you own a house down there? Brad had been too busy having fun to keep up with email and had missed the message. He caught the private investigator up on what was going on down there. Together, they decided it couldn't hurt to set up a little extra protection for Kat and Hannah. The security firm he used for their properties in the southeast was happy to send a team over for the next few weeks. Knowing the girls were watched over made him feel better. He had no idea how Kat would react to the news of hired protection. She'd either think he was nuts or run scared and take off. He decided it was in his best interest to keep that bit of news from her, for now. Plus, chances were good that Jennifer was completely harmless. He hoped she'd run into some other rich guy down here and forget all about him. Things looked up over the next few days. There were no further signs of Jennifer, and the two ex-Navy SEALs he'd hired were doing a great job staying out of sight. He had a hard time spotting them as he spent more days playing in the sand, swimming in the ocean, and exploring various tourist attractions across the Grand Strand. Hannah's favorite had been an alligator exhibit and a ride on a large ferris wheel that made Cat turn green in the face. He hadn't realized that was an actual thing. She didn't simply look nauseous, the color of her face had turned a yellow-greenish shade. His heart had stopped at the sight, and he'd been tempted to rush her to the hospital. Kat turned out to be a trooper though. After a few minutes, she was fully recovered, and they'd been able to enjoy the rest of their day. The week was quickly coming to a close. He needed to arrange for accommodations for the three of them, as well as the protection team in Charleston. Brad was surprised that he looked forward to seeing Thomas and Claire again for the big party. Chapter 11 The drive down to Charleston had been much more pleasant this time around. The hotel suite Brad rented was impressive. It had two large bedrooms, complete with separate baths, a large sitting area, and even a decent-sized kitchen. The hotel staff stocked the fridge with kid-friendly snacks and plenty of fresh fruit and cheese. If she wasn't careful, she could get used to this. The birthday party for her father-in-law was a big success, and much to her surprise, Kat enjoyed herself. It was good to catch up with family and friends on Kevin's side. Hannah stayed busy playing with a few second cousins her age and Kat danced the night away with Brad. 
He was an amazing dancer and didn't mind being dragged on the dance floor. Ready for a break? Brad didn't look a bit disheveled. She was sure her hair was a mess, and she could use some water. Sure, I'll grab us some drinks. She suggested they meet back at their table and headed to the restroom to see what she could do to get her hair under control. Thinking that her lipstick could use some freshening up, she stopped to grab her purse. Ugh, her hair looked worse than she'd feared. There wasn't much she could do other than pull it back. She reapplied lipstick and headed back into the church's fellowship hall. It was a nice, low-key venue with plenty of room to spread out. She waved at Brad who stood across the room, chatting with Thomas, two water bottles in hand. Look at you, cat. Kevin's cousin Ruth walked up to her, a fake smile plastered across her face. She'd never liked the woman much, but she was family. Kat smiled and gave her a quick hug. I'm surprised you brought a date. Don't you think that's in bad taste, this being Thomas's birthday and all? I, Kat was too stunned to come up with a response. Guilt flooded through her. The memories of that night five years ago came fast and furious. The fight with Kevin. Him storming out of the house and driving off. The policeman at that door. The hospital. Kat felt like she couldn't breathe. She had to get out of here. I think it's lovely that Brad joined us. Claire stepped next to Kat and put an arm around her. He's such a kind man, and both Thomas and I have enjoyed getting to know him better. Kat was stunned and grateful for her mother-in-law's support. I'm surprised, Claire. I think you, of all people, would expect Kat to honor Kevin's memory instead of taking off with some other guy. Kat couldn't decide if she was more embarrassed or furious. Before she could compose herself, her mother-in-law came to her rescue yet again. I don't think there's a better way to honor Kevin's memory than for Kat and Hannah to be happy. I'm sorry if you are too close-minded to see that, Ruth. Kat has been mourning Kevin for four years. She's done an amazing job raising Hannah by herself. I, for one, am glad she's found someone, and she couldn't have done better than Brad. With that, Claire gently coaxed Kat across the room towards Thomas and Bradley. Ignore her, she suggested. She's unhappy in her own marriage and deals with it by making sure everyone else is miserable. Claire turned Kat to face her. I meant every word I said. I'm happy for the two of you, and I'm sorry about the way I reacted in the hospital. Don't let anyone ruin your happiness, especially not someone like Ruth. Everything okay? Brad looked concerned, as did Thomas. Everything's fine. She beamed at both men, and to her surprise, she meant it. She was fine. She was enjoying the party and the company. And she was ready for another dance with Brad. A few dances later, the party started to die down. Ready to leave, she asked him as they stepped off the dance floor. Yes, please. She laughed at his enthusiasm. They'd had a great time other than the short incident with Ruth. Kat felt a tinge of guilt that she was here laughing, dancing, and enjoying herself with another man at her side. But for the first time, she also felt that there could be someone special in her life for real. She hoped it might be Brad. Hannah, do you think we should show Brad the stars? Her daughter bounced in her car seat with excitement. What are you two talking about? His voice was an interesting mix of confused and intrigued. It did funny things to her inside. Hannah and I like to drive out into the country and count the stars. There's a spot not far from my in-law's house that's perfect for stargazing. It's not too far from the hotel. Are you game? She glanced over at him to gauge his reaction, but couldn't read his expression. Where to, he asked. Apparently, their little nighttime adventure was a go. This is amazing, Brad said. I haven't done this in ages. My dad used to put an old comforter out on the deck at the beach house and we'd lay there, looking at the stars. She was stretched out in the grass, Hannah laying between her and Brad. The little girl was snuggled up against his side, her head resting comfortably in the crook of his arm. It hadn't taken long for Hannah to fall asleep after all the fun and excitement of the party. 
Cat couldn't take her eyes off the two of them. They looked so cute together, it almost broke her heart. If she saw a shooting star tonight, Cat knew exactly what she would wish for. If only there was a chance for it to come true. She cleared her throat to keep the emotion from appearing in her voice. Tell me about your family. He told her a bit about what it was like growing up as a Sutton. His dad had worked a lot but made it a point to spend time with all three of his kids. Much of their summers had been spent at the beach house he now owned. It sounded like some of his best memories were tied to that house. What about your mother, she prompted during a lull in the conversation. She never cared for the beach house. It wasn't upscale enough for her. She came down with us a few times when we were little, but it never lasted long. Dad eventually bought a proper mansion for her just south of the island. The whole family comes down a few times a year. It's good for entertaining clients, but not my cup of tea. It was nice to hear him talk about his family. She was looking forward to getting to know them at his brother's wedding in two weeks. Two weeks. She had two more weeks with Brad and then they would announce their breakup and go their separate ways. She hoped she could guard her heart long enough to avoid getting hurt too badly. Because she was pretty sure that wish of hers wasn't coming true. Where were those shooting stars when you needed them? Chapter 12 Brad sat at his kitchen table eating lunch. Something didn't feel right. He looked around his place. Everything was exactly where it should be, but the niggling feeling didn't go away. Then it hit him. Kat and Hannah were missing. Over the course of the weekend, he'd gotten used to having the two of them around constantly. Back at his own house by himself, things were too quiet. There were no toys lying around, no one to jump in his lap with a book, demanding him to read a story. And she wasn't there. He missed hearing Kat's voice and her warm laughter. He missed catching her eye across the room. He just plain missed her. There had to be a way to convince Kat to move in with him. A plan started to form in his mind. What he needed was a partner in crime. The moment he saw Kat and Hannah walk down to the beach, he stepped out his front door and walked next door to see Miss Doris. I could use your help. There was no reason to be coy with the old woman. She'd known him for as long as he could remember. She and her husband had been the kind next-door neighbors Brad and his siblings had looked forward to seeing whenever they'd come down to visit his grandparents. This is about Kat, isn't it? What can I do to help? Come on in. I'll put on a pot of coffee. It was just like Miss Doris to not be phased one bit. By the time Kat and Hannah returned, he was back at his own place, and they had a plan in place. Brad stopped by later in the day to pick up Kat and Hannah. They were heading out to grab pizza and play a few games at the arcade by the pier. Miss Doris stepped out just on cue. Can I talk to you for a minute, she asked Kat. This is so embarrassing. I just realized that I have new renters coming the day after tomorrow to stay at the cottage for a week. She looked absolutely distraught. If Brad didn't know any better, he'd buy it. Kat looked stunned, but quickly composed herself. Don't worry, Miss Doris. Hannah and I can pack up in the morning and drive back to Charlotte. Does that give you enough time to get the place ready for the new renters? It was his turn to be stunned. She was more concerned about Miss Doris than the fact that her vacation was cut short. Why don't you move in with me, he suggested. There's plenty of room. You and Hannah would have your own bedroom and bath. There wouldn't be much difference to you staying at the cottage. And you wouldn't have to travel back and forth for the wedding. He crossed his fingers behind his back and hoped the ploy would work. I don't want to go back home, Hannah said. Please, 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 can we stay with Uncle Brad? His heart did a funny flipping thing when he heard his new title. He liked it. Cat looked torn. He was a good negotiator and sensed this was not the time to push his luck. Why don't we head out and you can think about it? No need to decide until tomorrow. That would give him a little time to convince her to move into his place. The plan worked. 
By morning, he was carrying Hannah's suitcase and box of toys into the room he'd set up for her. Kat stepped into the room behind him. Is that a princess bed? You just happen to have one of those? She looked over to her daughter who was busy exploring not only the bed, but the tea set arranged on a little table lined by two small pink chairs, the huge stuffed teddy bear in the corner, and the low bookshelf next to the bed with stacks and stacks of picture books. How did you do all this? The wonder in her voice and gaze was worth the time it had taken to arrange everything. He'd called in quite a few favors and hired an assistant to set up the room early this morning. Wait until you see your room, he teased. He sat down Hannah's bags, grabbed her hand and showed her the room next door. He hoped his assistant had gotten the decor right. It's like a spa in here or a fancy hotel room. How did you do all this? He had to admit, impressing her and spoiling her and her daughter a bit was turning out to be even more fun than he'd expected. Billionaire secret, he told her before opening the door to the joint bathroom that connected to her daughter's room. Do you think you'll both be comfortable here? You're kidding, right? This is amazing. She quickly walked over to him and wrapped her arms around his waist. He couldn't breathe. It had been a long time since someone had given him a genuine hug. Wrapping his arms around her, he leaned down to breathe in the scent of her hair. It smelled nice, like the sun and ocean with just a hint of citrus. You're welcome. He murmured the words into her hair. The sound of the doorbell ringing, followed by a series of loud knocks forced him to release her much sooner than he liked. I'll see who this is. Take your time getting settled in. He strode across the living room to the door and opened it with more force than strictly necessary. What? He barked before realizing who was standing in front of him. Aren't you in a mood? His little sister pushed right past him, heading straight for the bedroom he'd just left. Cat's bedroom. Oh, hi, who are you? She asked before he could catch up with her. Sam, this is Cat. He hesitated for just a moment, my fiance. Cat, this is Samantha, my younger sister, who apparently decided to stop in for an unannounced visit. The house doesn't just belong to you. It's a family place. Samantha had no problem putting him in his place. Actually, it is my place. Grandfather left it to me. I can pull out the property deed. Oh, please. Who cares? It's a family place, and I've come here since the year I was born. You're telling me that after all this time, you're giving me a hard time for staying here? He sighed. She was right. He may be the owner on paper, but the place was and had always been a special retreat for him and both of his siblings. Who was he to try to change that? Of course, you can stay. Why don't you take the room out back? He stepped back to let her by before walking back into the bedroom to talk to Kat. I'm sorry. I had no idea she was coming. I hope this doesn't make you regret your decision. He held his breath and mentally crossed his fingers. After all the trouble you went to setting up these rooms? Of course I don't regret it. I look forward to getting to know your sister. It will be nice to know someone other than your mother at the wedding. She sent him a dazzling smile that would have taken his breath away if he wasn't still holding it. I'm glad. I think you'll like her. He thought the two women would become fast friends. Which could present a problem. Pulling off a fake engagement in front of his mother had been easy. Pulling the same thing off with his sister when the three of them were sharing a house would be a completely different story. I'm going to talk to my sister and make sure she has everything she needs. Better to get the conversation about his relationship status out of the way now. He wasn't sure she'd buy it, but it was worth a shot. Engaged, huh? His sister had never been one to beat around the bush. When did that happen? Last week. Mom has met her, but you're the first to hear the big news. He leaned against the door jam, waiting for her reaction. Yeah, right. I've watched you guys for two minutes and there's no way you're engaged. You should at least put a ring on her finger if you plan to pull something like this off. It's all for the wedding and to get mom off your back, right? She knew him too well. 
it had been a long shot. He wasn't surprised that she'd figured it out. He was, however, impressed at her speed. You're right, on all counts. There was nothing to do but come clean. Of course I am. Stop looking so worried. I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag. Maybe there was hope yet. Two hours later, he regretted his decision to let his sister stay and to let her in on the secret. She'd met Hannah and the four of them had gotten to know each other better over lunch. Cat had taken Hannah out to play in the sand, giving him and Samantha a chance to catch up. Catching up apparently involved his sister making fun of him for all the princess stuff in the house. And what in the world is it with this baby shark thing, she asked. He shrugged his shoulders. Hannah had been singing a song about an entire family of sharks all day, and watched a video about it on her mom's phone at least ten different times. He didn't get it either. Hannah thinks I'm a prince and that this is my castle. I figured a princess bed and a few dress-up clothes would make the place feel more like a castle. I would have gotten a pony, but I don't think Kat would have approved. His sister laughed. Man, you've got it bad. She wasn't wrong. The next few days flew by and things went much smoother than he'd hoped or expected. Kat and Samantha seemed to get along and he could tell his sister adored Kat's daughter. Apparently, the feeling was mutual. Hannah had taken to calling her Aunt Sammy and him Uncle Brad. He liked it. What are you going to do about the meanies trying to grab all the cupcakes at the royal feast? He was walking by Hannah's room when his sister's words made him stop. He had to find out where this was going. I'm going to tell them, no sir. His lips twitched at the sound of determination coming from someone so small who wore a pink tutu. That's right. You're a strong, independent princess who can run her own kingdom. You show those bullies who's boss. He heard his sister get up and wasn't quite quick enough to get away. Spying on my duties as royal advisor to Princess Hannah, she asked. Sorry, I walked by and couldn't help overhearing. I'm glad she likes you. You make a good aunt. Don't sound so surprised. I'm going to teach that little girl all about her potential. Just watch, she's going to grow up to do amazing things. He detected quite a bit of affection and pride in his sister's voice. How fake is this whole relationship with Kat? I can tell you like her, and it's pretty obvious she feels the same for you. It's complicated. He couldn't think of anything else to say. It was true. He liked Kat, quite a bit but neither one of them were ready for a real relationship. At least, not yet. He hoped it would change before their time together ran out. She's good for you. She isn't impressed by all the wealth and influence crap. If you can make this work, she'll love you for you, not for what you were born into. He hoped his sister was right. Chapter 13 Are you sure this isn't too much? Kat stood in front of the three-way mirror, turning this way and that to get a good look at the designer sheath dress. It was silver and hugged her curves much tighter than the flowy sundresses she usually wore. Black leather pumps with six-inch heels and a simple but elegant clutch in the same color completed the outfit. It's perfect. Trust me. Brad won't be able to keep his eyes off you. Dress shopping with Samantha was an experience. Kat had never been one to shop with girlfriends, and in the past few years, her wardrobe had mainly consisted of sundresses for summer, jeans, tan slacks, and an assortment of t-shirts. She owned a few nice pairs of dress pants and tops for work, and a few dresses for church on Sunday, but nothing like the outfit Samantha had her try on. She had yet to see a price tag on any of the items, which was concerning. She was surprised how much she liked not just their outing, but spending time with the woman in general. Brad's sister was smart, independent, and fun to be around. It didn't hurt that she was a great role model for Hannah and supportive of Kat's fake engagement to Brad. Seriously, this dress looks amazing on you and it will be perfect for the wedding. Go change so we can grab some lunch. My treat, I'm starving. Kat decided to take a risk on the dress and trust her fake sister-in-law's judgment. 
she had to remind herself that none of this was real and she'd be out of Samantha's and Brad's lives in a few short weeks. It was becoming harder and harder. Staying together at the beach house made it feel like they were a real family. Samantha snatched the dress away from her as soon as Kat stepped out of the dressing room. Before she could blink or voice a protest, Samantha had paid for their entire shopping trip. Don't be ridiculous. You're getting all this stuff for my brother's wedding. Of course, I'm paying for it. Brad would bite my head off if I didn't. Twenty minutes later, they sat on the back deck of Peach Blossom Cafe, digging into the tuna Caesar salads they'd both ordered. The food was amazing. The tuna was fresh and barely seared, it melted in her mouth. Kat checked her phone again to make sure there was no text message from Brad. She hoped he was doing okay with Hannah. This was the first time she'd left the two of them alone, and while their relationship had blossomed over the past few days, being the adult in charge of a preschooler was a whole different ball game. My mother knows about Hannah, right? The question took Kat off guard and she had to think back on her meeting with the formidable Evelyn Sutton. I don't think so. Hannah was staying with her grandparents when we met, and I don't think the topic came up. Samantha shot her a thoughtful look. This is going to be interesting to watch. What do you mean? Kat felt a pit develop in her stomach. I think that's something you should discuss with my brother. Samantha waved the waiter over to request the check. When they returned to the house, the place was a mess. Toys were scattered all over the place, and the living room had been turned into some kind of play fort. From the looks of it, Brad and Hannah had not only moved every single piece of furniture in the room, they'd also draped every blanket and sheet they'd gotten their hands on over said furniture. Kat groaned. It would take hours to get the place back into something remotely resembling order. Don't even think about it, Samantha ordered. Brad made the mess, he can clean it up. Or hire someone to do it for him. The last part was murmured under her breath. You are going to change into that pretty outfit we picked. I'll be right in so we can get an idea of what to do about your hair and makeup. Kat pulled on her dress, touching her hair as she stepped into the living room. Brad and Hannah had done a decent job putting it back together. She looked nervously in his direction. When his eyes roamed over her, they grew larger and his jaw dropped. Apparently, that was a real thing and not just an expression. She stood a little taller and pushed her shoulders back. Maybe Samantha had been right about the dress. Wow, you look stunning. His voice was thick with emotion. Yep, she owed Samantha big time. Her fashion choice had been spot on. You look like a princess, mama. Hannah looked almost as impressed as the hunk of a guy standing next to her. No, she corrected herself. You look like a queen. You've got that right, Brad mumbled under his breath. Come with me. Hannah ran up to her mother and grabbed her hand. We need to find you a crown. As Hannah dragged her down the hallway to her bedroom, Kat overheard Samantha talking to her brother. So, you're starting to regret the fake part of this engagement thing, big brother? She couldn't make out his reply as Hannah dug around in her toy box, another recent acquisition, to look for a crown. Chapter 14 You have no idea. He liked Kat, and this whole fake engagement was starting to become a pain. Too bad he had no one but himself to blame for this mess. His little sister laughed. You look miserable. He shrugged. She was right, and with their brother's wedding day quickly approaching, he'd started to run out of time. He only had a few more days to convince Kat to stay in his life past their arrangement. What are you going to do about it? The look on his sister's face spelled trouble. She was up to something, and he wasn't entirely sure he or Kat would like it. Lucky for Samantha, he was getting desperate. I don't know yet, he admitted. He hated the way that sounded. He was the CEO of Sutton and Sutton Corporation for crying out loud. He always had a plan. He was the kind of guy who stayed ten steps ahead of everyone else. He was the only one in the family who'd been able to beat their father at chess, occasionally. 
He wasn't the kind of guy who would leave something as important as his relationship with Kat up to chance. Yes, he definitely needed a plan. And his baby sister was just the person he wanted by his side to make this particular plan. He looked up and caught the glimmer in Sam's eyes. Spit it out. What are you thinking? The way I see it, Kat likes you. Hannah likes you. It's a start, but the way things stand right now, it's much too easy for the two of them to walk out of your life after Pete and Caroline's wedding. He nodded in agreement. That was the big problem. Sadly, one he didn't have a solution for. You have four days to convince them that going back to their old lives in Charlotte is no longer an option. At least, not an attractive one. You need to show those two how good life with you can be. If you play your cards right, it may just be enough to convince Kat to give you a real shot. Sam had a point. He knew Kat well enough by now to realize that the only reason she'd agreed to this fake engagement was because it wasn't real. It was safe, it didn't require an emotional commitment. It was also what had attracted him in the beginning. She'd started to open up to him a little, and with more time, he was sure he could convince her to give their relationship a shot. His job for the next few days, then, was to convince her to stay and give him the time he needed. Any brilliant ideas, sis? Glad you asked. What you need to do is show Kat and Hannah an amazing time. Show them how fun it is to have you in their lives. Take Kat out on a couple of romantic dates. Plan some fun family outings to bond with Hannah. Want me to make you a list? His sister was clever. All he needed to do was spend as much time as possible with his girls. The shared experiences and memories would bond them together. Of course, the fact that Kat would see exactly what she'd miss after their breakup couldn't hurt either. No need, he finally replied, ideas churning in his head. I've got it covered. Time to get busy and come up with an itinerary. Ten minutes later, he was on the phone with his executive secretary to clear his schedule and enlist her help with the arrangements. He would make sure this was a vacation Kat and Hannah never forgot. On Tuesday, he hired a boat so they could ride out to one of the barrier islands to go shell hunting. To Hannah's delight, they saw a school of dolphins racing alongside the boat on their way back to the harbor. The little girl was exhausted by the time they got back to the house. While Kat gave Hannah a bath and put her to bed, he had steak and lobster delivered from his favorite restaurant on the Strand. With Sam's help, he set a table for two out on the screened-in porch. She's finally asleep. Kat smiled at him as she walked into the kitchen to join him and his sister. Something smells amazing. She looked at Sam. Wasn't me. I'm heading out on a date. You two have fun tonight. She winked, grabbed her purse, and was out the door before Brad could say a word. Must be some hot date, Kat mused. What was she talking about? About us having fun I mean. He cleared his throat. You'll see, it's a surprise. He grabbed her hand, enjoying the warmth that flowed into him from their contact. His heart pounded, and he held his breath as he let her out onto the screened-in porch. He turned around when he heard Kat gasp. He could see the surprise in her large green eyes. You did this, she whispered. When he nodded, her entire face lit up with joy. I had some help, he admitted. As he walked her over to the table and pulled the chair out for her, he mused that wooing Kat might just turn out to be the most fun challenge he'd tackled in a while. He couldn't wait to see her reaction to everything else he'd planned. He poured each of them a glass of Yves Clickwatt champagne. The steak was cooked to perfection, and the lobster was buttery and tender with just the right hint of sweetness. He wasn't sure where the chef had flown it in from, but the end result was well worth whatever it took to share this meal with the stunning redhead in front of him. Brad loved that she enjoyed the meal as much as he had, and that she wasn't shy about digging into the large lobster tail. How about a nightcap? There's just enough champagne left, and it would be a shame to waste it. He poured them each a small glass and walked out on the back deck. Kat followed him out there, looking even more beautiful in the moonlight. He swallowed hard and grabbed her hand. Little shocks of electricity traveled all the way up his arm. 
he pulled her next to him on the bench overlooking the ocean. Kat snuggled close and took a small sip of her champagne. This is nice, she said. I could get used to this. Brad liked the sound of that. His gaze wandered from the serene beach scene in front of him, illuminated beautifully by the full moon, to Kat. The red of her hair was muted by the low light, and the breeze coming off the ocean ruffled her locks. Her hair gently brushed his neck and shoulders as it moved in the wind. The rolling waves created the perfect soundtrack for their romantic evening. He felt her move before he found himself staring into her beautiful emerald eyes. Neither one of them could look away, a hitch caught her breath. His own heart made a fair attempt to beat out of his chest. He couldn't remember the last time he'd felt like this. He leaned in, his eyes still locked with hers, ready to brush his lips across hers. He wondered if they would feel as lush and velvety soft as they looked. Mommy? Little feet padded across the wooden floor of the screened-in porch before he heard the squeak of the hinge of the old screen door. Kat jerked away from him at the sound, shaking her head as if to clear it. She rose and turned to hug her daughter. What's wrong, honey bunch? Did you have a bad dream? He saw Hannah nod her head. Her hair looked damp and was plastered all across her head. She clung close to her mother. Let's get you back to bed, and you can tell me all about it. Kat started to pick her daughter up, but the little girl shook her head and pushed away from her mother. I want Uncle Brad to carry me, she exclaimed, her lower lip sticking out. Kat looked over at him and mouthed, sorry. He smiled at her before picking up Hannah, carrying her back to bed. Tell me about your dream, he encouraged. Kat walked ahead of them to turn down the blanket. Between the two of them, the young girl calmed down in a few minutes. Kat read her a book about a caterpillar eating one thing after the other. He vaguely remembered the story and the colorful images from his own childhood. Before they'd made it to the day when the little caterpillar ate a bunch of junk food, Hannah was sound asleep. Brad watched Kat tuck the covers around the little girl. His chest tightened, and he had the sudden urge to hug both of them tightly. Before he could act on it, thereby waking Hannah back up, he walked back on the porch to pour them each another glass of wine. I think I've had enough. He hadn't realized Kat had followed him until she spoke. It's getting late, and Hannah will be up at the crack of dawn. He nodded. Their romantic evening had come to an abrupt end. I was thinking we could take Hannah horseback riding on the beach tomorrow. She would love that. Kat's own eyes lit up at the suggestion. The outing the next morning was a big success. He'd arranged for a private ride down a remote stretch of beach. Hannah was in love with her little pony and Kat looked like it wasn't her first ride. I took lessons for a while when I was a teen, she admitted when he asked her about it. She had a wistful look in her eyes. I didn't realize how much I missed being around horses until now. Brad filed that little bit of info about Kat away for later. If things worked out the way he hoped, he'd start work on a stable at his home in Phoenix. There wasn't enough room here at the beach, and he wouldn't be able to stay away from Sutton and Sutton much longer. He wondered how Kat would feel about moving to Arizona with him. He hoped she wouldn't be opposed to the idea, but it was much too early to bring that up. The wooing continued that night. He'd arranged for Miss Doris to babysit Hannah and had big plans for dinner. How are the new renters? Kat asked when they dropped Hannah off. Miss Doris mumbled something about nice folks before taking Hannah into the kitchen to make cookies. Brad put his hand on her lower back and suggested they get going. He needed to distract her before she figured out the little white lie he and Miss Doris shared. Of course, Kat didn't let it go as easy as that. They were seated at the new seafood place, overlooking the inlet. There are no new renters, are there? Her tone was casual, and she didn't look up from the menu. No he was smart enough to realize she'd called his bluff. Kat finally looked up from her menu. He let out the breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding when he saw the little smile playing around her lips and the twinkle in her eye. Was it your idea or Miss Doris's? It was mine. Miss Doris was kind enough to play along. He cleared his throat. 
I thought it would look better to have the two of you staying at my house. Since we are supposed to be engaged. Kat shot him a look, he couldn't quite make out. Speaking of being engaged. A waiter walked up to their table. Are you ready to order? They placed their order, Kat chose the blackened tuna with Carolina gold rice and steamed vegetables, and he went for the steak and shrimp with a loaded baked potato. His stomach growled at the mere thought of the food. Kat laughed. You were getting ready to say something before we ordered, her words trailed off. It can wait. He wasn't about to ruin a perfectly good dinner by bringing up a ring. The fact that he had no idea how Kat would react to the small black box in his jacket pocket had nothing to do with it. This tuna is amazing. Kat enjoyed her dinner, despite having been reluctant to leave Hannah with Miss Doris. Brad was glad he'd talked her into going out to dinner with him. He'd have to get her out more often. His steak was cooked to perfection and the shrimp made a nice addition. He only ordered seafood when he came down to the beach. It just wasn't the same back in Phoenix, no matter how fresh the chefs assured him it was. Seafood needed to be eaten close to the sea, preferably close enough that you could taste the salt in the air. By the time they were sipping a cup of coffee to finish their meal, he knew he couldn't put it off any longer. Both had ordered decaf, wanting an excuse to linger a little longer at the restaurant, but not willing to risk a sleepless night from the late caffeine. Hannah would be ready to start the day at seven, no matter what. The thought made him smile. The little girl had wormed her way into his heart, right along with her mother. His hand reached for the box in his pocket. Suddenly, it hit him how much he wished this were a real proposal. He'd come to care for Kat and her daughter. No, it was much more than that. He loved them. The realization hit him hard. He had to take a deep breath to steady himself. This wasn't the time or place to ponder that particular predicament. Not with Kat looking at him expectantly, her green eyes sparkling with anticipation. He hoped that what he was about to do wouldn't ruin the evening, or worse. Chapter 15 I don't know what to do. Kat looked at the large engagement ring. It was beautiful, but still felt strange on her finger. The diamond sparkled in the early morning light filtering through the window of her bedroom. It was a beautiful three-stone band. Each of the smaller stones were quite a bit larger than the single diamond of her first engagement ring. She couldn't even begin to guess how many carats the center stone was. She hoped the stones weren't real, but knowing Brad, they were and her ring was worth a fortune. And that was the least of her worries. After a sleepless night, she'd called her mother, pouring her heart out. She was so torn and confused after the romantic dinner and the not-so-romantic proposal last night. Brad had pulled out the little black jewelry box and asked if she'd wear the ring to keep up appearances of their fake engagement. I like him and so does Hannah. I think it's a little more than that, isn't it honey? Her mother knew her too well. Yes, she whispered the reply into the phone. Taking a steadying breath and doing her best to ignore the big rock on her finger, she continued. I thought there was something more. But after last night, it's pretty clear this is just an arrangement for him. We're going to play the happy couple at his brother's wedding and that's that. Taking me out to dinner and coming up with all these fun outings for Hannah is just part of the ruse. I guess he's trying to make us comfortable and get used to acting like a couple. I think you should give Brad a little more credit. That's a lot of trouble to go through if all he's worried about is having a date for the wedding. From what you've told me, he sounds like a good guy and someone who's genuinely interested in you. Don't shut him out. I'm so happy to finally see you open up to someone. Your dad and I just want you to be happy. Give it a chance and see where it leads. Her mother had a point. Her heart was already involved, and Hannah would be disappointed and hurt if Brad walked out of their lives next week. The damage was done. All she could do now was hope and pray things would somehow work out. Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. While she wasn't looking forward to more heartache, at least she knew she would survive. She and Hannah had a loving home back with her parents, no matter what happened with Brad. Before I forget, you got a letter about your student loan. I accidentally opened it. 
How did you manage to get that paid off so quickly? I thought you still owed quite a bit. She did. Between the loan she'd taken out before becoming pregnant with Hannah and what they still owed the hospital after Kevin's accident, she could barely make minimum payments. It had been the main reason she'd given up their Charlotte apartment and moved back in with her parents. There must be a mistake. I still owe over 25000 At least Kevin's student loans had died with him. With no life insurance and no savings, it had been the only bit of good news she received in the months after his death. Let me get off the phone and look into it. Tell Daddy I love him. Hannah misses you both. We'll see you soon. She called the student loan company and the nice lady from billing confirmed that her debt had in fact been paid off. We received a payment in full on March 28. Kat asked her to double check and then hung up, more confused than ever. There had to be some mistake. On a hunch, she called the hospital to check on the balance of her loan there. It was zero as well. This couldn't be a coincidence. Brad, she walked out on the porch where Brad was sitting, coffee cup in hand. It was a beautiful morning. The beach was quiet, aside from a few early morning joggers and the ever-present seagulls and sandpipers. He looked up at her from the deck chair. I made a couple of interesting phone calls this morning, Kat said. My student loan debt is paid off and somehow the money I owed the hospital from Kevin's accident is taken care of as well. You wouldn't know anything about that, would you? Brad cleared his throat. He looked uncomfortable and a bit embarrassed, red crept up into his cheeks and ears. He moved the coffee cup from one hand to the other before putting it down on the deck next to his chair. He stood and finally looked right at her. I did. Let me explain. His hands went out towards her. Okay. His reaction puzzled her. She couldn't figure him out. Yes, she was doing him a favor, playing his fiancé at his brother's wedding this weekend. That didn't explain his actions or his reaction right now. She felt more confused than ever. I'm listening. My lawyers did a background check when I asked them to draw up the paperwork for our fake engagement. They brought the student loan and hospital debt to my attention. I figured raising Hannah is a hard enough job as it is. I didn't want you to have to work for years to clear the debt as well. I wanted you both to have options. He shrugged his shoulders, looking more helpless and vulnerable than she'd ever seen him. Maybe there was more to this than a fake relationship after all. I appreciate the sentiment, but I'm not comfortable with you taking care of all my debt. She sidestepped him and walked over to the rail of the porch. Turning around, she leaned back against it and crossed her arms. In hindsight, I should have told you, no I should have offered, or at least asked you before. Yes, you should have. She had to make him understand that he couldn't waltz in and take control of her life. He'd done so by tricking her into moving in with him and now, by taking care of her debt. I still don't understand why you did it. He looked uncomfortable, but she wasn't ready to let him off the hook. I've come to care for the two of you, more than I realized I would when we started this fake relationship. I didn't want you to have to worry about it anymore. It wasn't a big deal. It's a big deal to me. She wasn't ready to drop this. If I promise not to pay off any more of your debt without asking you first, can we take Hannah to Fun Kingdom? I'll let you buy me a funnel cake. He winked at her. This guy was just too much. He couldn't pay off any more debt. She didn't have any other loans. After Kevin's death, she couldn't even qualify for a car loan or a new credit card. The realization hit her. She did have options now. Thank you. I'll find a way to pay you back, and it won't just be in funnel cakes. He nodded before walking into the house, leaving her to ponder her future out on the deck. I can't remember the last time I've had this much fun. Kat tried to catch her breath as they stepped out on the outdoor patio of the old pirates. Brad looked as fresh as a daisy after a few hours of dancing. Her hair and makeup were probably a hot mess after all that two-stepping and twirling. You're a great dancer. Don't sound so surprised. 
my mama made sure my brother and I could dance, before we were in our teens. She said it would help with the girls. He winked and sat down in one of the patio chairs. Sitting sounded like a great idea. Her feet were killing her. She slipped out of her cream-colored leather pumps, wiggling her toes to encourage a bit of blood to circulate. She wished she could rub some of the soreness away, but her mother had raised her better than that. Taking her shoes off in public, even if it was in the dark and under a table, was bad enough. She smiled at the thought of what her mother would say. What's so funny? Brad was observant today. They had grown close in a few short weeks, but she was not ready to admit what the smile was about. Remembering the mess you and Hannah made with those funnel cakes this afternoon. I had no idea you could cover so much ground with a little powdered sugar. She'd bought them each a sugary treat at the amusement park while waiting for them to get back from riding bumper cars. They'd both been wound up from the ride, laughing when she'd handed them a warm funnel cake topped with plenty of powdered sugar. The laughter made some of the sugar blow off, which encouraged them to blow even more of it at each other. By the time it was all said and done, they'd both looked a little ghost-like and were of course sticky as all get out. It had taken quite a while to wash all the sugar out of Hannah's hair, and Brad spent longer than usual in the shower when they returned to the beach house. She had no idea what he'd done to get the interior of his car cleaned up before their date. How did you get all that sugar cleaned out of the car so fast, she asked, curious, once the thought crossed her mind. The car dealership detailed it for me. Brad looked confused at the question. Listen. Before she could finish, his head moved. He'd zeroed in on a woman in high heels and a dark coat swiftly walking toward the bar. She looked vaguely familiar, but Kat couldn't place her. Someone you know, she asked. Before Brad could respond, she saw the woman pull something from her coat pocket. Kat jumped out of her chair. Brad stood as well, pulling her behind him. In the next instant, the woman on the street was tackled. A man dressed in dark slacks and a black long sleeve shirt had come from out of nowhere, subduing the woman in seconds. A second man, dressed in a similar nondescript outfit, approached their table. Mr. Sutton, we have her contained. Local law enforcement is en route. Would you like to press charges, or should I get you and Miss Marlowe out of here? Kat couldn't believe what she was hearing. These were Brad's people? And they were, what? His security detail? Bodyguards? We'll stay around. I want to have a word with the police officers before we leave. He turned around and looked at Kat. If you don't mind. Kat was too stunned to confront him about what just happened. She simply nodded and sat back down before her legs gave way from under her. Her hands shook, she tightly grasped them in her lap before taking a few steadying breaths. You're safe, Brad assured her. He turned around to speak to the bar manager who had stepped out on the patio after being alerted to the commotion outside. Brad ordered her a soda and insisted she take a drink when it arrived. You're in shock. The sugar will help. Who was that? Was she really pointing a gun at you? Kat couldn't keep the tremor out of her voice. Brad sat back down next to her and grabbed her hand before answering. It was Jennifer Doyle. Yes, that was a gun in her hand, and I think she was pointing it at you, not me. He took a deep breath before continuing. I don't know how you feel about a security detail, Kat, but given that you almost got shot tonight, would you please reconsider? His voice was thick with emotion. He was pale, and his eyes looked haunted. I'll think about it. He nodded and gave her hand a squeeze before letting it go and turning his head away from her. I don't think I could ever forgive myself if anything happened to you or Hannah. I brought Jennifer into your life. Stop it. This was not your fault. Jennifer has some serious issues. I hope she gets the help she needs. But you have to understand. This is not your fault. Kat paused to take a steadying breath before continuing. Just like it wasn't my fault that Kevin died in a car accident after storming out of the house during an argument. It took me a long time to realize that, and I'm just now starting to let go of the guilt. 
nothing happened tonight. Thankfully. And you shouldn't feel responsible for her behavior. It's on her, not on you. You amaze me. Every single day. Let's go home and check on Hannah. Then, I'm going to call my lawyers and make sure Jennifer can't get anywhere near us without some serious consequences. She looked at him expectantly. And I'm going to get her the help she needs, he added. Chapter 16 Brad hung up the phone, took a deep breath and walked back into the kitchen. Was it about Jennifer? Kat asked. The call had interrupted breakfast. Kat and Hannah sat at the large rectangular kitchen table that had been in his family as long as anyone could remember. He was pretty sure it was the table his grandparents moved into the house when construction was finished back in 1952. He had no idea if it was bought for the house or came from somewhere else. It looked old and sturdy and perfect, despite the scratches on the surface and worn corners. Seeing Hannah sitting in the matching old chair, a stack of phone books and one of the volumes of his grandfather's leather-bound encyclopedia boosting her up to the table, reminded him of the summers he'd spent here with his grandparents. His grandpa used to pour him a bowl of cereal, before they headed out to the inlet to go shrimp fishing. He looked at Kat and nodded. That was Charles. He talked to the chief of police. Jennifer has been admitted to the mental health clinic for evaluation. I hope she gets the help she needs. Kat sounded concerned for the young woman. She was a more forgiving person than he was. The thought of what could have happened to Kat gave him nightmares. If it were up to him, he'd have a 24-hour security detail on both her and her daughter. Unfortunately, Kat had made it very clear that she did not want or need bodyguards following her. He hoped she would be as forgiving with him when she found out he'd still had a PI watching out for her. When do we leave for Charleston? Kat asked. He stared out over the ocean, lost in thought as he contemplated what needed to be done to keep the two girls safe from any other harm that might come their way. He poured himself a bowl of cereal and sat down to eat with them. Pete has the whole plantation rented out for the weekend. We can head down there as soon as you're packed up and ready to go. Might be nice to get down there a little early. We can relax for a bit and get the lay of the land before everyone else shows up. Kat nodded in agreement. Give me an hour, and we'll be ready to go. That was quicker than he'd expected. The women in his life, his mother and sister, took quite a bit longer to get ready for a weekend trip. He wouldn't be surprised if his mother had started packing a week ago. Not that she'd do any of the actual work. She had staff for that. He smiled at the thought of Kat dealing with a houseful of employees ready at her beck and call. That would not end well. He watched her get up to clear the table and wash the dishes. He joined her to dry them off. Another memory of his childhood played across his mind. I used to do dishes with my grandmother when I was young. She taught all three of us to cook and clean and gave us chores around the house when we came down here for the summer. You didn't have chores at home? Kat handed him one of the bowls she'd washed and raised one of her eyebrows. Oh no, we grew up with a housekeeper, a cook, a gardener, and several maids to take care of all that. Grandma was appalled when she found out none of us knew how to sweep or do the dishes. She had a sorting laundry, making beds, and frying eggs all summer. Good thing she did too. I would have been lost at college if she hadn't taught me the basics right here in this house. You miss them? Every day. The sprawling grounds, surrounded by a white wooden fence, were beautiful. The magnolias were in bloom and ancient live oaks full of Spanish moss lined the drive up to the impressive two-story plantation house. With its large white columns, wide wraparound porch, and ornate staircase, it was built to impress. It wasn't hard to picture the days of the antebellum South in this setting. His brother had chosen a stunning setting for his wedding, to Caroline. Brad was surprised how fast and hard his brother had fallen for the pretty brunette. Watching the devastation in Pete's face when he thought he'd lost her for good had been hard. He remembered the months of deep depression his brother lived through when he lost his high school sweetheart, Chris, to cancer. He was happy Pete had been able to track down Caroline and work things out after their mother's meddling. 
The two had begun planning for their wedding almost immediately. A thorough background check on his future sister-in-law, and a talk with both her and her family, assured him that Pete had chosen well. He was looking forward to the ceremony and celebration. The happy couple greeted them on the front porch and escorted the three of them into a sitting room for ice-cold lemonade and finger sandwiches. I was wondering if I could ask you a big favor. Caroline had crouched down to be at eye level with Hannah. I've always wanted a flower girl in my wedding. I know we've just met, but I was hoping you'd be willing to be my flower girl. If it's okay with your mom. Caroline looked up at Kat, who smiled at the look on Hannah's face. Mama? It's fine with me, if you want to do it. Why don't you ask Caroline what you would do as the flower girl? Hannah turned around and looked expectantly at Caroline and Pete. Pete sat down on the floor next to his bride. It's really easy. The flower girl walks in front of the bride and scatters flower petals from a basket. It's a pretty important job. You walk all the way up to me and the preacher, and then go to sit with your mom. You get to wear a pretty dress and some flowers in your hair. He leaned in and whispered, I'll make sure you get the dress and the flowers either way, but we'd love to have you as our flower girl. What do you think? Wanna do it? Caroline smiled at the young girl. Hannah looked thoughtful for a moment and then nodded. I'll be your flower girl. Brad bit back a smile at the seriousness in her expression. He glanced over at Kat, whose lips twitched with mirth twinkling in her eyes. Brad wasn't a big fan of formal events, but the rehearsal and dinner had gone off without a hitch. After a practice run-through of the ceremony, they'd retreated to the large dining room for an early dinner. The food had been a variety of low-country favorites including fried green tomatoes and shrimp and grits along with his family's usual fare of oysters, caviar, and plenty of champagne. Having Kat and Hannah by his side throughout the afternoon and evening had made the entire affair much more bearable. He'd enjoyed watching them take in their surroundings and sampling the dishes prepared by Charleston's best chefs. For the first time in as long as he could remember, he'd made it through the evening without feeling the need to catch up on email or call into the office to see how things were going. Come to think of it, he hadn't done much work in the past two weeks. The realization felt strange. Work had always defined him. It's what he did. It's what his father had expected of him and groomed him for. He was Sutton and Sutton Corporation. Yet, things seemed to move along without his constant presence and supervision. Deals were done and contracts were signed. It was strange to not work his usual 80-hour work week. Brad? A small hand pulled on the sleeve of his suit jacket. He looked down at Hannah. Yes, honey? Is it time for dessert yet? He couldn't suppress a small laugh at the expectant expression on the four-year-old's face. She'd been eyeing the large dessert display from the moment it had been brought in halfway through the main course. Hannah had been ready to ditch her plate of chicken strips and macaroni and cheese at the side of the table laden with pies, brownies, cookies, and an entire ice cream sundae bar. It was a child's dream come true. Yes, Hannah. It's definitely time for dessert. He took her hand and walked over to the dessert bar. Pete eyed his little brother across the stack of dessert plates. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yep, this calls for bigger plates. I'll go get them. The two of them had started grabbing dinner plates at dessert buffets when their nanny had limited them to one plate of desserts each whenever they accompanied their parents to events, or a catered party was hosted at one of their estates. Their father had loved the outside of the box thinking and instructed the nanny to let them get away with it. He couldn't remember the last time he'd piled desserts onto a dinner plate. These days, he usually skipped the sweets, opting for a cup of coffee instead before returning to the office. He'd been missing out, on so much more than a plate piled high with dessert. If the past few weeks with Kat had taught him anything, it was that there was more to life than the office and the company's bottom line. He walked back to the table with Hannah, ready to defend her dessert choices the way his own father had. Life was too short and too precious to skip or limit dessert. Can I talk to you for a minute? He knew by the tone of his mother's voice that this wasn't going to be a pleasant conversation, or one he cared to have. 
One look into her determined eyes also told him that this wasn't something he could avoid. Of course, mother. Why don't we talk in the library? He offered her his arm and escorted her down the hallway. The room was his kind of place. With its dark mahogany furniture and floor-to-ceiling shelves lining the two long walls, it reminded him of his father's office. The smell was similar. A mix of old leather, dust, and aging paper that shouldn't be pleasant, but to him it was the smell of home. Your father would have loved this room. His mother echoed his own thoughts. She walked over to a set of wide leather chairs, grouped around a low, round wooden table with slate and wood inlays depicting the globe. It was a stunning piece of craftsmanship. He would have to look into acquiring something similar for his Phoenix office. She sat down in one of the chairs, crossing her ankles, before gesturing for him to take the seat across from her. He walked over, unbuttoned his jacket, and sat down. He wasn't sure if this was a conversation he wanted to have, but there was no way around it. Better to get it over with and deal with whatever fallout it would bring. At least with Kat as his date for the wedding, he was fairly certain his mother wouldn't try to set him up on another blind date. Kat is, pretty, his mother started. So, that was where this was going. His mother didn't deem his choice of girlfriend good enough. She seems like a good person, and I have to admit, the two of you make a cute couple. That was a strange comment from his mother. She didn't compliment unless she wanted something. You seem, happy. She looked at him, a small smile, playing around her lips. She leaned over and took his hand in both of hers. But have you thought this through, son? He pulled his hands out of hers and took a deep breath before replying. Kat comes from a good family. She has a degree, a career. Are you telling me you don't think she's good enough for me? Because you are wrong. Kat is exactly who I need, and I can't believe you are giving me grief about her social standing. What, you think she'll embarrass me? Embarrass you, the family, the company at some function? As the anger rose, he had to loosen his tie and open his collar. Never mind that. She isn't as polished and educated as I would have liked, and let's be honest, managing the office and running payroll for a small construction company isn't exactly a career. His mother must have ordered a full background check on Kat. It shouldn't surprise him. It made him wonder what she dug up on Kat that would make her drag him into this conversation. Despite his anger, he was curious. What's your problem with her then? Does she have some skeletons in her closet? Some middle-class associations you don't approve of? Her background check came up clean. The incident with her husband was tragic. She has a lot of debt, but I don't think she's targeting you for your money. My sources didn't find anything to indicate she'd searched you out. Well, good to know she's not a gold digger. He knew the sarcasm jerked off his lips, but he couldn't care less. Since I'm sure you'll get a report on this shortly, I might as well tell you. Her hospital debt is taken care of. As are her outstanding student loans. Good. I didn't expect less from you, and this young woman deserves a break. His mother leaned back in her chair and smiled. The shoe was about to drop. The reason I don't approve of you dating Catherine Marlowe has nothing to do with her. While I would prefer you choose a bride from our own circles, I am not opposed to the right match from the middle class. What I will not tolerate is someone else's child in this family. He was too stunned to respond. This was about Hannah? I see how you act around the girl. You already treat her like a daughter. I assume the plan is to adopt her and make her a Sutton? That, I simply can't and won't accept. Do you realize how ridiculous you sound? Brad couldn't contain his anger. He got up, pacing around the library, ready to explode. It's not ridiculous at all, son. If you bring another man's child into this family, I simply don't think you'll be fit to run the company. Rest assured, I have the full support of the board in this matter. Sutton & Sutton Corporation is a family company. I promised your father it would stay that way, and I intend on keeping that promise. Her voice was calm and steady. 
She rose from her chair and walked out of the room, leaving him to ponder his decision. He would have to choose between the company his father had built for him and his siblings and the woman he loved and her daughter. Running Sutton and Sutton was his life. It's what he'd been groomed for as long as he could remember. His earliest memories were of sitting in his father's lap in his office. Who was he without the CEO title? What would he do with his life if not run the family corporation? Was he ready to walk away from it? That was the real question, he realized. Was he ready and willing to give it all up for Kat and Hannah? To his surprise, the choice was an easy one to make. He'd been happier in the past few weeks than he'd been in a long time. He'd found more purpose and joy in planning their daily outings than he had in the biggest, most challenging real estate deals of the past decade. He'd miss the thrill of the negotiation and the challenge of running a large business, but he was excited to see what else he could do now that he had a choice. He chose Kat and Hannah and whatever life the three of them would build together. If Kat would have him. Chapter 17 Kat walked into the large sitting room with Hannah at her side. She was grateful Caroline included her and her daughter in the wedding activities and was happy to help the beautiful bride get ready for her big day. She nodded and smiled at Evelyn who responded in kind, though the older woman's smile did not seem to reach her eyes. Aunt Sam Hannah spotted Brad's sister across the room and raced into the woman's arms. Hannah, stop. You'll mess up Sam's dress. And your own. Kat hurried to catch up to her daughter. Hannah squealed in delight when Sam picked her up and spun her around. Kat shook her head before being caught up in a hug of her own by Caroline. Come sit and have a mimosa. It's helping me steady my nerves while everyone fusses about my hair and dress. Kat liked Caroline. She was down to earth and had welcomed her and Hannah with open arms. Thanks again for asking Hannah to be the flower girl. She is so excited. My pleasure. She's adorable and I'm sure she'll do a great job. Kat wasn't so sure about that but decided to hope for the best. Don't worry about Evelyn, Caroline said. She'll come around. Caroline had worked for Evelyn Sutton as a personal assistant for almost a year before getting engaged to Evelyn's youngest son, Pete. The older woman busied herself straightening out the wedding dress and veil while Kat chatted with Caroline. Sam and Hannah were thick as thieves, as usual. Kat still couldn't believe how attached Hannah had become to the young woman in the few days they'd spent together at Brad's beach house. Unlike Evelyn and Caroline, Sam knew the engagement was fake but she treated both of them like good friends, no, she treated them like family. Kat sighed at the thought. This would make it even harder to leave in a few days. Who knew when they'd see Sam again? She squared her shoulders, nodded her head, and decided right then and there to make the best of it. Self-pity had never been her style. She'd enjoy the company of her newfound friends and whatever time she had with Brad and would figure the rest out when this chapter of her life came to an end. It may be a short chapter, but it was an exciting one. One she would remember for the rest of her life. How often did you get to hang out with a family of billionaires and the perks it provided, like having an entire public plantation to yourself? I'm sorry. What did you say? Warmth crept into Kat's cheek. Nothing important. I was wondering how Hannah liked the ocean. I remember being terrified of it when I was about her age. Caroline smiled at her while Patty, an eccentric hairdresser and makeup artist who had flown in from LA, was busy piling her hair in an artful messy bun. Hold still and stop jabbering, Patty admonished. Yes, ma'am, Caroline replied in a soft whisper. She grinned and winked at Kat who couldn't help returning a smirk. She was sure they would have broken out in giggles if Patty didn't stare them down through the large vanity mirror. She loves it, Kat said, picking back up on their conversation. She's out there as much as I let her and can pretty much swim on her own. No fear of the water at all. I have nightmares of her sneaking out of the house to go swimming by herself. I'm sure Brad could install a security system to make sure she can't sneak out. Kat looked down at her shoes. He had one installed last week. You can't open a window without the security company being alerted. Smart man. 
she put her hand over Kat's. He's a good guy. Evelyn approached from across the room, and Kat forced herself to smile. Evelyn returned it with a polite one of her own before addressing Caroline. I'm sorry, dear. I have some urgent business to take care of. You understand. I'm sure I'm leaving you in good hands. She started towards the door. Turning back she said, You are a beautiful bride. You'll take my son's breath away. This time the smile reached her eyes. Kat saw it, for, just a split second, before Evelyn walked away. Samantha walked over to the women, a grin playing across her face. That's my mother for you. I'm sure she has some meddling to do somewhere. She's probably off to schmooze Mr. Springfield. That's the big real estate deal in Phoenix, the company is trying to close, right? Caroline looked up at Sam, earning her another admonishment from Patty. That's the one. Too bad Mr. Springfield is happily married. I wouldn't put it past mother to remarry for the good of the company. Sam rolled her eyes and the three of them burst into laughter. Patty was the only one not amused. I think it's time for another glass of champagne. It'll calm your nerves, Caroline, Sam said before heading to the mini fridge built into the wet bar at the backside of the suite. She poured each of them a glass and then filled a fifth one with orange juice. Hannah, would you like to toast with us? Sam asked. Kat shot her daughter a worried glance. The glasses were thin and delicate. Please be careful, Peanut. Don't drop the pretty glass, okay, she said, ready to jump up and help her daughter. Relax, we've got this. Here, take a glass. You're as jittery as the bride. Sam insisted each of them, including Patty, take a glass. She toasted her future sister-in-law, took a sip, and went to set the glass down to take a group selfie. She missed the small side table and the champagne flute crashed to the floor, shattering. Wasn't me. Hannah piped up, making everyone laugh. Within minutes, Patty and Sam had the broken glass cleaned up. Thankfully, none of the champagne had spilled on Sam's bridesmaid dress. Time to put on your gown, Patty said a few minutes later after putting the finishing touches on Caroline's hair and makeup. She ushered her into the adjoining bedroom. Caroline looked beautiful in a simple but elegant gown with cap sleeves, empire waist, and delicate lace. The hem of the dress skimmed the floor, giving the illusion that Caroline was floating. Let's attach your veil and you'll be good to go. Patty took her arm and guided her back to the chair in front of the antique dressing table to add a simple gossamer lace veil that reached down to her waist attached to a pair of silver combs. It's perfect, Caroline breathed. She rose to cross the room. I want to see what it looks like in the tall mirror in the bedroom. They watched her twist from side to side, smiling as she took in her appearance. Caroline's unbridled joy was contagious. She walked back into the room, stumbled slightly, and everyone in the room heard the sound of fabric ripping. Kat's heart skipped a beat or two. No one moved. Caroline looked devastated as she carefully lifted the foot that had stepped on the hem of her dress. A good ten inches of it had torn open, exposing a ragged raw edge of fabric. Kat saw the tears well up in Caroline's eyes and jumped into action. Rushing to her, she gave her a gentle hug and reassured her, we can fix this. It's a small tear. I have an emergency sewing kit in my purse. You are a lifesaver, Caroline looked down at Kat who started to thread a needle and got to work repairing the damage. I'm so glad Brad met you. He seems so different when he's with you. Happier and more grounded. I haven't spent a lot of time with him lately, but the change is obvious. Pete noticed it too. He can't believe how much his brother has changed. She smirked and added, he really can't believe how little Brad's been working and that he hasn't been back to the office in Phoenix in weeks. He's usually such a workaholic. Kat didn't know what to say. She took one meticulous stitch after the other. Her heart skipped a little and she felt butterflies in her stomach at the thought of Brad putting his life on hold because of her. It also made her feel guilty. His job was important to him. The company was a big part of his life and his family's life. 
She'd have to think about that and probably talk to Brad about it too. But now wasn't the time. It took Kat only a few minutes to stitch the hem back together. The fix wasn't completely invisible, but unless you knew of the mishap, you wouldn't notice it. The dress and the bride were just as stunning as before. Good as new, Sam exclaimed. I wouldn't be surprised if Pete faints when he sees you. You look stunning, Kat agreed. Caroline engulfed her in a big hug. Thank you. I don't know what I would have done, she choked on the words. It was my pleasure. Now, let's get you downstairs. It's time. She turned to her daughter. Hannah, are you ready to be the flower girl? Pick up your basket and let's go. Kat walked the length of the ballroom, taking her seat off to the side near the front. The music started and she watched Hannah walk along the aisle throwing handfuls of white rose petals on the ground. Caroline followed close behind, her eyes on Pete who waited for her, Brad's best man by his side. They stood next to the preacher, just a few feet from Kat's seat. She watched Brad bend over and whisper something in Hannah's ear, before pointing her into her mother's direction. Hannah skipped over and took the seat next to her, still clutching her basket, now empty of flower petals. Great job, Peanut. Kat smiled proudly at the little flower girl. I'm wondering, what did Brad whisper to you just now? That I look as pretty as Caroline, Hannah beamed. And almost as pretty as you. Kat could feel the heat rising in her cheeks. She had to avoid the urge to look up at Brad. If she did, she'd turn as red as a tomato. Instead, she focused on her daughter and the feeling of the little girl's hand in her own. The ceremony was short but beautiful. The Methodist preacher spoke of the sacred bond between husband and wife, and then Pete and Caroline exchanged their vows. Kat tried to keep her eyes on the couple, but they kept shifting over to the handsome man in the tux just behind Pete. During the vows, he shifted slightly and locked eyes with her. For better or for worse. In sickness and in health. Until death parts us. Could this be her and Brad one day? The idea was startling. She'd never even considered remarrying, but now she could see herself in a beautiful white dress, exchanging vows with Brad in front of family and friends. Even though the thought scared her, she couldn't get the picture of standing up there next to Brad out of her head. Hannah's hand pulling on hers brought her back to the here and now. Mommy, is Pete going to kiss Caroline now? Yes, in just a minute. Brad had warned Hannah that the service could get boring, but when the groom kissed the bride it was almost over. The ceremony had been lovely and anything but boring to Kat, however her daughter was more than ready to move on to the rest of the festivities. Her eyes returned to Brad who smiled back at the two of them. By the twinkling in his eyes, she was pretty sure he knew what this conversation had been about. Pete kissed his bride. It was a long, slow kiss that only ended after the preacher coughed softly. Caroline looked dazed and even happier than earlier. She was a beautiful, blushing bride. Brad kissed the bride, hugged his brother, and then strolled over to Kat and Hannah to escort them down the hall, to the wedding reception. You were without a doubt the prettiest flower girl. Hannah giggled. I was the only flower girl. You didn't let me finish. You were the prettiest flower girl I've ever seen, Brad said with sincerity before picking her up and twirling her around. Half an hour later, he was twirling Kat around as they danced to the Strauss waltz played by the string quartet. She couldn't remember the last time she had so much fun. Brad was an excellent dancer. They waltzed around the dance floor and all she could see was his face. All she could feel were his hands. One wrapped securely around hers, the other pressing on the small of her back to guide her as they moved across the floor. She could feel the warmth of his hand on her back. It spread up her spine, engulfing her. The waltz ended and Brad pulled her closer for a slow dance. She moved her hand to his chest to steady herself. He felt solid and warm under her palm. Her heart raced as much from the excitement of being so close to him as from the fast waltz they danced. His cheek came close to hers as he lowered his head and pulled her even closer. She felt his breath on her ear. Unlike her own, 
it was slow and steady. She started to calm as they gently swayed on the dance floor. She couldn't remember feeling so cherished and safe. Resting her head on his broad shoulder, she lost herself in this perfect moment. The dance ended much too soon. Slightly dazed, she lifted her head. He put one finger under her chin, coaxing her to look up at him. His voice was rough when he said, how about a little fresh air? I think I need it. All she could do was nod and let him lead her out to the patio, down the steps, and into the privacy of the small hedged garden. It was dark out, only the moon illuminated the path as they quietly walked hand in hand deeper into the privacy of the garden. The air was thick with the scent of jasmine, small pebbles crunched under their feet as they walked up to a wooden bench tucked under a large live oak, covered in Spanish moss. The garden was magical, like something out of a fairy tale. It seemed unreal and out of this world in the pale silver light of the moon. Cat. She turned to face him, surprised by the roughness of his voice. He raised his hand, cupping her face, before lowering his lips, to hers. Cat's eyes were glued to his when she felt his breath and realized she'd been holding hers. Her lips parted and she sucked in a little air before his lips claimed hers. It wasn't a tentative, gentle kiss. There was no brushing of lips, no small retreat to allow her to end it before it really started. His lips were firm, his hand holding her close to him, and Kat lost herself in the sensation. Her arms grabbed his shoulders, and she pressed her body against his in an attempt to get even closer. She'd wanted this. No, she'd needed this. There were no barriers between them now. There were no doubts. He wanted her as much as she wanted him and that was all that mattered. Chapter 18 Standing under that large oak tree, with the moonlight playing across Kat's coppery locks, she was breathtaking. Holding her in his arms as they moved across the dance floor had felt natural. It's where she belonged. He needed her to look at him, needed to see if she felt for him the way he felt for her. They'd been dancing around the subject for weeks. It was time to put his cards on the table. Cat, he found himself at a loss for words. What did you say to the woman who means the world to you? She turned and raised her eyes. Their gazes locked, and he hoped he was reading her right. She was here, with him, looking at him with those beautiful green eyes sparkling in the pale light. He saw excitement in them, trust, and something else. He hesitated for just a moment, waiting for someone to come walking in the garden or call for them from the patio. Every time he'd tried to kiss this woman they'd been interrupted. Was this his chance? He lowered his head slowly, giving her time to realize what he was about to do and a chance to step away and stop him. She didn't. When his lips touched hers, all rational thought fled his mind. He wanted her. He kissed her hard and thorough, not holding back. He wanted her with every fiber of his being. She tasted like summer. Like fresh berries, with just a hint of saltiness. He lost himself in the scent of her hair and the taste of her lips. Her hands wrapped around his shoulders and then his neck. He could feel her soft body pressed against his as he deepened the kiss, eliciting a small moan from her. He could feel it as much as hear it and was surprised how much that one little sound from her affected him. He knew he should end the kiss. Someone else would seek the garden for a breath of fresh air sooner or later, and getting caught sneaking a kiss like a lovesick teenager wasn't what he had in mind for tonight. This was his brother's wedding. If his mother found him and cat out here, he'd never hear the end of it. That thought did the trick. He gently pulled away, pressing a few gentle kisses on her bright red, swollen lips. He couldn't suppress the smile that crept up at the thought. She looked a bit dazed as she raised one hand to her lips. That was. Yes. It was. I've waited a long time to finally kiss you Catherine Marlowe. Let's do it again sometime. He winked at her before pecking her on the cheek and grabbing her hand to lead her back to the house and the wedding reception. What he really wanted to do was pull her deeper into the garden for another kiss. It was tempting but they were both needed at the party. He'd get a chance to kiss her again later. He held on to that thought as he opened the door to the reception room for her. I should go check on Hannah. 
Make sure she's okay. Her voice sounded a little shaky, her eyes scanning the room and avoiding his. He squeezed her hand and gave her a reassuring smile when she looked up at him. Don't take too long. I want another dance. He bent down and whispered, so I can hold you in my arms again. He brushed a gentle kiss on her cheek before letting her go. Kat's emerald eyes lit up before she turned and walked off in search of her daughter. Brad was surprised to see Mr. Springfield walk his way. He didn't expect to see him at a family function. The man was the founder and CEO of the largest transport and distribution company in the Southwest, and more importantly, the owner of a large farm on the outskirts of Phoenix. The land had been in the family for generations. Sutton & Sutton was in the process of acquiring it as part of a new multipurpose development. The project would fall through if they couldn't close on the property within the next few weeks. Which explained why his mother had invited Mr. Springfield to her youngest son's wedding. Before he could do so much as extend his hand to the man, his mother swooped in, champagne glass in hand. She put her free hand on his arm before addressing the older gentleman. Mr. Springfield, how are you and your wife enjoying the low country? Without giving the poor man a chance to answer, she turned to Brad. I thought this would make a nice getaway for the Springfields. I got them set up in the cutest B&B here in town, right by the battery. She turned to Mr. Springfield. I hope everything is to your liking. If it isn't, please let me know. I can have alternate arrangements made. Perhaps a few nights on Kiowa Island? Do you golf? She scanned the room, no doubt looking for Timothy, her new personal assistant. No need. The place is very nice, and Mrs. Springfield is enjoying Charleston. It was very kind of you to invite us, Mrs. Sutton. Brad took pity on the man and suggested they retire to the library to discuss business. His mother beamed before striding off, her next conversation target in sight. Brad shook his head before leading the way to the library. He wasn't keen on discussing business, but both he and Mr. Springfield could use a bit of a break from the wedding festivities. If nothing else, it would get his mother out of his hair for the rest of the day. Bourbon? Yes. Neat please. Mr. Springfield lowered himself into one of the wide leather chairs with a sigh and accepted the glass of amber liquid with a small smile. They sat in companionable silence enjoying their drinks until the door burst open. Hannah ran in, eyes sparkling as they danced across the room, searching for something. The braids in her hair were coming apart, tendrils of red locks framing her face. He couldn't help but smile at the sight of her free spirit and joy. She quickly stepped up to him and asked him to help her hide. It seemed she was playing a game of hide-and-seek with his sister. Please excuse me for a moment. I need to help this young lady find a good hiding spot. Mr. Springfield nodded. Get under the desk back there and be very, very quiet, Brad said after a quick look around. She scampered off, her skirt rustling. A bit of white silk poked out from under the desk. Pull your skirt in, he whispered, before returning his attention to Mr. Springfield, who watched with apparent amusement. Less than a minute later, his sister Sam stepped into the room. I'm sorry for the interruption. I'm looking for Hannah. Brad grinned and winked at his little sister. Haven't seen her, he said while motioning to the desk with his head. Okay, thanks. I'll have a quick look around just in case she snuck in before you got here. Sam walked across the room, pretending to look behind chairs and bookcases until they heard soft giggles. Sam crouched behind the desk and praised Hannah on the excellent hiding spot. Brad helped, the little girl admitted. She ran up to him for a quick hug before leaving the room with Sam. There was no telling what kind of mischief those two would get into next. Mr. Sutton, you have a deal. I'll have my people finish the paperwork. We can sign on Monday. Brad was stunned. The Springfields had dragged their feet about the sale of their family farm for months. Call me Brad, he replied before the two men shook on the deal. I have to ask. Why the change of heart? I'm pretty sure you came here tonight to tell me we had no deal. You've changed, son. 
you've turned into the kind of man I like to do business with. A family man. And you're right. I accepted your mother's invitation to tell you in person that the deal was off. I've been watching you today, and you're not the same person you were a few months ago, back in Phoenix. You've turned into a man your father and grandfather would be proud of. Mr. Springfield leaned back and looked at the wide row of shelves filled from top to bottom of books. We met at Yale, your father and I. In the library, in fact. We were two of the few people who didn't come for money. We weren't expected to take over the family fortune. We both came from middle-class families and were there on academic scholarships. Yale back then was quite snobbish. I guess it still is. He laughed quietly. We helped each other through those years, eventually becoming roommates. We even talked about going into business together for a while. That didn't happen as planned, but we each did well, I think. Mr. Springfield looked lost in memories of years past as he sat there, sipping bourbon and recalling his early years in business. Our business venture fell through before it ever got started. I ended up working in my uncle's trucking company, eventually taking it over when he retired. Brad scraped together the capital for his first development deal and never looked back. I don't think he made a single bad investment. By the time he met Evelyn, he'd made quite the name for himself in the business community. He turned his head back to Brad, looking apologetic. I didn't think she was good for him, but he was taken by her and her family. For a little while, they were happy. Then, your mother started trying to change him. She wanted him to attend all the social functions, spend weekends at the country club, trips to New York and southern France instead of Palmer Island. Your grandparents weren't too thrilled. But that's neither here nor there. It is what it is. I'm glad you're not repeating your father's mistake by burying yourself in work. I was a bit worried about you there for a while. Mr. Springfield finished his drink, rose, and gave him a pat on the shoulder before walking out of the room. Brad stayed put. He needed a moment to digest what the older man had said. He leaned back in the chair and tried to come to terms with the idea of being a family man. Someone who could become a father figure for Hannah and a husband to Kat. The idea felt overwhelming. Could he step up and be the man they needed him to be? A family was a big responsibility. He didn't want the kind of marriage his parents had. He wanted the deep love and devotion he'd observed between his grandparents. Was he ready for that? Chapter 19 Kat picked up her silver clutch and headed to the powder room down the hall. The blister on the back of her foot made walking in heels painful. She closed the door behind herself and pulled off her shoe. It was worse than she'd thought. The blister had burst and she was left with a raw spot on the back of her heel that had started to bleed. No wonder walking and dancing hurt. She wished she could spend the rest of the evening in her favorite pair of flip-flops or even go barefoot. Sadly, this wasn't the type of event where you could get away with that. She was pretty sure even her pair of travel-ready ballerina flats wouldn't make the cut. Not that she brought them. They wouldn't have fit into the small clutch she carried. Kat rummaged through said clutch, looking for a band-aid. She smiled when she pulled out a pack of bright pink ones featuring colorful little ponies. Hopefully, it wouldn't stick too far out of her shoe. Not that she had a choice. She would have to risk the band-aid peeking out. Thankfully, it did the job. It cushioned her heel enough to make walking in the uncomfortable, but undeniably sexy high heel, pumps bearable. She threw the wrapper in the trash, washed her hands, and freshened up her lipstick before heading back to the party. She was walking along the hallway leading to the ballroom when she heard a familiar voice in one of the adjoining rooms. The door was partially open, a small group of people stood around, champagne glasses in hand, their backs to her. Playing the family man was a brilliant move on my son's part. It's exactly what was needed to close the deal. I knew we could count on the boy. The sound of laughter and clinking glasses wafted out of the room. Cat couldn't move. Evelyn Sutton had just announced to a group of strangers that Brad had used her and her daughter to close a major real estate deal. Was that what this fake engagement had really been about? 
Obviously his mother knew about the ruse. Judging by the pride in her voice, she was probably the one who had come up with it. Kat was such a fool. Pretending to need a fiancé so his mother would stop setting him up on blind dates had been a big fat lie. Her eyes burned and she had a hard time breathing. She slowly turned to walk back the way she had come, tears collecting in her eyes. She felt betrayed, used, and furious. The tears ran down her cheek. At least she'd been smart enough to use waterproof mascara. She wiped them away furiously. How dare anyone use her in this way? She had to think. She had to get out of here. Cap picked up speed, stalking down the hallway, further into the interior of the old plantation house. Turning a corner, she bumped into a solid form. A soft hand reached up to steady her. Oh my. I didn't see you there. Are you all right? She had run into an older woman with gray hair and kind brown eyes. Your cat, Brad's fiancé. I'm Mrs. Springfield, the woman continued. Cat nodded, unsure about what to do. She didn't think she could speak. At least the encounter had startled her out of her initial rage and desperation. Clearing her throat, she said, I'm fine, thank you, and started to continue walking down the hall, desperately looking for a hiding place where she could compose herself. No, you're not. The woman put an arm around her and led her into a small sitting room. She sat down on one of the sofas and patted the seat next to her. Kat sat and noticed that the woman wasn't alone. An older gentleman she recognized as Mr. Springfield sat in the chair across from them. Mrs. Springfield pulled a tissue from her purse and handed it to Kat. She wiped the tears from her eyes and blew her nose, thankful for the older woman's kindness. Now tell me what happened. It can't be all that bad. Mrs. Springfield patted her arm and Kat couldn't help herself. The whole story of deceit and betrayal spilled out of her. How Brad had used her to make himself out to be a family man, how it had all been a ruse and a lie and she'd been stupid enough to think that there could be something more between the two of them. How disappointed and hurt Hannah would be. The words kept tumbling out as the Springfield sat and listened. I don't think things are as bleak as they seem right now, honey. I've seen you with Bradley, and unless I'm very much mistaken, that young man is head over heels in love with you. Mrs. Springfield gave her another reassuring pat on the arm. I thought so. Until I overheard Mrs. Sutton. Oh, never mind her. I've known Evelyn Sutton for over thirty years. Her bark is worse than her bite, and she's been wrong on more than one occasion. Especially when it comes to her family. Mrs. Springfield seemed unperturbed. Mr. Springfield cleared his throat. I met Brad's father before he married her. We always got along. He was a good guy. Worked too much and didn't do too well in the spouse department if you ask me. Martin. You know it's true. Bradley Sutton wasn't happy. They married for the wrong reasons, and he ended up burying himself in work so he didn't have to go home. And then I watched Bradley Jr. do the same thing after his father passed away. Mr. Springfield looked first at his wife, then back at Kat before continuing, he's different since he's met you. He looks happier and more relaxed than I've seen him in years. Don't look so doubtful, Miss Marlowe. How often has he flown back to the home office since you've met? He hasn't, Kat admitted. Did you know that he has a private jet waiting at the Myrtle Beach airport? Kat shook her head. He'd never mentioned a plane or much about the corporation he was leading. Aside from the occasional email or phone call, she hadn't seen him work at all. If that doesn't prove he cares for you, I don't know what does, Mrs. Springfield exclaimed. My thoughts exactly, Mr. Springfield echoed. You're good for him. I'd hate to see the boy work himself to death the way his father did. Never mind Evelyn. Like my wife said, she's all bark but no bite. Kat felt herself calm as she sat with the Springfields. The couple had brought up some good points, and it made her see Brad in a new light. These past few weeks he hadn't seemed like the busy businessman. He'd been happy to drop everything to race down to Charleston with her when Hannah got sick. 
since then, he'd made time for them and even opened his house to the two of them, even though she had a sneaking suspicion that had been arranged so he could spend more time with her. Which wasn't a bad thing. She took a deep breath to steady herself. She needed to talk with Brad, and more importantly, she needed to check on Hannah. Let's get you cleaned up, Mrs. Springfield suggested. A splash of cold water and a touch of concealer did the trick. Within minutes, Kat was back in the ballroom, ready to join the party. She spotted Brad from across the room. He smiled and started to make his way over to her. Thank God, you're here. Sam sounded frantic. I can't find Hannah anywhere. I was getting her a glass of lemonade and when I got back she was gone. I've looked everywhere. No one has seen her. Kat saw the panic welled up inside her, reflected in Sam's eyes. She had to think. What's wrong? Brad put a reassuring hand on her arm, looking first at her, then his sister. Hannah is missing. We have to find her. I've searched the downstairs. I only left her for a minute to get her that drink. I should have taken her with me. She was sitting back there, watching everyone dance, Sam broke off, tears welling up in her eyes. She was sitting by the French doors? Kat asked. The river, Brad followed her train of thought without skipping a beat. The water would be the biggest danger, and Hannah had been drawn to it for days. Would she be as attracted to the river as the ocean? There was only one way to find out. We'll search the rest of the house, Pete offered, Caroline on his arm. Kat hadn't noticed the couple walk up behind Brad. Mr. and Mrs. Springfield offered to help with the search as well. Thank you, she replied before grabbing Brad's hand and making her way to the French doors at the side of the room. Sam followed behind, panic in her eyes. We'll find her. Brad reassured them as he opened the door and stepped outside. Despite her worry, Kat realized how nice it was not to be alone in this. She drew strength from Brad's presence as he led the way down to the dock by the river. There they are, he exclaimed, relief thick in his voice. A moment later, Kat could see Hannah and Evelyn sitting on the dock, the moonlight illuminating the figures of the older woman and her four-year-old daughter. Their feet dangled over the water. Two sets of shoes, one, a pair of black heels, and one, a pair of small white sandals, were neatly placed behind them on the dock. Brad looked at her and raised a finger to his lips, before Kat could call out to her daughter. I never go out in the water alone, she could hear Evelyn say. I always use the buddy system. It's the smart thing to do. What if I get tired or scared or hurt? Without a buddy, who would pull me out? Kat could see her daughter nod seriously. That's smart. Promise me you won't go down to the water without a buddy. Someone big and strong, like your mother, who can protect you. Or Brad. Or Brad. Or Sam. Sure, Samantha is a strong swimmer. Did you know, never mind. Do you know what a pinky promise is? Another nod from Hannah. It's a promise that can't be broken. No matter what. That's right. Will you pinky promise not to go down to the water, here or at the ocean, or anywhere without your mom or Brad or Sam? Evelyn asked. Yes. Pinky promise. Hannah held out her hand and the two of them locked their smallest fingers together. There you two are, Brad walked up to the dock addressing his mother and Hannah. We've been looking for you Hannah Bear. Kat couldn't move as relief flooded through her. Hannah was safe. Evelyn, of all people, Evelyn had looked out for her daughter. The sweet exchange she'd overheard between the two seemed so out of character. There was a whole different side to Brad's mother Kat hadn't seen. Hannah jumped up and hugged Brad before running to Kat and Sam. The three of them walked down to the dock. Evelyn held on to her son's shoulder while carefully stepping into her black patent leather pumps. Kat hoped the trip down here hadn't ruined the expensive Italian shoes. Thank you, Mrs. Sutton. Call me Evelyn. It was nothing. Hannah is a bright little girl. I quite like her. Brad looked as astonished as she felt. 
She looked at him and raised her eyebrow once his mother started walking up to the house with Sam. I'll tell you later, he said before picking up Hannah. She grabbed the sandals, and the three of them left the dock to rejoin the wedding party. Chapter 20 I'm so glad you decided to join us. I need a stunning outfit for a golf tournament in Hilton Head next month. Mom's going to try to steer me towards something formal and I'll pass out in the heat. Late June down here gets pretty darn not. Sam chatted away, pulling out one dress after the other before discarding it at the high-end Charleston boutique. Evelyn had given up on trying to pick outfits for her daughter and retired with a glass of Cremont to the plush sitting area at Marie Antoinette's that took up a large area near the expansive dressing rooms. How did you convince my big brother to babysit today? Sam pulled out a salmon-colored sundress and quickly put it back. Brad and Hannah made plans to go visit the zoo before you invited me along. She's been dying to see the baby goats and sheep. Kat spotted a simple linen jumper and held it up. How about something like this? You could totally dress that up with some jewelry and a cute pair of wedges. Love it. Sam put it over her arm and headed off to the dressing room. Kat continued to browse. She hadn't planned on buying anything. One look at the price tag of a simple shift dress had ruled that out. She was killing time while keeping Sam and Evelyn company. It was kind of the women to invite her along, but Kat felt a bit out of her element in a high-end establishment like this. Evelyn walked up behind her, picking up the dress she'd discarded. This is nice. Why don't you go try it on, dear? I don't really need a new dress. Kat smiled and walked a little further down the row, her hand skimming over the luxurious fabrics. What does that have to do with anything? Evelyn sounded exasperated. Kat turned to face her. If I'm perfectly honest, I don't think I'll have an occasion to wear anything from this store anytime soon. Your son's wedding was the only formal event I've been to in years, and I don't see any in my future. She hoped Evelyn would drop it. The conversation made her uncomfortable. Nonsense. You'll be accompanying Brad to all sorts of functions. As a representative of the Sutton family, I need you to look the part. What my mother is trying to say is that you'll have plenty of occasions to wear these types of outfits and that she'd like to buy you a couple so you can dazzle all her friends and acquaintances on behalf of Sutton and Sutton. Sam had stepped out of the dressing room looking adorable in the linen jumper. It accentuated her long, shapely legs and the v-neck added interest to an otherwise simple summer outfit. Sam, don't be so direct, Evelyn said quickly before scanning the back wall of the boutique. She stalked over to the display of a stunning dark burgundy and black gown. Waving the boutique owner over, Evelyn requested the dress in cat's size. Wow. You got to try it on, Sam said. I'm not comfortable having your mother buy me a dress. Don't. We have more money than we know what to do with. Get the dress and live a little. Sam smiled at her encouragingly. It was a beautiful gown. Trying it on wouldn't hurt anything. She grabbed the dress and walked over to the dressing room the store owner directed her to. You have to get it. It's perfect. Sam was right. The dress was a dream. It fit perfectly and hugged her curves in just the right places. Kat twisted from side to side in front of the tall three-paned mirror that showed her the dress from all sides. Sam is right. It's stunning on you. Please let me buy it for you. Evelyn stepped up behind Kat for a better look. Brad will love it. Sam winked at her. Kat felt the warmth rising in her cheeks. Let me think about it. She quickly stepped into the dressing room and changed back into her summer dress. By the time she returned, Sam and Evelyn were looking through a selection of semi-formal dresses. Our parking is about to run out. I'm going to walk up and feed the meter to give us a bit more time. Have we really been here that long? Sam looked astonished. Time flies when you're having fun. Kat smiled. I told you we should have used a driver. I don't know why you insist on driving yourself. Evelyn shook her head. Because I like to drive, Mom. You should try it. 
most people don't rely on a limo and a driver to get around. The two women stood in the middle of the boutique staring at each other. I'll be right back. It won't take a minute. Cat rushed off before either of them could respond. Cat rushed up the busy street, making it just in time. Thankfully the meter still had a few seconds left before it ran out. She opened her purse and dug around for some coins to extend the time. Made it just in the nick of time, and here I thought I might actually get to write a ticket today. Cat jumped back, almost dropping her purse in the process. I'm sorry, miss. I wasn't trying to startle you. An older gentleman in a police officer's uniform stepped up and steadied her. Cat laughed. She'd been so absorbed in her thoughts about dresses and the functions she'd be expected to attend at Brad's side if things worked out that she hadn't noticed the officer approaching. Don't worry about it. It was my fault. Yes, I was cutting it close. I'm usually better at keeping track of time. Dress shopping, she shrugged her shoulders and sent him an apologetic smile. He nodded and continued walking down the sidewalk to check the next set of meters. Cat added enough coins to extend the parking time for another two hours. That should give them enough time to finish shopping and grab lunch at the bistro across the street. Cat? Is that you? Cat turned in the direction of the voice and saw Dave walking across the street toward her. Ruth's husband was the last person she'd expected. And after her run-in with her husband's cousin at the party, she'd hoped to avoid the couple for the foreseeable future. What are you doing in Charleston? I figured you and Hannah would be back in Charlotte by now. Hannah and I are staying at Magnolia House for a few days. Brad's brother got married there yesterday. Brad, right. Didn't take you long to move on from Kevin, did it? Can't say I'm surprised. What's that supposed to mean? Kat felt the anger rise in her chest. I can't believe you are out there having fun, shacking up with random guys. I bet Kevin would have loved to go out and meet some friends for a beer. You're a widow, cat, and a mother. Start acting like one. He widened his stance and stared her down. Kat took a deep breath, trying to calm herself. Before she could come up with a response, he continued. Is Hannah going to start calling this guy, what's his name? Brad. Is she going to call him daddy? I'm sure Kevin would love that. The poor little girl. This has gotta be confusing. And what are you going to do when you drive this guy away? Kat had as much as she could take. She had to get away before she did something stupid to put Dave in his place. It was bad enough they had brought this all up at a family function, but attacking her on the street like this? Honestly, it's none of your business what Hannah and I do. She turned on her heel and stalked off into the direction of the boutique with as much confidence as she could muster. By the time she stepped into the store, she was shaking. It was all she could do to grab the handle of the door and push her way in. Sam and Evelyn took one look at her and rushed over. What happened? Nothing. I ran into someone from Kevin's side of the family and had to rush back. Give me a minute to catch my breath. I'm fine. Evelyn waved the store owner over. I'm sure you're fine, Kat. Ah, uh, Marie. Could you have our purchases delivered to Magnolia House this afternoon? We're heading to lunch. She handed the startled owner a black credit card, and within a couple of minutes, they were ready to leave. You need a drink. Evelyn looked like she wouldn't take no for an answer. She glanced over the menu and ordered three glasses of Pinot Grigio as soon as the waiter stepped up. They were at a table in the bistro's outdoor seating area. By the time the waiter returned with three glasses of chilled wine, they were ready to order. Evelyn chose the grilled tuna Caesar salad without croutons and dressing on the side after the waiter had assured her the dressing was made fresh, in-house. Sam rolled her eyes during the exchange. Kat ordered the crab cakes with a side salad. Sam declared she was starving and requested a cheeseburger, medium rare with a side of sweet potato fries. Kat almost laughed when she noticed how hard Evelyn was trying to keep a comment about her daughter's diet from slipping out. 
She was pretty sure Sam placed the order just to rile up her mother. She shook her head at the antics between the two women. At least it had distracted her from her earlier encounter, but not for long. What happened when you went to the car? You ran into someone you knew? Sam barely waited for the waiter to leave their table before inquiring. By the time their food arrived, the two women had coaxed the entire story out of her, including the encounter at the birthday party a few weeks ago. That's just ridiculous. Who would do that? Sam's eyebrows furrowed and her face was getting red. Wait until Brad hears about this. He's not going to hear it from you. Her mother gave her a stern look across the table. Her features softened when she turned to look at Kat. Did your husband love you? she asked. Kat sat there stunned. The question surprised her. Yes, Kevin had been angry the night he stormed out. But they had loved each other. Evelyn and Sam sipped their wine, neither saying a word. They were giving her time to think, she realized. She took a few minutes to think back on her relationship with her late husband. Like any couple, they'd had their ups and downs, but at the end of the day, there was no doubt in her mind that he had loved her as much as she'd loved him. Part of her still did. Yes, he loved me. Kevin loved me and the baby we were expecting more than anything else in the world. Then I think he would want you to be happy. Both of you. Evelyn looked down at the salad that had arrived a few moments ago and eyed the ceramic container that contained the dressing suspiciously. You've been happy these last few weeks? She looked up at Kat. Yes, happier than I've been in a while. Then that's all that matters, isn't it? Evelyn picked up her fork and speared a slice of rare tuna and a few leaves of romaine lettuce and tasted it. This salad is very good. Fresh tuna and the dressing tastes like they actually made it in-house. I wonder if they cater events. Kat took a bite of her crab cakes. They were light, flaky, and bursting with crab meat. No wonder Evelyn wanted to hire them. And she was right about Kevin. He had loved her and looked forward to raising their child. Would he want her to move on? She considered what she would want him to do if their roles had been reversed. She would want him to find happiness and love. She would want Hannah to have a mother figure to do all those little things she wouldn't be able to do for her daughter if it had been her in the car that night. Maybe it was that simple. But maybe it wasn't. She would want Hannah to remember her and to remember her as her mother. A mother who loved her more than anything in the world. Hannah hadn't been born when Kevin died. She had no actual memories of her father. Kat had done her best to keep pictures of him around, and the two of them talked about him a lot. She wondered if that would change over time if things were to become serious with Brad. Stop overthinking this. Sam threw a sweet potato fry in Kat's direction, earning her another scowl from her mother. A seagull swept down and flew off with it. You're right. This wasn't the time and place for this type of deep contemplation. She and Brad had a good thing going. Only time would tell if they could make it work. She promised herself to be better at keeping Kevin's memory alive than she had these past few weeks. He would always be a big part of her daughter's life, but that didn't mean there wasn't room in both their hearts for someone else. Suddenly, she couldn't wait to get back to the old plantation house and find out what Brad and Hannah had been up to all day. Brad had texted her a few hours ago that they were heading to the zoo. A picture of Hannah holding one of the baby goats had come in a little while later, but that had been it. She wondered how the rest of their morning had gone. Chapter 21 Uncle Brad, can we go now? Hannah tugged at his arm while he threw a juice box and some goldfish crackers into a bag, along with a water bottle and a small tube of sunscreen. As soon as you get your hat we can. He had to bite his lip to hold back the laugh when her little face scrunched up in a scowl. At the rate this was going, he'd stop being her favorite before the day was done. This parenting thing was a little trickier than he'd thought. Putting sunscreen on a squirming four-year-old was not for the faint of heart. I don't want to wear that hat. You're not wearing one, so I don't need one either. There. She stood in front of him, legs a foot apart, hands on her hips, giving him a stern look. 
In her tank top and skirt, she looked like a mini version of Wonder Woman throwing a power pose. He had to look down and pretend to dig around in the bag to hide his mirth. Tell you what. We both wear hats. I forgot to bring mine. Let's stop by the gift shop and pick one up. I'll wear mine, you wear yours, deal? Only if we match. She wasn't giving in that easily. Thankfully, Brad knew how to compromise when brokering a deal. We'll buy two matching ones. Let's go. Fifteen minutes later, they both donned brand new Magnolia House baseball caps and were on their way to meet one of the animal caretakers at the barn. While the main part of the house and most of the grounds would be open to the public today, he'd arranged for a private tour of the parts of the zoo usually closed to the public, including the barn and small pasture where the newborn goats and sheep with their mothers were kept. They met Matt, a young zookeeping apprentice outside the barn. He gave them a tour of the stalls inside and invited Hannah to help Bottle feed one of the goats. She did a great job holding the bottle and spent a good ten minutes snuggling the sleepy baby goat after. He snapped a quick picture and sent it to Kat. From the sounds of it, she was having a good time dress shopping with his mother and sister. What's next? Hannah asked after Matt put the young goat back into her pen. Do you and Brad want to feed the mama sheep? Matt asked. Hannah nodded, then turned around to Brad. Can we? Please? How could he resist when she was using her big, green puppy eyes? He laughed and agreed. Matt handed them a ten-gallon bucket of feed and a cup to scoop it with. He instructed them on how many scoops should be added to the troughs in each stall. They spent the next twenty minutes feeding the sheep. Hannah carefully counted out loud as she poured eight cups of feed per Matt's instruction. As Brad watched, he realized how attached he'd grown to the little girl. Pride grew in his chest as he saw her interact with the docile animals, being careful not to disturb the young lambs. One precocious lamb snuck up behind Hannah and headbutt her in the back of the leg, making her giggle. He liked the sound of that. Children hadn't been something he'd thought about much until he'd met Kat and Hannah. Sure, he'd been open to the idea of having his own offspring, but it had always been an abstract notion, something far off in the future. Watching Hannah made him think about how much she would enjoy having a younger sibling or two. If things worked out with Kat and the two of them got married, it would be a definite possibility. He liked the thought of that. Hannah played with the lamb and petted soft fur, giving Brad time to contemplate proposing to Kat in earnest. Would she want to marry and share her own life, and Hannah's, with him? They'd made a great team these past few weeks, and she trusted him to look after her daughter. Was she ready to build a future together? Move with him to Phoenix? There was only one way to find out. They needed to talk and he needed to show her how serious he was. The first thing he would do was get a real engagement ring. Not the one she was wearing now as a ruse. He would propose an earnest, with a new ring, custom designed for her. He knew just who to call. Brad, come feel how soft her nose is. Hannah pulled him over to the baby lamb. He put thoughts of engagements and commitments out of his mind and crouched down to do as instructed. Why don't we let the baby sheep take a nap, and you can both help me gather the eggs from the chicken coop, Matt suggested. Brad hadn't heard him walk back into this corner of the barn. Good idea. What do you think, Hannah Bear? Do I get to look for them, she asked. Of course. The hens do a good job hiding them. Do you want to help me find them? Hannah nodded enthusiastically. They walked across the courtyard to the chicken enclosure. The coop was a small wooden building held off the ground by a series of cement blocks. There were about fifteen chickens and a large rooster with a bright red comb and mean-looking spurs. Wait here while I put away Oscar, Matt said. Brad was grateful. He wouldn't be comfortable bringing Hannah in the coop with Oscar on the loose. Not letting her hunt for eggs on the other hand, would have resulted in a meltdown. He had gotten pretty good at anticipating the young girl's reactions. Matt opened the door to the chicken enclosure and handed Brad a wire basket before showing Hannah where to look for eggs. It didn't take them long to fill the basket with half a dozen eggs. 
Hannah spotted one last egg and crouched down to pick it up when a hen ran up and pecked her hand. Her eyes grew wide and he could see tears collecting in the corners of them. It was the jellyfish incident all over again. Earlier in the week, he'd been playing in the surf with Hannah, while Kat sat in the sand close by reading a book. A jellyfish had brushed against their legs. Hannah had been startled at first, and then the crying had started. He'd stood in the surf, a wailing child in his arms. Kat had rushed up to comfort her daughter. She'd quieted down, and they'd treated the burn with vinegar. It wasn't until Kat loosely wrapped it with a bandage that Hannah had stopped crying. He handed the basket of eggs to Matt and crouched down to pick Hannah up. It's okay. The hen was protecting her egg. Maybe she thought there was a chicken there. He held her close, speaking in a soothing voice, the way Kat had done. She's mean to me. Hannah was on the verge of crying. He stepped out of the coop and sat down on a hay bale in front of the barn with her. Let me see. He gently took her hand and examined the spot where the hen had pecked her. It was a little red, but the skin wasn't broken. Matt walked up next to them. I'll go, get the first aid kit. When Matt returned, Brad used an alcohol wipe to clean the spot before adding a bit of neosporin and topping it with a sturdy brown band-aid. Does that feel better? he asked. Hannah nodded. She'd been quiet during his ministrations. She turned her hand this way and that. All better, she finally declared. That's good. How about a snack before we help Matt with the rest of his chores, he suggested. He got the backpack he'd left in the barn and handed her a juice box and a pack of goldfish crackers before opening a water bottle for himself. Want some? Hannah held her bag of crackers out to him. He picked up a few of the fish-shaped crackers and looked at them dubiously before popping them into his mouth. They were crunchy and salty with just a bit of cheese flavor. They weren't bad. He wasn't really hungry, but caught himself grabbing more until the two of them had polished off the bag. They each washed the crackers down with the last of their drinks. Let's put a little more sunscreen on our noses so we don't get sunburned. Okay but not too much, and I get to rub it in myself. I'm a big girl, you know. The snack and brief rest had helped. Hannah was back to her old self. Before long, he was chasing her all around the outside of the barn. Turning a corner, he almost ran over her. He stopped just in time, but the momentum carried both of them forward, right into a big pile of dung. You. It's stinky and warm. So gross. Her little nose scrunched up as she shuddered. It was gross. They were both covered from head to toe in manure. When he'd contemplated parenthood earlier, this wasn't exactly what he had in mind. They both climbed up and stood to examine the extent of the damage. Hannah rubbed on her tank top to no avail. Brad wasn't entirely sure what to do. After a moment of panic, he started thinking. This was a problem and he was good at solving them. He spotted a water pump close to the barn. The water would probably be cold, but it would get the worst of the gunk off both of them. Let's go rinse off the kiddo, he said, walking her over to the pump. Twenty minutes later, they were both shivering, dripping wet from the cold water, but mostly clean. A kind plantation employee had run up to the house and returned with a stack of large towels. He toweled Hannah off and wrapped her into another dry towel before quickly drying off as best he could. He picked Hannah up and headed up to the house to shower and change. Are you sure you're okay in there by yourself? He asked a few minutes later. The door to the bathroom was cracked. He'd left Hannah in there with yet another stack of towels and a clean outfit after she'd assured him she could take a shower all by herself. He'd tip housekeeping generously for their help with the towels and their soiled clothes. I'm almost done. He didn't feel comfortable with the situation, but what was he supposed to do with Kat and Sam gone and Hannah covered in gunk? Had parenting really sounded like a great idea a few hours ago? He laughed at himself. While the end of their zoo excursion hadn't been the most pleasant, it had been memorable. He doubted either of them would ever forget the experience. Hopefully by the time Kat made it home, they would both be showered and clean. 
Chapter 22 Brad woke up to the sound of his cell phone ringing. It took him a moment to get his bearings. He was in his bedroom on Palmer Island. He, Kat, and Hannah had driven up from Charleston late the night before after a final dinner with his family at Magnolia House. He answered his phone. Have you been reading any of my emails? Will Braxton, his VP of development, sounded irritated. Not since, he couldn't remember when he'd last logged onto his laptop. He'd skimmed through messages on his phone, but nothing had seemed urgent or in need of his attention. Something must have fallen through the cracks. Never mind. Here's the deal. We're not having any luck with the planning commission. They won't issue the permits we need to break ground, and now some little environmental non-profit is trying to get an injunction because of nesting patterns of some migratory bird. I thought we'd handled all that before we signed the deal on the land. Brad had worked out most of the details himself before his trip to the beach. There should be no permit issues. Something had gone wrong somewhere along the way. We did. But you're the point man with the council and the planning commission. With you missing in action, they figured they could get away with their little delay tactics. The accusation wasn't completely unfounded. He was the one with the connections to government officials all across Arizona. He was the one to hear about any issues with permits or environmental concerns long before they became official. Since he'd been out of the loop for over a month while hanging out on Palmer Island with Kat and Hannah, their biggest real estate project had started to go south. And he'd missed it. Sorry, I wasn't there to deal with it before it became a problem. I'll take care of it. Thanks, man. It's been rough without you here. Will wasn't one to complain. Things must be worse than he'd let on. Brad hung up the phone and opened his laptop. He checked his email as well as the project workflow board. He could tell at a glance that the permit issue was causing a serious bottleneck that would derail most of the work they'd lined up for the next few months. This, in turn, would affect other projects the company worked on since many of the crews and contractors worked on multiple projects. How had things gone so awry so quickly? A significant delay in this project would have a cascade of effects that could cost Sutton and Sutton millions of dollars. He had to take care of this before he could think about starting a family with Kat. He shut the lid of his laptop and walked out into the corridor. The door to Kat's bedroom was closed. They'd gotten in late, and she was still sound asleep. He stood in front of her door for a moment, torn between letting her sleep and waking her up to say goodbye. Delaying the decision for now, he called his pilot to ready the jet and hopped in the shower. Twenty minutes later, he was packed and ready to go. He heard no sounds from Kat's room. He pulled a pen and notepad from the kitchen drawer and wrote her a quick note. He grabbed his briefcase and headed to the airport. Kat woke up to a quiet house. Hannah was still sound asleep, but something had woken her. Was it a door slamming shut? She walked barefoot toward the kitchen. She could smell the coffee before she entered the room. Brad must be up already. The thought made her smile. She couldn't wait for him to wrap his arms around her and kiss her good morning. The kitchen was empty. Kat stepped up to the counter to grab a mug for coffee. A note in Brad's handwriting was propped next to the coffee maker. Had to fly to the office in Phoenix. I'll call you when I land. Brad. She set her empty mug down, turning to stare out the window. He was gone. He'd gotten up and left without so much as a goodbye. She pulled the fake engagement ring he'd given her off and put it next to the note. By the time Hannah woke, Kat was showered and packed. It's time to go back home, Hannah Bear. Let's get you dressed and you can help me pack the car. I don't want to leave. I like the beach. I do, too, but it's time to go home. Grandma and Grandpa miss us. Don't you want to see them? Hannah nodded. And what about your room? Don't you miss your toys? And your friends at the library and the park? Yes, the little girl said hesitantly. Is Brad coming? He promised to push me on the swing as long as I want. Brad had to fly to Phoenix and take care of some work. 
Kat was busy putting the last of Hannah's clothes into her duffel bag. Brad doesn't work. What's a phoenix? Phoenix is a city far away. He is taking a plane to fly there. And Brad does work. He was on vacation here at the beach. Why didn't he tell me? Why didn't he take us with him? Hannah's lips began to pout and moisture collected in the corner of her eyes. Kat dropped the bag, picked up her daughter, and cradled her in her lap. It's okay, baby. We're going to be fine. Brad had an emergency at work. Do you know what an emergency is? Hannah shook her head. It's when you have to go take care of something right away. Like when grandma tells you to pick up your toys before her friends come over to play cards. Hannah nodded her head. Her daughter had learned to do as she was told when Kat's mother was expecting guests. She was a kind grandmother who spoiled Hannah rotten most of the time, but every now and then, her tone changed and everyone around knew to do as they were told. No questions asked. Brad has a grandma in Phoenix? Hannah asked. Work is sort of like grandma. Sometimes you have to do stuff even if you don't want to. Or you get in trouble. Exactly. He's coming back when he's done? Kat ran a hand through her daughter's hair before answering. I hope so. Let's get you dressed and get on the road. It didn't take long to pack the car and lock up the house. Kat hesitated for a moment, not sure what to do with the key. She looked up past the car and saw Miss Doris watering the large ferns hanging on her front porch. Let's go say goodbye to Miss Doris. She took Hannah's hand and the two of them walked next door. Good morning. Where are the two of you off to this morning? Miss Doris set down her watering can to give Kat and Hannah hugs. We're going back home, Hannah started, hopping up and down the porch steps. I didn't realize you were heading back. I saw Brad leave early this morning, but figured he was out to get breakfast for you girls. He had to fly back to Phoenix, and it's time for Hannah and me to get back to our own lives. Kat swallowed and looked down at her feet. When she looked back up, she saw Miss Doris nod. I'm going to miss the two of you, but I'm sure you'll be back soon. Can I leave the key with you? Brad can pick it up when he gets back. Miss Doris put an arm around Kat's shoulder and walked her to the bench that sat on the porch, flanked by rocking chairs. They sat down and Miss Doris took Kat's hands in hers. What happened? You two looked so happy, and now you're both running off? Did something happen at the wedding? Honestly, I'm not sure what's going on. Everything was fine. Better than fine, actually. Or at least that's what I thought. Kat took a deep breath to steady herself. Then, I woke up this morning to a note that said he had to fly back to Phoenix. No goodbye, no nothing. I think it's better to go home. I need to clear my head and figure out what I want before Hannah gets hurt. That man is smitten with you, you realize that. He's running a little scared. I'm sure there's a good reason why he had to get back. From what his grandmother told me, that company is a pretty big deal. Don't give up hope. The two of you belong together. I have a good eye for that kind of thing. Miss Dora smiled and hugged Kat. A few minutes later, they were on the road headed back to Charlotte. They'd made good time and were playing I Spy when Kat's phone rang. Brad's name lit up the display. Hey, I got your note. Is everything okay in Phoenix? Hello, Brad. I miss you, Hannah yelled in the direction of the phone. I miss you too. Both of you. I landed in Phoenix a few minutes ago. I'm driving to the office now. I'm so sorry I had to rush off like that. There's an issue with our biggest project. The planning commission is revoking permissions that will cause, never mind. It's something I have to deal with in person, but I can't wait to get back to the two of you. I might be stuck out here for a week or two though. Sounds like you're in the car. Anything fun planned for today? We're on our way back home. To Charlotte. Kat waited for his response. Her knuckles gripped the steering wheel and she held her breath. I see. 
My parents miss spending time with Hannah, and I need to get back to work. Dale has been nice about letting me work remotely, but I'm sure there's a lot of paperwork piling up. I wish we could have talked about this before I left this morning. Me too. Kat kept her eyes on the road. Traffic had picked up as they got close to Columbia. Why don't we talk about it tonight? Call me when you get home from the office, she suggested. I will. Have a safe drive home and text me when you get there. The call disconnected. At least he seemed concerned about the two of them driving back home. That had to be a good sign. Brad had a nagging feeling that something was wrong. Everything had been fine on their drive home last night. They put Hannah to bed and then sat out on the deck overlooking the ocean. She'd snuggled into his side as they'd listened to the waves. They'd talked about taking Hannah down to the beach the next morning and planned a trip up to Wilmington later in the week. They'd made plans and he'd dashed off this morning without waking her. Not that he'd had much of a choice. He had to go to Phoenix and get the project back on track. What good would waking her early have done? He walked into his office, opened his briefcase and got started on what he did best. Solving problems, closing deals, and getting real estate projects back on track. If he didn't deal with this right now, his company would be in serious trouble. Thankfully he'd become an expert at this since his father had passed away. He'd get this taken care of and then work on the project nearest and dearest to his heart, convincing Catherine Marlowe to become his wife. Chapter 23 It was late afternoon and most of the construction guys were on their way out the door when Dale stepped into Kat's office. Didn't take you long to get those projects filed and that stack of paperwork dealt with. Her boss sounded pleased. She looked up at him and shrugged. There really wasn't all that much to do. I kept up with everything digital while I was gone. I appreciate that. Payroll kept running without a hitch. Kat waited for him to leave her office so she could get back to the last task on her list for the day before heading home. Her mom had kept Hannah all day and would be ready for a break. Dale picked a pen from a cup of writing utensils she kept on her desk and started playing with it. Kat. We've known each other for a long time. I think of you more like a friend, or a favorite niece, than my office manager. This didn't sound good. He kept playing with the pen, then finally looked up at her. What's wrong? You haven't looked or acted right since you got back. At first, I thought you'd gotten used to the good life at the beach, but I don't think that's it, is it? What's really going on with you? I'm fine. Hannah and I loved our time at the beach. It's just taking me a little while to get back into the swing of things. I'll be fine. You met someone down there, didn't you? I didn't want to bring it up when you asked to work remotely, but I'm pretty sure that's why you extended your stay. He winked and put the pen back. I did. He had to fly back to Phoenix to take care of some business. That's why we came back earlier than expected. When do I get to meet this mysterious guy who has swept you off your feet, he asked. Honestly, I'm not sure. Let's just say, things haven't quite been the same. It was probably just one of those beach romances. It's all fun and games while you're on vacation, but then reality sets in when you get back home. She hated to admit it. She missed Brad. He'd called a couple of times since she'd gotten back, but their conversations had been brief with both of them busy and a three-hour time difference to complicate things. She missed their quiet talks on the back porch and watching Brad play with Hannah in the surf. Dale patted her on the shoulder, jolting her out of her train of thought. Good. You've finally started to move on. He smiled at her. It's about time. I know Kevin's death hit you hard, and it took some time to come to terms with it. This trip to the beach was a good thing. Even if things don't work out between you and the guy you met. He was right. She wouldn't trade the last few weeks for anything, even if it ended in heartbreak. She nodded. Think of it as the start of a new chapter in your life. In yours and Hannah's. Time to turn over a new leaf. Who knows, you might even end up getting a place of your own. 
With one last pat on the shoulder, he left and returned to his own office. Kat sat in her chair for quite some time contemplating what Dale had said. He was right. It was time to move on. Maybe it was even time to move out of her parents' place and into a house or apartment of her own. She couldn't stay with them forever. As much as they loved being around Hannah, they deserved their privacy. Living with a four-year-old wasn't all peace and quiet. And who knew, maybe that new chapter in her life would eventually involve Brad. If it didn't, she was a big girl. She would manage. She'd never lived on her own, but how hard could it be? With the medical debt cleared, getting a place was an actual option. The thought was exciting. She turned to her laptop, opened a new browser window, and did a quick search for two-bedroom apartments in the Charlotte area. There were a lot out there to choose from. She clicked through listing after listing, taking notes and bookmarking her favorites. She couldn't wait to tell Brad the next time they talked. She wondered what he would think of her and Hannah getting a new place. Maybe it would be the start of a conversation about the possibility of building a life together. Her face fell. Would that life have to be in Phoenix? She wasn't sure if moving to Charlotte full-time would be an option for him. His family and his corporation were in Phoenix. Her job and her family were right here. The joy from just moments ago was gone. Long-distance relationships didn't work. Everyone said so. But what if neither of them was ready to move for the other? They'd never talked about any of this. Maybe because Brad had never seriously thought past their time together at the beach. Kat closed her laptop and decided the rest of her work could wait until tomorrow. She needed to go home and snuggle Hannah. It would ground her, then tomorrow she would start making plans for the two of them. She waved at Dale on her way out. He was on the phone making sure the right materials would be delivered to one of their job sites tomorrow. Sighing, she got into her car and pulled out on the highway. Chapter 24 Brad's office door opened and the smell of freshly brewed coffee wafted up his nose before he opened his eyes. Good morning, Mr. Sutton. You have an 8 o'clock meeting with the structural engineer at the Foxtown site. Miss Penny put a steaming mug of coffee on the table in front of the couch where he'd been sleeping. He rose to a seated position and rubbed his face. I picked up your dry cleaning on my way in. Here's a fresh shirt. Laying it across his desk chair, she turned back to look at him. You need to go home and get some sleep. There's too much to do. Once this project is back on track. Once this one is on track, something else will go wrong and someone else will need something urgently. Don't make me watch you work yourself to death the way your father did. Penny Maxwell had been his father's secretary for as long as Brad could remember. She was family and the only person at Sutton and Sutton that would dare talk to him like this. It's a good thing I like you, Miss Penny. He took a sip of his coffee before heading to the attached bathroom to clean up and change his shirt. Miss Penny brushed out his suit jacket. You look pale. The beach tan is wearing off. He heard her through the cracked door. He looked at himself in the mirror. She was right. He was looking pale, and tired. How long had it been since he'd flown back to Phoenix? He did the math. It had been over two weeks since he'd left the beach. Brad shook his head. That couldn't possibly be right. He stepped back into his office and finished his coffee. He'd hit the ground running as soon as he'd returned and spent most nights sleeping on the couch. His back had started to pay for it. Miss Penny was right. He needed to spend more time at home, sleeping in his own bed. The work kept piling up and he found himself pulled into meeting after meeting. How had the company functioned while he was in South Carolina? He checked his phone. There wasn't enough time to call Kat before his meeting. Plus, he hated calling her at work. A brief text message would have to do. There'd been too many of those these past few days. If it wasn't for the daily reports from Fred Miller, the private investigator he'd hired to keep an eye on Kat after the Jennifer Doyle incident, he'd know little about what was going on in her and Hannah's lives. 
They'd exchanged text messages and had brief phone conversations here and there in between meetings, but that had been it. By the time he got back to his office from dinner meetings, she was asleep. By the time he got up in the morning, she was already at work. Long-distance relationships across time zones were a pain. He wanted to see her, hold her, and kiss her again. At this point, he'd settle for a long phone call or video chat. He missed her. It was one of the reasons he didn't spend much time in his penthouse apartment. It gave him too much time to think. It was easier to stay at the office and work until he passed out on the couch. His phone rang, jolting him out of his thoughts. He glanced down at the display. Hello, mother. What can I do for you? You can come to dinner tonight at 7. Nothing formal. Just the two of us. I have some important business I want to discuss. When Evelyn Sutton was short and to the point like this, there was no sense in arguing with her. I'll be there. He hung up the phone and grabbed his jacket from Miss Penny before heading out the door to meet the structural engineer. He turned back and picked up his coffee. It was going to be another long day and he needed all the help he could get. Brad glanced at his watch as he strode up to the front door of his mother's house on the outskirts of Phoenix. Despite the traffic, he had made it just in time. He rang the doorbell. Good evening. Your mother is expecting you. Robertson, his mother's butler and driver, escorted him across the hall to the formal dining room. It was his least favorite room in the entire mansion. With its stark white walls, silver mirrors, and expansive glass table, it felt cold and uninviting despite the tall upholstered dining chairs and simple flower arrangement on the table. There you are. Have a seat. Robertson, pour Bradley a glass of champagne and let the cook know we are ready for the first course. His mother was seated at the head of the table. She'd had the place to her left set for him. That was a relief. The last time he'd been invited to one of these dinners, she'd disagreed with a recent business acquisition. He'd been seated at the other end of the long dining table as they discussed the project and the future of the company. He strolled across the room, pulled out the chair, and sat down. Robertson stepped up beside him with a bottle of chilled champagne, his hand covering the label. Not that it mattered. At his mother's house, it was going to be Dom Perignon. He filled Brad's glass before returning the bottle to the silver-plated wine chiller and leaving the room. How are Kat and Hannah? Evelyn asked, taking a sip of her champagne. They are well, thank you. Why the sudden interest? Brad leaned back in his chair and crossed his arms. His mother raised her eyebrows but didn't take the bait. Are you sure? You haven't seen them in weeks. Yes, I'm sure. Not that it's any of your business, but Kat and I talk daily. As soon as things start calming down and the Foxtown project gets back on track, I'll fly up for a visit. Now, what is this about? You had some business you wanted to discuss? The door opened and Robertson walked in, followed by one of the maids carrying a tray. She set a plate of smoked salmon and trout garnished with sprigs of dill in front of each of them. Whipped cream infused with grated horseradish was piped on one side of the plate. A scoop of mustard yellow sauce sprinkled with green dots, more dill unless he was mistaken, had been artfully smeared on the other side. New chef, he asked. The presentation was different from the last dinner he'd been to at his mother's house. Pierre left to go back to Paris. Evelyn shrugged. I had to hire someone new. It's not the same but she will do for now. She grabbed her fork and picked up a bit of smoked trout. Brad looked at his watch. If he wrapped this dinner up quickly enough, he might make it home in time to call Kat. Is there somewhere you need to be? His mother had a keen eye and rarely missed anything. It was a skill she'd picked up from his father during their marriage. Most people thought the second Sutton in Sutton and Sutton stood for Bradley and his siblings. What it actually stood for was his father and his mother. Bradley Sr. renamed the corporation shortly after his marriage to Evelyn in a tribute to her contribution and in anticipation of what the two of them would build together. Of course not. You have my full attention. 
He raised his glass and looked at his mother. Now what did you want to discuss? Your happiness. I thought this was about business. It is. You're the head of the company and the public face of Sutton and & Sutton. And you, my son, haven't been happy. I'm ashamed to say that I hadn't realized how unhappy you've been these past few years. Not until I saw you with Kat and Hannah. Brad looked up at his mother and raised his eyebrows. I'm surprised you noticed. I didn't think you approved. Don't be silly. I don't know how much you remember of our life when you and Pete were little. I adored your father, and he couldn't wait to rush home to us. That's what I saw with you, Kat, and Hannah. I remember. What happened? We got busy, the company grew. I had Sam and spent more time at home. We drifted apart, and somewhere along the way, I lost your father to the office. I hate seeing history repeat itself. Brad set up. What do you mean? I'm watching you make the same mistakes your father made. You're burying yourself in work. You're making excuses about why you can't go see Kat. The company will survive a few days without you. It did fine while you were at the beach. You're kidding, right? Did you hear about the mess with the permits? Evelyn waved a hand dismissively. Those bureaucrats try to pull that kind of stuff all the time, whether you're here or not. Will would have handled it. Or I would have. His mother had a point. Maybe the problem wasn't so much his absence, but his leadership style. Since his father's death, he'd stepped in and micromanaged the way Brad Sr. had done it. It gave him something to do. You dove in when your father passed away and worked through your grief. His mother echoed his thoughts. It's time to slow down and delegate some of those tasks if you want a life and a family of your own. Robertson entered with the main course. Brad smiled when he saw the 12-ounce T-bone steak. His mother knew him well. Why she bothered to have the chef prepare steamed kale and baked turnips he couldn't understand. He pushed those aside. Eat your vegetables, she ordered. Life is all about balance. Sometimes that means eating kale with your steak. They enjoyed the rest of their meal and finished it off with an espresso. All in all, it was the best meal he'd shared with his mother in quite some time. One last bit of advice, if you don't mind. Evelyn sat down the small porcelain cup. Don't wait too long to patch things up with Catherine. It's easy to let these kinds of things get away from you. Before you know it, a few years and then decades have passed and you've lost your chance. I won't, he promised. He finished his own coffee. What about all that talk about bringing someone else's blood into the family? Kat and Hannah are a package deal, and I will treat that little girl like my own. Evelyn swallowed hard and unless he was very much mistaken, the tips of her ears started turning red. She rubbed her hands on her skirt before returning her gaze to him. That comment was out of line, and I would appreciate it if you would forget what I said. Kat and Hannah are exactly what you need, and I'd be happy to call them family. Both of them. Now, stop wasting time, and go get them back. Brad didn't need to hear it twice. He rose and was on the phone with his pilot before he left the mansion. Chapter 25 This is hopeless. Kat plopped down in the booth, setting her purse down on the seat next to her. She picked up the menu. It had been a while since she'd been to the wooden bowl. The Greasy Spoon was a popular lunch spot with the working crowd. Thankfully, they'd come and passed the worst of the rush. Dee looked as exhausted as Kat felt. Don't say that. It wasn't that bad out there. The condo on 3rd Avenue was cute. Dee picked up the menu. Kat was glad that her best friend was with her. House hunting would have been even worse without her support and positive attitude. It was okay. The layout was nice, but I don't know about living on the third floor. It's pretty high up. Lugging groceries up there every week won't be fun, but you could count it as exercise. I wonder what today's special is, Dee said. It's on the back. I wish the house on Pine Street could work out. It's the right size, 
and it had a nice yard for Hannah to play in. Don't even think about it. Dee put her menu down and grabbed Kat's hand across the table. Promise me you're not really considering it. That was a bad neighborhood. I'm pretty sure there was a drug deal going on across the street. Kat sighed. I won't. I just wish I could find something like that, in a good neighborhood. In my price range. We'll find something. It just takes time. We've only been at this for a couple of days. Who knows? We might come across the perfect little place this afternoon. Now, let's eat. I'm famished. Dee glanced through the list of specials and put her menu down. When the waitress arrived, they each ordered iced tea and Greek salads topped with grilled chicken. I forgot how good this salad was. Kat took another bite. The lettuce was crunchy, and her plate was loaded with toppings including two different types of olives, sliced peppers and onion, feta cheese, diced chicken, and a few sliced beets. The dressing tasted homemade. It is. I'm glad I skipped the meatloaf special. This is hitting the spot. Kat's phone beeped. She pulled it out of her purse and looked at it. Brad? Dee asked. No. Just a text from Hannah's new preschool about the open house in two weeks. Kat could hear the disappointment in her own voice. It's been hard. I know he's working and there's all kinds of stuff he's dealing with. But between the long hours he's putting in and the time difference, we barely talk. Did he work this much while you were with him at the beach? Dee asked. No, not at all. He'd take the occasional phone call and answer emails before we went out for the day, but that was about it. It's not just that though. I feel, disconnected from him. Kat put her fork down. What do you mean? She wrapped her arms around herself and pondered the question for a moment. I feel like he's miles away from us. And I'm not talking about the physical distance. That's making it hard, but we could make that work. We're so different. He's running a large corporation, and let's face it, he's filthy rich. He doesn't have to worry about rent and utilities or paying for preschool. I, on the other hand, am constantly struggling even with my parents helping out. He listens, but he doesn't get it. She swallowed hard and then took a sip of tea. This isn't really about the money, is it? Dee looked at her, a kind smile playing across her face. It is and it isn't. We live in such different worlds. I don't know what he would expect of me, and of Hannah, if we, she trailed off. But you're right. It isn't just the money and the different worlds we live in. I don't know how to describe it. He's been distant and preoccupied when we talk. Not that we talk very often. It's like his head is somewhere else. It's just not the same, she shrugged. Dee gave her an understanding look. Long-distance relationships are hard. It takes work to stay connected when you're not spending much time together. Is he planning on coming out for a visit? Eventually. When things calm down at work. Whenever that will be. Kat slumped into her seat and looked down at the hands in her lap. Chin up, buttercup. He had to rush back because something went wrong with a big project, right? That's probably not something that's a quick fix. Give him time to get it worked out, and I'm sure he'll have more time and attention to give. It's been two weeks. Maybe it's time to admit that this was nothing more than a vacation fling for him. It's okay. I'll get over it. I wish Hannah hadn't gotten so attached. She asks about him every day. Heck, she even asked about Evelyn. That's the evil mother? Dee asked, raising one eyebrow. Her antics made Kat laugh, which was probably Dee's intent all along. Evelyn isn't that bad. She kind of grows on you. That did not sound convincing. At all. Maybe you are better off without him. There are plenty of other fish in the sea, you know. Dee gestured around the room. There was a group of men in their seventies who'd stopped in for a quick bite after playing a round of golf. 
A few tables over she saw a balding middle-aged guy working away on a spreadsheet while eating a patty melt. And then there was the busboy who looked like he was still in high school. Kat laughed. I see your point. Dee raised both her hands. Okay, okay. Not the best example, I know, but you get my point. Here's an idea. Why don't we go out for dinner and dancing on Thursday? I'll call Carla and Melanie. We'll make it a girl's night out. Kat nodded. It sounded like fun, and if nothing else, it would keep her from missing Brad. Sounds like a plan. I'll have to check with mom to make sure she can babysit, but I don't think it will be a problem. She's been trying to get me out of the house. A car honked outside. Kat rushed down the stairs and picked up her purse. Are you sure you don't mind watching her tonight? I promise I won't be gone long. Kat looked at her mom who stood in the door to the kitchen with Hannah. Of course, I don't mind. Go have fun and say hi to the girls. Her mother kissed her on the cheek and shooed her towards the door. Kat turned back to look at Hannah. Be good and listen to Grandma. I love you, Hannah Bear. She hugged her daughter and kissed the top of her head. Love you too. Hannah squeezed her back for a moment. Can we make cookies now, she asked her grandmother. Kat laughed and headed out the door. Her daughter would be fine, and she was looking forward to an evening of girl talk and maybe a little dancing. As she strode toward Dee's car, she thought she glimpsed someone in a dark vehicle parked a few houses down the road. There was a little bit of light coming from the inside of the car. Maybe the guy inside had his cell phone on. For a moment, he looked like Brad. Kat shook her head. It couldn't be him. Brad was at a charity gala in Phoenix tonight. Her mind was playing tricks on her. She got in the car and Dee drove off. Maybe she needed this night out with her girlfriends more than she realized. Chapter 26 Fred, I'm on my way to Charlotte. Can we meet? Brad strode up the stairs into the cabin of the company jet. He nodded at the pilot and handed the flight attendant his duffel bag. Sure. I'm parked on her street right now, keeping an eye on the house. Look for a dark gray Impala, about three lots down. See you in a couple of hours. I'll text you when I land. Fred Miller was his favorite private investigator. He was thorough and discreet. Brad had used him for years to get inside information on his competition. Fred had been invaluable when Jennifer Doyle started stalking him, and since the latest incident that had resulted in the woman's hospitalization, he'd hired him to keep an eye on Kat and Hannah. A small part of him felt guilty for spying on the woman he loved, but the rational part of his brain dismissed it. He was doing what he could to keep them safe. His family's wealth had its perks. Unfortunately, it also attracted the attention of the wrong type of people. It was his responsibility to make sure nothing happened to Hannah or Kat because of their association with him. He would never forgive himself if it did. So, Fred had stayed on the job, and Brad received regular updates on their comings and goings. From the sound of it, the two were doing fine and getting along without him, but he had to see for himself. We're ready for takeoff, Mr. Sutton. The flight attendant walked through the cabin ensuring everything was secure. He put away his phone and buckled his seatbelt. He'd touch down in Charlotte, North Carolina, in a few hours. She looks happy. Brad slumped back in the passenger seat of Fred's car. They were parked down the street from Kat's parents' house and had just watched her drive off with a friend. Diana Griffin was an elementary school teacher, according to Fred's research, and the two women had known each other since high school. Want me to follow them? No, there's no need. From the snatches of conversation, he'd heard Kat was going out to dinner with friends. He'd even caught a glimpse of Hannah before the front door shut. The little girl was smiling and seemed excited about something. He wasn't sure what he'd expected. Thanks for keeping an eye on them. I'm glad they are both doing well. You don't sound all that happy about it. Fred picked up a disposable coffee cup, took a sip and put it back down, looking disgusted. 
I hate cold coffee. Worst part about the job. He rolled down his window and poured the remainder on the ground outside. I guess I'd hoped they'd miss me. From the looks of it, they are doing fine without me. Maybe coming up was a mistake. He hated how defeated he sounded. If we're not tailing them, let me buy you a cup of coffee and tell you what I've been seeing. Brad agreed, and a few minutes later, they sat inside a coffee shop tucked into the corner of a small shopping center. I think you've been getting the wrong impression here. Fred took a sip of the hot, fresh coffee and sighed. That's better. Nothing worse than stale, cold coffee. Brad leaned forward in his chair, placing his own coffee in front of himself without tasting it. What are you talking about? Simple. No one eats this much ice cream when they are happy. Fred smiled knowingly. Who's eating ice cream? You're not making any sense. Miss Catherine is eating the ice cream I assume. I've been following her around and seen her shop. And I may have taken the liberty of looking through the trash to see what I could find out. She's been going through mint chocolate chip ice cream by the carton. Did you say mint chocolate chip? Brad remembered her mentioning it the day they met. She'd wanted anything but that flavor because that was her breakup ice cream. Maybe she did miss him. Don't keep screwing this up, son. Fred looked at him over his steaming mug. The girl likes you, but from the looks of it, she's starting to move on. Time to woo her if you don't want to lose her. Fred was right. Brad had to think. He was screwing this up, and if he wasn't careful, he risked losing Kat and Hannah. He cursed himself for not spending a little more time dating in the past. No wonder his mother had resorted to setting up blind dates. He had no idea how he would win Kat back. If this was a business deal, he'd know what to do. He would create a big offer to reopen negotiations. Maybe the same could work here? He had to think and come up with a plan. And he needed more information. Who do you think you are, waltzing in my office and asking questions about Kat? Dale Buckley, Kat's boss and the owner of a small construction company didn't look happy to see him. Quite the opposite. I'm trying to make this right. Brad backed away at the man's angry tone. This wasn't going as well as he'd hoped. He looked up the office and stopped by late in the afternoon hoping to catch the owner and get a little inside information from him. He needed to find a way to impress her and win her back. His first thought had been to buy a house for her and Hannah, but somehow he had a feeling that wouldn't go over well. Kat didn't like big gifts. They made her feel obligated and that was the last thing he wanted. She's finally starting to get over Kevin's death. Do you have any idea what the last five years have been like for her? I do and I can tell you, it wasn't pretty. She's finally carving out some happiness for herself and that little girl, and you go breaking her heart. I should beat you up. Dale started rummaging in his desk for something before slamming the drawer shut. I'm sorry. That wasn't my intention. I'm trying to fix this. Brad backed up toward the door of the office. Coming here had been a mistake. Dale was loyal to Kat and wouldn't divulge any personal information to help him win her back. And he was right. Brad's shoulders slumped as he turned to leave. He'd let her down. Not only had he neglected her, he hadn't even talked to Hannah since he'd rushed off from Palmer Island. He'd been selfish and fallen back into a pattern of working long hours to avoid having to deal with relationships and loss. Would she ever take him back? He grabbed the door handle. Wait. Do you care for her? Are you serious about making this right? Dale's voice sounded kinder than it had just moments ago. I do. Then go talk to her mom. She'll be helping with bingo at St. Mary's on Flint Street this afternoon. Thank you. Brad nodded and left, already looking up directions to the church. N4040, the announcer called out. There was a soft hum of conversation in the large community center at the church, but thanks to a small sound system and microphone, the voice of the bingo announcer rang out loud and clear. 
The older gentleman next to Brad unkept his marker and drew a large X on the appropriate spot on his card. Brad circled the room several times when he'd first arrived a good 20 minutes ago. So far, he hadn't spotted Kat's mother. On the drive over to the church, he'd realized he had no idea what the woman looked like. Thankfully, Frank had pictures of all of Kat's close family members on file and been able to send him a photo. He'd gotten the text with the image attached a few minutes after his arrival. Everyone here looked much older than the attractive woman in the picture. She looked to be in her fifties and had the same eyes as Kat. Brad closed his eyes and pictured Kat with that beautiful smile of hers. In his mind, she was walking on the beach, soaking up the sun, the breeze, tossing her coppery curls around. Brad rose to make another lap around the room in hopes of finding Isabel Marlowe. Brad. He heard the familiar voice of a very special little girl a split second before Hannah barreled into him and grabbed his legs in a tight hug. I missed you so much. I knew you would come back. Stunned to see her here, he picked her up and hugged her tightly. Oh, how he'd missed her. He realized only now how miserable the past few weeks had been. I missed you too, Hannah Bear. An older woman walked through the side door Hannah must have come from and stared at him. He recognized her from the photo. Cradling Hannah, he stepped toward her and offered his hand. I'm Brad Sutton. You must be Isabel. The woman shook his hand, her gaze looking him up and down, taking his measure. So, you're the famous Brad I've heard so much about. Her eyes twinkled. Only good things, I hope, he laughed. Mostly, she admitted. My granddaughter is quite taken with you. I'm surprised to see Hannah here. I didn't expect to run into her. I came here looking for you. I'm hoping to have a word about Kat. Brad sent up a little prayer that she'd agreed to talk to him. Of course. Why don't you walk with me to the kitchen? Hannah and I are in charge of making sandwiches for the seniors. She turned, heading for a wide doorway. Brad put Hannah down, holding her hand in his, as they followed Isabel down a hall and into a small kitchen. The counter was littered with plates, sliced bread, cold cuts, and condiments. Picking up a knife, she put mayonnaise on one side of the bread. You two put ham, turkey, and cheese on these, she said. Brad and Hannah got to work. What brings you out here? Isabel looked at him over the kitchen counter, her eyes guarded. Let's just say I had a bit of a wake-up call last night. My mother pointed out that I was about to lose the best thing in my life. I'm here to try to fix it and win Kat back. I didn't realize you'd lost her. Hannah here has been talking about you and your family non-stop. He was surprised. He ruffled Hannah's copper locks and hugged her to him. She hadn't left his side since running up to him. He liked the feeling of having her close. What about Kat, he asked softly. She's hurt, but doing her best not to show it. Care to explain what happened between the two of you? Her look was as much an accusation as it was an invitation to open up. He didn't think he had much of a choice if he wanted to enlist Isabel's help. I had to rush back to work a few weeks ago. There was a lot to deal with, and I didn't have much time to talk to her. The time difference didn't help either, he shrugged. Sounds like a bunch of excuses if you ask me. That's pretty much what my mother told me last night. I think you're both right. I fell back into my old work habits, and it was easier to focus on the task at hand. His shoulders fell and he started piling the slices of bread with ham and turkey, leaving the cheese for Hannah to add. It's not easy to open yourself up to love, and it's even harder to break old habits. She sounded like she spoke from experience. Kat hasn't had it easy since Hannah came along. Kevin's death hit her hard, and it's taken a long time for her to get over it. She didn't open up to anyone else until she met you. Isabel swallowed hard and went back to spreading mayo on the last few slices of bread. And I walked out on her, leaving nothing but a note. Brad was surprised Isabel was even talking to him. I messed up big time. I'm here because I'm trying to make it right, and I'm not sure how. Isabel looked up at him. Good. 
she's finally ready to live her own life. Did you know that she's looking for an apartment? Brad nodded. I'm happy that she's ready to move on, and I'll always be grateful to you for that. Now, if the two of you would patch things up, Isabel let her words trail off, busying herself heating a pot of soup at the stove. The problem is, I don't know what to do. Brad put down the cold cuts and started pacing in the small kitchen. I need to do something to show her what she means to me, but nothing I am coming up with feels right. He stopped and put his hands on the kitchen counter, speaking to Isabel's back. Most women would be swayed by a nice piece of jewelry or a trip to Paris, but not Kat. She was busy stirring the pot, letting him rant on and work through his ideas. I thought about setting up a charity in her name or getting her a new car. Nothing feels quite right. Isabella stayed quiet. He kept going, desperate to come up with some grand gesture that would show Kat what she meant to him. She's been apartment shopping? It was a question as much as a statement. Yes, she's been out looking at places for about a week. No luck so far. I'm going to have my own room and maybe even a backyard with a swing, Hannah piped in. She was sitting on a stool at the counter, eating a slice of cheese leftover from their sandwich making. That's nice, Brad replied, his thoughts already running over and discarding more ideas. An apartment, of course. She's looking for an apartment or house. Shouldn't be hard to find a property around here. You're not seriously thinking about buying an apartment building so you can rent it to Kat, are you? Isabel turned around, brandishing the ladle like a sword, pointing it straight at him. He was too stunned to mention that soup was dripping on the kitchen floor. She's not having any luck so far, is she? Don't you think it would make her happy? She'd have a safe place to live with Hannah and it doesn't have to be an apartment building. I think a house would be better. With a nice yard, he could picture the place in his mind. Isabella stood there, ladle in hand, shaking her head. So, you want her to live up here in Charlotte in a nice little house, by herself with Hannah? No, of course not. I want to show her how much she and Hannah mean to me. He was starting to see the fatal flaw in his strategy. That's the problem with you rich people, Isabella said, turning back to stir the soup. You think you have to buy something to show you care. Talk to her. Tell her how much you missed her. She turned off the burner and sat down the ladle before turning to look at him. Why don't you come back with us after we're done here? You can stay for dinner. I'm making a tuna noodle casserole. It's yummy. Please come. Hannah climbed down from the stool and grabbed his hand. Promise you'll come. He wasn't sure Kat was ready to see him. Taking a deep breath, he agreed. Chapter 27 Kat walked into the kitchen and plopped down on one of the simple metal chairs. She was exhausted. No luck, again. This is hopeless. It shouldn't be this hard to find a house, or even an apartment. What do other single moms do? I'm making decent money working at Dale's and don't have to worry about paying for childcare. I'm sorry, honey. Kat watched her mom crumble a pack of crackers and sprinkle them on top of a casserole, ready to go in the oven. It's okay. I know we'll find something. I just have to keep looking. Her mom put the dish in the preheated oven and cleaned her hands. She walked over to Kat, pulling her up and into a hug. You and Hannah will always have a home here with us, no matter what. You know that, right? I do. Thank you, Mama. Kat returned the hug. Her mother released her a few seconds later and took a step back. By the way, you have a visitor, Isabel said. Kat raised her eyebrows. She had no idea who would stop in. And why was her mother sounding so formal? It's Bradley Sutton. He's in the living room with your father. That was a surprise. He hadn't mentioned flying out when they'd texted yesterday. Kat took a deep breath to steady herself. Okay, where's Hannah? She's in there with him. She hasn't left his side since he got here. Why don't you go join them? I'll bring some iced tea. He's staying for dinner. 
Isabel shooed Cat out the kitchen door. Cat heard ice cubes clinking as her mother dropped them into glasses. She took a few steps down the hall to the formal living room. The door was ajar and she heard her father talking. What are your intentions, young man? I hope you don't mind me asking if you are able and willing to provide for my daughter and granddaughter. Dad. Cat pushed the door to the living room open, warmth rushing into her cheeks. She couldn't believe her ears. How could her dad come out and ask Brad about his intentions, like she was some teenager? She was a widow, a mother, and closer to reaching middle age than she liked to admit. This was more than a little embarrassing. Your father has every right to ask. Kat's heart stuttered when she looked at Brad sitting on the couch with Hannah snuggled up against him, sound asleep. He had the little girl cradled to his side. The sight was so sweet, it made her heart break a little. She'd missed him. They both had. Not a day had gone by when Hannah hadn't asked her about Brad. No, he doesn't. This is between you and me. She took a seat in a chair across from Brad, determined not to let him see how much she wanted to rush into his arms. She was about to ask him what he was doing there when her mother walked in, a tray of tea glasses in her hands. Isabel pushed the magazines that covered the small coffee table aside and set down the tray. She grabbed one of the glasses and handed it to Brad. Thank you, Isabel, he said. Kat wondered when they had met and why they were on a first-name basis. Her mother picked up a glass of tea for herself and sat down next to Brad and Hannah on the couch. The casserole is in the oven. Dinner should be ready in about 45 minutes, Isabel said. Were you able to get those permits worked out? Kat asked. She figured his work was a safe topic and it would steer them away from talk about commitment and intentions. She wasn't ready to find out what had brought him here. I did. The project is back on track. My team should be able to handle it from here on out. He drank most of his tea and set the glass down on the tray. Why don't you show Brad the backyard before dinner, Isabel suggested. Brad gently moved the sleeping girl to the side of the couch, stood and walked over to Kat, holding out a hand to help her out of her chair. I'd love that, he said, looking down at her. Kat took the offered hand, warmth and strength engulfing her, traveling all the way up her arm. He pulled her up and held on to her as she led the way out of the living room and down the hall. No funny business, you two, her father called from behind them. Brad chuckled as they walked through the kitchen to the back door leading out to the backyard. Henry. Kat's mother scolded before the door closed behind them. She hoped it didn't wake up Hannah. Sorry about that. Kat looked up at Brad trying to judge what kind of impression her family had made on him. Stop worrying about it. I like your parents. And this is a nice place. Brad turned around and gestured around the small bungalow she'd grown up in. Why are you here? Kat asked. She couldn't afford to get her hopes up if this was his polite way of breaking things off. She hoped it wasn't, but if it was, better to pull the band-aid off quickly and move on. I wanted to see you. You and Hannah. Brad took a few steps away and turned his back to her. Here it comes, she thought. Squaring her shoulders, she prepared herself for the final goodbye. She should have seen it coming. She had seen it coming. They rarely spoke on the phone. His life was too busy and too different. She and her daughter didn't fit into his world. They'd spent a few amazing weeks together at the beach, but now each of them had returned to their real life. Better to bite the bullet and get through this quickly. I understand. It's nice of you to come tell me in person. I understand. I didn't expect this to work. You have your life. I have mine here with Hannah. We're fine. You don't have to worry about us. Kat took a deep breath, glad she'd gotten this off her chest. You really think I'd walk out on you? Why do you think I came out here? Brad asked. To say goodbye? She heard the question in her voice and hoped she was wrong. Is that what you want? He asked. No, it isn't. Good. 
because it's not what I want either. I realized something in Phoenix these past few weeks. I don't want my life to revolve around work. I don't want to spend over 80 hours in the office and every waking minute worrying about the future of Sutton and Sutton. I want to laugh and live and love. I want what we had at the beach, but in a more permanent way. I want us to be a family, if you'll have me." The longing and vulnerability in his face almost broke her. She swallowed hard before answering the question she saw in his eyes. Of course, I'll have you. We both will. He reached up to her face, gently tucking a stray lock of hair behind her ear. She couldn't breathe. He was so close. Her heart beat even faster than before. His hand cupped the side of her face, warmth spreading from him to her. She closed her eyes, waiting for his lips to brush hers. Oh, how she'd missed his kisses. Just that simple touch of his hand made her crave more. But the kiss didn't come. Instead, she felt his hand leave her face. Worried that she'd done or said something wrong, Kat slowly opened her eyes. She watched Brad go down on one knee in front of her, right there on the lawn in her parents' backyard. Her breath caught and her heart sped up, faster than it was beating just a few seconds ago when she'd waited for the kiss that didn't come. He couldn't be, could he? I wanted to do this differently, at a nice restaurant, or down by the beach right before sunset, but I don't think either one of us wants to wait. Brad put his hand inside the pocket of his jacket and pulled out a small box covered in dark blue velvet. He opened it and showed her the diamond ring inside. Catherine Marlowe, will you marry me? Thoughts raced through Kat's head. This was happening. He was asking her to marry him. To actually marry him, not just some fake engagement to get his mother off his back. This was the real thing. Could she do this? Where would they live? What would her parents think what would Hannah think? Then, everything became crystal clear. She couldn't think of anything she wanted more than to become Brad Sutton's wife. They were right together. Hannah adored him and he loved her daughter as much as he loved her. Yes, I'll marry you, she breathed. Brad took the ring out of the box and slipped it on her finger. Then he rose and took her face in both of his hands before kissing her senseless. Finally. This was what she had waited for all this time. They lost themselves in the kiss, and somewhere along the way, their arms and bodies intertwined. Kat stepped out of his embrace when the back door opened. She turned around in time to see her mother poke her head out. Dinner is ready. Come and get it while it's hot. We'll be right in, Mama. Kat pulled on her shirt, smoothing it out with shaking hands. Are you sure you want to stay for dinner with my family? She wasn't sure how he would do with her mother's frugal fare. I would love to try your mother's tuna noodle casserole. It comes highly recommended, he said before pulling her into one last kiss, before they went inside for dinner. Epilogue Six months later Brad stood on the steps of the altar looking over the family and friends gathered in the pews. The old Palmer Island church was packed. He was glad Kat had agreed to get married here instead of Charlotte or Phoenix. Despite their best efforts to keep it a relatively small affair, they'd barely been able to fit everyone into the wooden building with the hand-hewn pews. His mother sat in the front row, accompanied by Timothy, her new personal assistant. Miss Penny was there, sitting next to Miss Doris. The two ladies quietly chatted away. On the opposite side of the aisle, he saw Kat's parents. Isabel waved at him with a big smile on her face. The rows behind them were filled with various aunts, uncles, and cousins he'd only met this morning. Even Claire and Thomas had driven up from Charleston for the big day. Brad was sure it was strange for them to witness their daughter-in-law getting remarried. When he'd asked Claire about it, she'd told him Kat was family and they wouldn't miss the wedding for the world. The rest of the church was filled with family, friends, and various business acquaintances. Definitely a lot more people than he'd expected. Doing okay? You're looking a little green. His brother grasped his shoulder. Brad was thankful Pete had agreed to be his best man. Relax, she'll be here. 
You'll feel better the moment you see her walking down the aisle. Pete would know. He'd made it through his own wedding a few months ago, with flying colors. Brad was glad his brother stood up there with him. The moment the music started, his eyes darted to the church entrance. The door opened, and Sam and Caroline emerged followed by Kat's younger sister, Alex. The three women walked down the aisle in their floor-length pale pink dresses. Kat's friend Dee walked down the aisle next in a slightly darker dress to mark her status as maid of honor, followed by Hannah with her white basket. Her pale pink dress was a miniature version of the bridesmaid's dresses and a bit shorter. He saw the white shoes he'd helped her pick out peek out from under the dress. Hannah concentrated hard on stepping down the aisle while scattering pink rose petals in front of her. He smiled and felt pride in his chest that his little girl was doing such a great job. While the adoption wouldn't be official for a few more weeks, she was his daughter. There was no doubt in his heart or his mind. The music changed slightly and he looked from Hannah to Kat who had stepped out, gently walking on the pedals. She took his breath away in her simple A-line dress. It was a creamy white with a matching short veil. Her fiery curls were barely tamed in a fancy updo. He couldn't wait to pull it down and run his hands through her locks. First though, he would put a ring on her and make her his wife. His wife, the thought took his breath away all over again. Pete had been right. A feeling of joy and calmness washed over him the moment he saw her. His shoulders relaxed and he simply enjoyed watching his bride walk towards him. He barely noticed the bridesmaid stepping up to stand across from Pete Hanna gave him a huge smile, pride shining in her sparkling green eyes. She turned and hugged her mom. Good job, honey, he heard Kat whisper before reminding her to go sit with her grandparents. And that was the last conscious thought he had. The ceremony was a blur. All he saw and heard was Kat. She held his hands through much of it and it kept him grounded and focused only on her. He repeated the words the preacher fed him and watched his bride's beautiful face while she recited hers. You may kiss your bride, the preacher finally said. God have mercy. It was all he'd been thinking about since the moment she'd stepped into the small church. She was his, he was hers, and he finally got to kiss his wife. Brad gently pushed the veil back behind Kat's shoulder and cupped her cheek in his hand. He saw his joy mirrored in her face. She was the most important person in his life and the only one he saw in the crowded church. He heard her take a short breath when he touched her face. His hand touched her back and he pulled her closer before dipping in to let his lips gently brush over hers. He was going to enjoy this. It had been a long day, he'd been itching to kiss her for hours. Her small sigh was all the encouragement he needed to deepen the kiss. He lost himself in her orange blossom scent and the sweet taste of her lips. He was home and home, it turned out, was with a fiery redhead who'd turned his life around. Brad finally tore himself away when he heard gentle coughing behind him. With one last kiss to her forehead he raised his head and looked at the people who'd come to witness the start of his marriage to this amazing woman. A woman who was blushing and raising her hand to her cheek. She was adorable, this wife of his. He couldn't wait to spend the rest of his life with her. It would be crazy and busier than he'd been during his days of giving his every waking hour to Sutton and Sutton, but that was all right with him. He looked forward to each day he got to spend with Kat and Hannah. The End This has been Her Billionaire Neighbor Written by Suzanne Ash Copyright 2020 by Suzanne Ash Production Copyright 2022 by Suzanne Ash Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe if you want me to put more of my books on YouTube. Visit my website at www.suzanneash.com for more of my books or find me on Amazon.